I would uh, ask all of us to please turn off our cell phones, at least put them to silent, and make sure they're off the table. Also, everyone with Blackberries, please, please, please make sure your Blackberries are off the table so we can avoid the feedback noise. You may notice board members with um, accessing their laptops. And this is because they're using their laptops solely for the board meeting materials, which is in electronic format. So we're most appreciative to the um, technology of uh, modern uh, technology to allow them to do that, saving all this paper that I'm going to be uh, recycling at some point. I'd like to remind all speakers to complete a speaker slip. There are com uh, speaker slips in the back of the room. Um, they give them, to please, to Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson, would you identify yourself? There she is in the back of the room. So anyone that would like to speak must fill out a speaker's form and then give them to uh, Ms. Thompson. Please, you're going to need to keep your uh, comments to three minutes or less. You're going to need to stay on topic or you know that I will interrupt you and shut off discussion. So I'd like to call this meeting to order and ask that Ms. Thompson please call the roll. Good morning. Dr. Carion. Here. Doc, uh, Ms. Chang. Here. Dr. Chen. Here. Dr. Diego. Here. Dr. DeRusso. Here. Dr. Israelian. Here. Ms. Kent. Here. Dr. Levine. Here. Dr. Lowe. Here. Dr. Moran. Dr. Solomonson. Here. Ms. Shipsky. Here. Mr. Zeranian. Here. And Ms. Yaroslavsky. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, I have two little pieces of housekeeping to take care of. First of all, we are going to break at 11.30 to set up for our noon speaker. Ms. Thompson has a handout of lunch orders for those on the board. They are at your seats, I hope, and if not, you will get one from her. Uh, you need to hand them in and they will be collected by 9.30. So please complete one and then you'll have lunch available for you. Uh, also, Ms. Whitney has an announcement that I would like her to make before we proceed. Ms. Whitney, please convey. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on December 15th, over 100 Sacramento employees gathered for a holiday party thanks to the generous donations of our board members. Staff wanted each of you uh, to receive a photo of the group as a thank you for what you provided for all of us. And um, those are being handed out right now. I do want to recognize the two staff individuals who chaired the holiday event and really made it possible to put your money to use to just really thrill all of the staff in Sacramento. And that would be Jennifer Samos and Natalie Lowe. Jennifer and Nat Natalie. And, and they, they really put it together. Thank so thank you. And just so you know, the board president was a little fearful what I might be announcing. So. <laughs> I was more than a little fearful. <laughs> because I wouldn't tell her ahead of time. That's true. But Ms. Whitney, please uh, convey our appreciation to the staff. This has been a, a tremendous year of, um, it's been a very difficult year as we all are aware of, and we're all really very appreciative of the extra effort, the energy, and um, input that the staff was able to um, engage with in making us look very good. So please make sure they're well aware of our appreciation. So I'd like to introduce our newest board member and ask her to come forward to be sworn in. Ms. Kent is an associate director with the California Department of Health Care Services and was appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger on December 31st, 2010. Um, Ms. Kent, would you please come forward and I'm going to swear you in. obligation freely take this obligation freely without any mental reservation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully I will well and faithfully 
discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Great, thank you. Welcome to the board. Thank you. I have the following speaker uh, slips for items not on the agenda, and as indicated in my opening comments, please limit your remarks to three minutes. Um, also, I would ask uh, Dr. Fermanski to please come forward. I would like you to know that we do have your comments. Staff will respond to them, but we, don't, we do not respond to public comments from this um, board. I understand. Public comment. Okay? I understand. I have two uh, things to talk about and during my three minutes. There is some breaking news from the University of California regarding their relationship to the um, California Medical Board, and I'll give that at the end. At our last meeting, which was the meeting in Long Beach, I made a request to the board if I might be able to look at some of the board records as to your validation of test materials, for, especially for diagnostic radiology, but other areas, and also your standards. This was a formal request under the Records Act, and the board has the duty to produce those documents to view and copy and that sort of thing. Your staff looked for the records, and of all the 20 or so, I mean, by the way, there's a handout here that I have handout of documents, of, or basically there, there are copies of the material you got from uh, Long Beach. It's a handout for the medical board. There's a copy of the request. What it does is it asks for material to see if the medical board did its homework in the validation of test material, and apparently, it has not. The staff indicates in response to the request for documents, there were no documents produced for any of the requests to show any documentation as to tests and diagnostic radiology, the same as to standards. If you had adopted a standard, an objective published standard to, for instance, be able to grade a test or, or uh, pass or fail a test, then there would be a record of it, and there's no record that the medical board ever adopted such a, such a standard. The importance of this is there are a lot of doc diagnostic radiologists, probably thousands of them, and they would rely on any test that you had for, or, or the value of such a test, and you don't have any test. You don't have any valid test for diagnostic radiology to give the test, and then you don't have a test, you don't have a, an objective standard to grade the test. Consequently, this puts you in limbo in your ability to either give the test or grade the test. Consequently, there now is a legal challenge to the validity of the test that the medical board has and also as to the standards. And there's some discovery pending on that. Uh, I want to switch gears to, and uh, this is some data that's come from the University of California, you know, another agency in the state. What they have divulged is that there is human subject research going on by somebody in San Diego the primary source of the human beings used for the human re this human subject research is the California Medical Board. Apparently, they are using the doctors, or some of them, or many of them, that you send to the, the program in San Diego as their human research subjects. The term human research subjects has a particular value. It's actually a legal definition that comes from Title 42, the federal Title 42. Those people have special protections under the federal law. You can't just lasso them or cause them to go into a research program without making full disclosure. This is very important. You should know as members of the medical board, you can't be funneling hundreds of doctors into a research program and make them human research subjects in a human research project, which is apparently what's happening. Dr. Fermanski, you're going to need to wrap it up. You've, your time is up. I have one other handout here I'll give to, is it Taylor, Ms. Taylor in the back, and this is for the President and the uh, Ms. Scurry and Mr. Hepler. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have no other public comment sheets on items not on the agenda, so we'll move forward, please. For an approval of the minutes from the 2005 to, uh, meeting, are there any additions? Um, I believe there's one need for one correction uh, on page 88 in your packet under agenda item 29. That should be headed consideration of request for recognition of Ross University Bahamas campus. And under the action item, um, it should say motion carried. Maybe that action was missing. Thank you. Are there any other additions or subtractions to the minutes? 
So I would like a motion to approve them, please. So I'll move. A second? Second. Thank you. So moved and second, corrected uh, addition of the minutes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Salmonson, would you please provide an update on the licensing committee? Yes, the committee met and Mr. Warden provided an update on the application processing times for physician and surgeon applications. Licensing managers Ms. Robinson and Ms. Humphreys provided update on the business process reengineering recommendations. Ms. Robinson on, app, on streamlining the physician and surgeon application process, the board website, and a study of postgraduate training authorization letter process. Ms. Humphreys provided updates on the implementation of the new management reports and the revisions of the policies and procedures manual. At this point, nobody provided uh, future agenda items, so we will be proceeding with ongoing uh, projects at our next meeting. Thank you, Dr. Summonson. Um, are there any questions or comments from the members? Is there any public comment on the <coughs> report? Seeing none, we're going to move on to the next ag uh, agenda item. Dr. Lowe, would you please present on the Enforcement Committee? Okay, thank you. Uh, the Enforcement Committee heard a presentation from the Probation Unit describing the practice monitor conditions and options for its improvement. And at the present time, there are 186 probationers who are required to have a practice monitor. And this condition requires that the probationer identify and propose a practice monitor within 30 calendar days uh, from the effective date of their decision. Now, the practice monitor must be somebody who has no prior or current business or personal relationship with the probationer. And this requirement was designed to ensure that the monitor could provide fair and unbiased reports to the board. So these requirements are fairly general and uh, the practice monitors are reimbursed uh, by the probationer for any costs associated with acting as a monitor and typically range between $100 and $600 per hour. So we've identified some weaknesses and we're looking at options for improvement and those options are to maintain the current system but to make some improvements. That's the first option. The second option is to create a new pool with some new guidelines and requirements. And the third option is a present option which is the UC San Diego uh, Physician Enhancement Program and looking at that in more detail. So we're going to have a much more comprehensive uh, evaluation of these three options at the May meeting. It was uh, also recommended that we survey our existing probation monitors for feedback about obstacles they face in their role. And it was further recommended that we explore the concept of this pool. So the next item was that we heard an update on the status of the expert training program from Ms. Sweet. The training uh, plan has been completed and the staff is uh, now converting the plan into an interactive computer program that will allow an audience uh, for audience participation. And it's anticipated that this program will be offered in the fall. And finally, we heard um, a review of the uh, training modules that are available to us from Ms. Threadgill. So that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or additions? Any public comment on the report? Seeing none, we'll continue with my report on the Education Committee. We reviewed what um, had been brought up at our last meeting with the outreach to the community on hepatitis education. And very pleased that we've had two articles in the newsletter that have gone out to all practicing physicians. And we're doing our best to uh, do outreach to make sure people are informed about the, the need to be informed about this. Um, also, we had a presentation by uh, Mr. Swanberg, who's from the Receiver's Office of the California Prison Healthcare Facility, uh, requesting a vacancy of um, signage, I guess, basically, from uh, their facilities on uh, who doctors are licensed by. And uh, we took it under advisement. Other than that, there was really nothing else to discuss. If there's any questions to that? Comment, seeing none, thank you very much. I'd like to move on to Dr. Moran's report on physician responsibility, please. We met yesterday. Um, it was our, I believe, our third or fourth meeting now of our, this committee. Uh, the focus of this particular meeting was uh, trying to come up with a definition of supervision, assuming that the physician who's supervising, um, specifically in this case, we were discussing registered nurses. Um, has done the appropriate prior exam, what then constitutes 
appropriate supervision thereafter. I find it somewhat difficult to come up with one single definition um, due to the fact that many different clinical scenarios exist. Um, so we've decided to look at some other definitions in statute, uh, come back to that question again um, at a future meeting. Um, we also came up with an agenda for the next meeting which will focus primarily on the corporate practice of medicine. Um, there were a couple other agenda items including uh, how do we define a many spa discussion of various existing nursing protocols um, and uh, that is um, our, our we also decided that in a future meeting we will uh, discuss how to brainstorm educating physicians as to their existing roles uh, responsibility as far as supervision uh, and um, uh, how to also educate the public um, what kind of safety precautions they should be looking for in clinical settings. And um, that is it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Dr. Moran or any public comment? I have no slips. Thank you very much, Dr. Moran. Uh, Dr. Lowe, if you would please um, give us physician recognition. Oh, my apologies. Okay. Uh, Dr. Moran, we're back to you. Yes. Physician um, recognition, sorry. So uh, we have, Dr. Trudy and I um, constitute the committee uh, looking at the physician humanitarian wards, and we've chosen two physicians, Drs. Borger and Dr. Cameraman, both of whom have been notified and have very gladly accepted this honor and will be showing up at the LA meeting. And as far as the description of their qualifications, uh, would, should we save that for a future meeting? The end of May. Yeah, great. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moran. Is there any public comment on those? None. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, Dr. Lowe. Thank you. Uh, the Physicians Assistant Committee met on November 18, 2011. Uh, there were two uh, regulation hearings. The first hearing would add consumer protection enhancements to the committee's enforcement program. Further, one section will delegate to the executive officer the ability to approve settlement agreements for the revocation, surrender, or interim suspension of a license. This regulation will be modified again. The second hearing was in regard to the implementation of provisions of uh, Business and Professions Code 138, which requires boards within uh, DCA to adopt regulations requiring licensees to provide notice to consumers that the practitioner is licensed by the PA committee, as is now done by the uh, Medical Board of California. So this language was approved. The executive officer reported on regulations recently enacted. This um, regulation will require board referred uh, diversion participants to pay the entire participation fee while the self-referred participants would pay 75% of the fee. Uh, this regulation was approved by the Office of Administrative Law and became effective <coughs> January 19, 2011. Uh, notices will be placed on the website and sent uh, to the licensees and to all parties affected by the change. The new requirement only affects participants who enroll in the program on or after January 19, 2011. Also at the last committee, uh, we discussed uh, two methods. Uh, in which the committee may approve PA training programs under the current regulations. The committee moved to clarify the requirements and formed a uh, subcommittee, uh, the Physician's Assistant Education and Training Subcommittee, to address the issue. The first meeting was held January 19, 2011. I'll report on their progress at the next board meeting. Uh, the chair and vice chair of the uh, PA committee were reappointed or reelected for 2011. And finally, we set the meeting dates for 2011, and the first meeting will be held at uh, UC Davis uh, School of Medicine. Uh, this is going to be off-site at the university because uh, our goal is to involve more of the uh, PAs in the community as well as to invite the PA students from UC Davis to the meeting to uh, enhance participation. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Is there any public comment or questions from this committee? Thank you. I'd like to move on to uh, Ms. Chang's report on the Federation of State Medical Boards, please. Um, <clears throat> uh, the number one issue was the uh, maintenance of licensure initiative. And uh, there was pretty much the final draft is out. 
and has been circulating and they had webinar um, for people to uh, make comments on. And I guess at this moment it's ready for the Federation Board's approve and to be presented to all the board members and the, uh, at the annual conferences. And I'm hoping uh, our board will participate at the annual conferences. And that's a very important place to be. And the other one is the uh, teleconference. There will be uh, telemedicine conferences. There will be a telemedicine conferences March 10th and held by the uh, FSMB and uh, with the new emphasis by the uh, President Obama on the new health care reform and his commitment to the technology and we see great trend toward a different thinking about telemedicine than what we had done before. So I know our board has been invited to go to that. I know the money is tight, but I just want to, maybe we have to read it from, um, you know, the results of it, but it is a issue which will define the future of medicine and also define the quality of medicine. So I thought that's a very important item. I'm not hoping maybe you know, we can look into that, seeing whether we can send someone just to look at it. Um, the foundation of the Federation just got two grants at the end of the year. They're not big grants, they're together, they're about 300,000, and they are for the open uh, booklet that you guys have all seen. And the new law actually requires all the um, uh, pharmacists who make those medicines uh, to help promote that book in, to some extent, just to mo promote a safe prescription of the medicine. So uh, the foundation of the Federation has gone out and actually really going for a much bigger grant and to make this issue a real issue. So this will be the three big things I see. Uh, that's on the horizon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Chen. Are there any questions from any of the members? Seeing none. Um, we'll move on to the nominations of, uh, to the Federation of State Medical Boards. Um, this board has submitted the following nominations to the Federation of State Medical Boards as approved by the board in November. Nomination for Hetty Chang to stand for re-election to the Board of Directors. Hetty, good luck. Uh, her nomination will be up for vote by the full body at the April meeting. Uh, we send in nominations for Dr. Salmonson to remain on the Education Committee and for me to remain on the Bylaws Committee. Uh, Dr. Moran is currently serving in an elected position to the, to the nominating committee, but these positions are one-year terms, so we could not nominate her again. They're two-year terms? Then I apologize. My information is incorrect. As you heard, the Federation is holding its annual meeting in April, and this board has submitted an out-of-state travel request for the fully funded trip for the Executive Director and for myself as President. We hope to hear a positive response this year. The Federation is sponsoring a symposium, as we heard, in Washington, D.C., and although we are not attending, uh, we hope that uh, we will obtain the minutes of this meeting and we'll report back to you in March regarding this very important subject. Um, in addition, the Federation Board is meeting in San Diego, February 10th and 11th, and, and has asked the Executive Director and the President to attend, uh, and Mr. Zronin will attend in my place, along with Ms. Whitney, and thank you very much for doing that. Um, as far as the health, we're going to move on the agenda unless someone has a question about the Federation information I've reported now. Uh, the Health Professions Educational Foundation is moving forward. We, I don't have the numbers and I apologize. We are, have just made our first round of uh, grants to the uh, nursing requests, nursing um, scholarships and loan repayments. Uh, the doctors we are not doing yet, but we are really poised to start um, reaching out for more fe uh, federal as well as uh, private foundation grants to help with the educational opportunities for those people going into all of the health professions. And I look forward to uh, a, a more full report the next meeting. Now uh, it, I'd like to move on to the board members' report on uh, meetings with interested parties. Is there anyone that has anything to report that anyone's met with? 
interested parties. Nobody's meeting with interesting, interested parties. Hopefully they're me meeting with interesting parties. <laughs> okay. Um, during the past quarter, I've participated in three monthly director's communication sessions with other healthcare board presidents and executive officers. All three covered the statutes of the transition, the hiring freeze, and the budget. I've asked Ms. Whitney to share the minutes with you so you're fully informed about these discussions. I want you all to be aware of the status of the board members related to appointments and confirmations. Um, a quick update. Uh, we have a number that will be coming up for confirmation this uh, current year, 2011, and we have four members that uh, will have uh, terms uh, June 1st of 11. So if you're applying for uh, reappointment, you need to get that paperwork in, and Ms. Samoes will be following the um, confirmation hearings. Thank you. Would you continue with your executive report? Executive director's report, please. Thank you. If you would all please turn to page 96 in your agenda packet. This is the fund analysis and it shows a 5.8 month reserve. This is up from the estimated 5.3 month reserve that we reported in November. The se if you look at the second column for 1011, that is the uh, column that will show the reserve. The difference is due to the furloughs and being in place during the first part of the fiscal year, and now that most of the agreements have been signed, a reduction in wages of almost 5%. Would like you to note that in fiscal year 11-12, all of our augmentation requests were disapproved. We have moved forward with a spring request to augment the budget beginning in 11-12. That would be July 1, and that has to do with the Operation Safe Medicine to continue that operation it was a two-year pilot program. This request for augmentation is $577,000. That would be an ongoing basis of six staff persons. Our first budget hearing is set for Monday, January 31st, and we have scheduled a meeting with one of the committee members prior to that hearing to have a discussion regarding our budget. Are there any questions regarding the budget? <clears throat> Moving along, uh, turning to page 97. Uh, this is a report of the current year expenditures. As we continue to be green and send out our newsletter via email blast, we will be able to generate additional savings in printing and postage. In January, we sent out 109,000 newsletters via email with only 2,000 rejections, less than 2% error rate. That's great news. This means that the board only prints and sends about 27,000 copies. We will continue to pursue green initiatives like your flash drives, and uh, that will save a lot of staff time, as well as trees, costs, and paper. Does anyone have any questions regarding the fiscal documents? Seeing none. Next is the staffing update. As of January 31st, we will have 34 vacant positions. That's a 12% vacancy rate throughout the board. This does not include four positions that will be vacated in February due to retirements or transfers to other boards or departments that are exempt from the freeze and able to hire. It has a significant impact on uh, many of us, especially because the executive office has four of those vacancies, executive and administration. On January 19th, the board executive officers held its quarterly meeting attended by Senate BNP staff. That staff indicated the chair, Senator Price, was looking into possibilities of ending the hiring freeze for the Department of Consumer Affairs. The um, exemption request was made by the Department for Licensing Positions, and on January 26th, we moved forward 
with our vacancies related to uh, the job <coughs> workforce initiative, asking for those to be included in the department's freeze request. Although we are testing to establish lists for medical consultants and the deputy director position, we will not be able to fill those positions until the freeze is lifted or a waiver is approved. We will be submitting individual or group position waiver requests beginning next week. And when I say group waiver requests, that would be in the medical consultant categories. Are there any questions regarding staffing? Actually, this is a question for Barbara. I'm wondering if the, the board could not um, request that you send a letter regarding both the, um, I was looking at the budget, back at the budget, and then about staffing that, you know, the um, quest for Operation Safe Medicine was disapproved, and as well as this issue that it makes no sense that an agency that receives its funding from licensure and not from general fund um, would not only have a vacancy problem, but, you know, we've had a um, hiring freeze. So I'm wondering, could this board not send a letter on behalf, if the members uh, <coughs> from the president to uh, the appropriate state um, officials requesting that those things be carefully considered and, and, and funded? I'm happy to sign a letter if that's the will of the board. Do you have a here? I mean, we struggle with concerns? this every meeting about the fact that we don't have adequate funding and it, 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 it makes no sense. Um, again, this is not a general funded uh, agency, it's a licensure agency. Um, but particularly when we talked yesterday about Operation Safe Medicine and there's a number of things that need to be attended to that, that they need to be funded. There's going to get a point where what's going to happen is that the lack of staffing and the lack of opportunity is going to start to impact greatly more greatly on this, uh, the staff and the work that we do. The staff has really gone over and above the call of duty to make sure the work of the board is done, but I would uh, concur with Ms. Shipsky on this. Dr. Summons, you have a comment? I would just like to echo that particularly, I mean, that tangible thing, the Office of Safe Medicine. I mean, here we have this committee, Dr. Moran is so strong in going forward with the, the supervision, but if we don't have the ability to enforce the laws that we already have, it's tragic. And we know people are being hurt because while the office was intact, uh, we heard that there had been a lot of, um, you know, forward progress, and I just hate to lose ground. So specifically, I mean everything, but that's one particular item that I'm just Rush to hear we, we couldn't get, and mm -hmm. um, that's so tangible. And I just think if we could at least hang on to that, um, more would be great. But Dr. Drussell? In, uh, in lieu of the vacancies, uh, maybe this is a question for Linda. Are we uh, authorized to spend money for overtime or temp services or anything like that? Are we held to the vacancies with the net savings? At this point in time, no staff is allowed to work overtime, and we all are allowed to maintain the temporary help positions that were authorized prior to the freeze, but we may not add any additional ones, or if one of those were to leave the board, we could not fill behind that temporary position. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, can I make a, a motion, and I think I can because this we're talking about the, uh, the budget that um, the president of the board um, draft a letter um, that indicates a sense of this board um, that projects particularly like off, um, Operation Safe Medicine and the funding of um, positions necessary for adequate uh, enforcement and completion of other responsibilities of this board um, be done by the state. And that's the sense of this board that without that, it, it absolutely handicaps our ability um, to do what we are directed by law to do. Do I have a second to the motion? Second. Thank you. Um, any public discussion on the motion? Any discussion by board members? Uh, all those in favor of the resolution as presented, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so it'll be done. Thank you, Ms. Shipsky. I appreciate that. Would you like to continue with your part this? Um, the next item is the strategic plan. 
We had a subcommittee meeting of Dr. Levine and Ms. Yaroslavsky. We met with Janie Cordray um, last, or Wednesday evening to discuss what we wanted out of a plan and the timing to work on it during 2011. As part of the plan, we will integrate the board performance audit as an element of the planning process, thinking forward into the board's sunset review due date 1-1-14. We agreed to develop an interview script for Janie to meet with or call each of you members and selected board staff to solicit input on the planning process and what you want to achieve. We're um, thinking of targeting the July meeting for the full board participation on the planning process, possibly a half day Wednesday and the evening before our meeting starts Thursday and Friday. I'd like to defer to the subcommittee members for additional comments or details. Now, I, I would just urge you all to realize that the way we go forward and how we look and view ourselves and how we are viewed by the public is extremely important. So I would urge each and every one of us to be actively participatory in this process. Um, and Dr. Levine and I will be working closely um, with Ms. Whitney to make sure that this happens because it, even if I have to call you personally to get your input on the telephone, mm -hmm. it'll happen. So, um, any other questions for Ms. Whitney? Do you have anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Is there any public comment on anything that was presented? No, thank you. Uh, Ms. Mose, would you please come forward and provide an update on the status of our legislation? <clears throat> Good morning. Please refer to your legislative packets. <coughs> The first item in your legislative packet is the 2011 legislative calendar. This calendar is important because it shows the deadlines for the legislative process. And some of the important deadlines coming up is February 18th is the last day for bills to be introduced. In May, we have policy committee deadlines. June, bills have to pass their um, house of origin. And then in September, um, September 2nd is the last day for bills to be amended. September 9th is the last day for bills to be passed. And October 9th is the last day for the governor to sign or veto bills. These are important because they lay out the legislative process. Okay, let's move on to the first agenda item 17A, which is AB 2699 implementation update. As you know, this is the bill that exempts all healing arts practitioners who are licensed and certified in other states from California state licensure for the purposes of providing voluntary health care services to uninsured and underinsured Californians. The Medical Board, along with all other healing arts boards, must do regulations in order to implement this bill. The Department of Consumer Affairs has drafted model regulations for all boards to use as a starting point. The text of these model regulations and the draft authorization form is included in your legislative packet. I'm going to go through just the, ma the major elements of the model regulations. The first one is the definitions of community-based organization and out-of-state practitioner. There's also requirements for sponsoring entity registration and record keeping. And there's requirements for out-of-state practitioner authorization to participate in a sponsored event. In this section in particular, the medical board will need to input additional information in the model regulations. And I will need a decision from the board on some of these items at this meeting. The first one is the processing fee. This, this would be the fee that the medical board would charge for people who request for authorization to practice. Staff is proposing to cover basic review and processing. Staff is proposing to charge a fee of no more than $25, and this is mainly because these are volunteers that are coming into the state that are wanting to provide their services to uninsured and underinsured Californians. We don't want to make it the cost too prohibitive. Um, so what I'll need is a board to vote on that particular item so we can um, work on drafting, have a regulation hearing at the next board meeting. So may I have a motion to approve the $25 charge? So moved. Or less. Yeah, or less. Or less. No more than $25. I'll second. $25. Or up to, is it? Or is it $25 we can say no less. more than or up to. It's less. Okay. You'll so say up to? Up to. Okay. So I have a first, I have a motion maker. So moved. Thank you. And a second? Yes. Okay, do I have discussion on this motion? I, I just thought this is a wonderful thing. Federation is proposing to do a free clinic uh, next year in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, 
because they have a law. Just like this, it's okay to do it. So if someday they, you know, big organizations want to do, any organization want to do something, it's great. Thank you. Dr. Summonson? Well, this may be off topic, but I can't help but feel a bit concerned that we have out-of-state practitioners potentially coming in. And unfortunately, what kind of follow-up will we have? Will we have in-state practitioners who feel limited in their ability to volunteer because of the malpractice concerns, because they are accessible to be sued? And I, I just have a little philosophical concern about this because in a way I think it gives the consumer less protection because they've got somebody they're going to have a hard time, frankly, getting follow-up from and really don't have the um, responsibility when they're back. I, I believe they're well-intentioned, but, but that's a concern of mine. If I may, this board did oppose that legislation, but it has been enacted. So the regulations are trying to ensure that there is that consumer protection element for those individuals who do go to these clinics, including requiring that uh, signage be posted for but those who, physicians. But who regulates them? But, who do and, they report to um, if they well, aren't happy with their care? They could report to us so we could find out who the doctor was and then report it to the correct state medical board. In addition, the entity that is sponsoring this event must have malpractice insurance. You should know that the last um, clinic that took place in Los Angeles at the uh, Memorial Coliseum did have only licensed California practitioners volunteering and it was most successful. So that might also be a model in the end, but continue Ms. Simos. Okay, the next... Um, wait, wait, with this, is there any other comments on this specific $25 charge? At, at, this, at this moment, the motion should be to include a fee of up to $25 in the draft regulations, just so we're clear on those. So we're clear on that with the motion. So we're going to take the vote on that motion before you continue. I, sorry, I thought maybe you were going to add something. Okay. All those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Continue. The next item is um, additional educational experience requirements. Staff proposes to require that physicians must have graduated from a medical board, medical board recognized school and must have nothing on the DOJ record that would otherwise disqualify them from licensure. This bill already requires the license to be in good standing in other states where the physician is licensed. And the model regulations um, basically go over what good standing means. Um, the board will need to vote on the education and experience requirements. So do we have a proposed motion? And it's, it's that it be in good standing and um, that it must be from a um, school that's recognized by the medical board. Okay, do we have a maker of the motion? Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. So Wait, before we have a discussion on the motion, let me, let me have a motion. Okay, on the floor. So I need a motion to approve this request. What part of it? There's, there's several. Well, we're going to do it. I thought we were going to do the education educational and component. And so it's the second We're going to take down. each bullet point separately so that if we have... Disagreement, we can disagree. So it's on education, additional education and experience required. The, the medical board approved school and um, nothing on the DOJ record that would disqualify, disqualify them from licensure. Right, so I need a motion on the table in order to have a discussion. So do I have a maker of the most motion? Okay, do I have a second? second. Okay, thank you. Now, Ms. Kent, please. So I'll, I'll disclose that I had a little bit of background knowledge on this bill when it was going through the legislature. Um, and I raised some of the same issues that you raised when it was being drafted in terms of consumer protection from um, physicians coming in from out of state. But the fact that it's been enacted, if you're going to require out of state physicians to have nothing on, their DO on a DOJ record that would otherwise disqualify them from licensure, you're essentially requiring them before they can come in from out of state to go through the state DOJ background process and pay mm -hmm. for that? Well, well we will. I, th I thought that we were looking that they would have that from, don't other states also use that? That's the FBI, it's not oh. Department of Justice, so you're essentially now saying you're going to charge them up to $25 for the processing and you're going to make them go through the state criminal background check? Um, so now you're, and those are 
40 to $50 if I'm fairly... It's in the regulations, I, I, I think. Page three of the draft if you look at page three of the draft regulations, mm -hmm. you're there. So if you look at the top paragraph, paragraph A, request for authorization to participate, you look at the last sentence, the applicant shall also furnish either a full set of fingerprints or submit a live scan uh, inquiry to establish the identity of the applicant to permit the board to conduct a criminal history record check. And so. those are the proposed regulations from the department as model regulations. We were uh, going with that process. We can not. make changes. I mean, if, right. I mean, if, I mean if my point is, is that you're essentially making it, in, you're, you're going to be requiring physicians and other practitioners to pay upwards of $100 to come into the state to volunteer when they have a license in good standing from another state. Mm -hmm. I just think that that's flipping the point of the of the law and what it was intended to do on its head. Okay, thank you for your comments. Any other comments as to the uh, motion? So any public comment on that part of the motion? Ms. Kirchmeier, I, I see that you are anxiously ready to question. <laughs> Would you introduce yourself, please, for yes, the... Yes, uh, Kimberly Kirchmeier with the Department of Consumer Affairs. I actually, I, unfortunately, I don't have that statute in front of me, but Miss Anita does, and I believe there's something in there about passing a background check in the statute itself. But a state background check or just a background check? I don't know. I have actually, what it says is that uh, section 901, uh, one of the subdivisions says that the practitioner has to satisfy the following requirements. The health care practitioner has not committed any act or been convicted of a crime constituting grounds for denial of licensure or registration under section 480. So the only way really to determine that, other than self-certification, is by some sort of a, of a fingerprint check. And that's why we actually included it in draft regulations um, because that seemed to be the best way to implement that particular provision. But you do have some flexibility so long as you can figure out, I mean, if you're willing to accept a self-certification that somebody's been convicted, you could do that, but. It, it, it was, as um, Ms. Scurry said, when we drafted it, it was our, um, our recommendation that they do do the background check. Mm -hmm. I think Ms. Kent's point is well taken and needs a little bit of discussion here. Uh, it seems to me if the statutes were in initially intended to raise the amount of volunteers um, or volunteer uh, participation and access to care, um, the more fees you, you tack on, these folks are volunteers, they're not being paid. So the more fees you tack on, the, the less likely is that you'll succeed in the overall program. And I think, uh, Ms. Kritchmeyer, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear what the, uh, the department and, uh, and the agency is thinking about that and, 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 and why, because you said that uh, that was your intention, but obviously there's a background check that is federally accomplished as well as a background check uh, Department of Justice in the state of California. So which one do you mean? Okay, on your way up here, I want people to try and remember back to what we had, what the cause, I think, of this legislation was in the first place. What we had was a situation in Los Angeles where a uh, religious entity uh, hosted a um, group of practitioners to come in and service a community that did not have adequate access to health care. What happened as a result of that is nobody knew who anybody was that was walking through the doors to help people. Now, we are not in the business of ensuring that anybody that wants to help can help. That's not the job of the medical board. The job of the medical board is to protect the public. The way we protect the public is to make sure and ensure that those people that are practitioners are in fact um, qualified to practice. There was a big discussion here at that with that uh, issue here. And I personally, who also serve on a board of a free clinic, will not stand by and think possibly that because you cannot afford medical care that you are deserving of second class care. You are entitled to the exact same care and the quality care that I personally am as well. So I would like everyone to keep in the back of their mind with regardless to this legislation, the issue of what our purpose and our role is and 
it's very nice that people want to come to California and help out with access to care, but they'd better be qualified individuals that can provide the care necessary to the clients that, that deserve to have the best. Dr. Salmonson, before Ms. Kirchmeier, please. Sure. Please go ahead. Well, again, hardly are we saying we're going to take the model of the Philippines, but I went there uh, recently to volunteer uh, with a group, and I had to have my credentials first notarized by the city of, well, actually, County of Los Angeles, and then that notarized packet of documents taken to the Philippine consulate took two days out of my practice to get all that paperwork done, but I thought, fine, I respect the fact that they want to know that who's coming is in fact legitimate. And so I guess I don't feel it's unreasonable that we would expect the same of volunteers to our state. Or if I may, um, because of how we collect records from DOJ and because we would have continuous access to this information, those individuals who volunteer would only have to be checked once. We would have continuous information on that physician. It would go into our registration system, and thus uh, it's basically a one-time fingerprint check. Ms. Kirchmeier? Um, again, in looking at it, and I'm going to actually not speak right now as a, a Department of Consumer Affairs. I'm actually going to speak based on the fact that I have history with the Medical Board of California. And I'm going to state that when I went to a conference probably three or four years ago with the Federation of State Medical Boards, it was here in San Francisco, and we actually attended an A meeting, which is the Administrators in Medicine meeting. Um, it was with all of the other states, and I was very surprised to find out that not all states fingerprint their um, applicants. I don't know if it has changed since that time, but that would be my concern is that you, without you performing that duty and that function, and now I'm actually speaking as Department of Consumer Affairs who's here to protect consumers, without an individual who is performing that function, I would be concerned um, that you would be trusting the other state to have done their job in doing the fingerprints. Um, if you had an individual who was actually practicing or had, had actually been in California, moved out of state and, and that other state didn't have that information that there was an arrest or some type of activity in California, you wouldn't be grabbing that information, I don't believe, um, if you were just basing your information on that other um, state's information. So when we looked at it, and, and I'm going to have to ask Ms. Scurry for the exact thought process, but when we looked at this information, we did think that the best way you could can, you know, ensure that these individuals were not going to harm anybody in California was to do a background check on them through both DOJ and um, with the FBI. If I recall, um, the idea was that Consumers in California should not be afforded less protection because the person was coming from out of state and therefore what would be the bare minimum that would be necessary. And since the draft regulations um, ask for other kinds of information to be provided, the whole focus is on consumer protection and uh, providing the same standard of care to those who would be going to these health fairs as someone who was getting health care outside of the health care situation would receive so that there would not be a double standard. And, and that's not to say we don't understand the cost concern. Um, I don't know if that's going to be an issue with an individual coming from out of state if they really want to do volunteer service or not. Um, but, you know, I can't agree with, disagree with you on the cost concern, but I think if we look at the consumer protection element, especially if we don't know for sure if the other states, and that would be something we'd have to do some, the board would have to do some research, research on to identify. Um, but again, I don't know if they would have the information for a California rest or even um, other states. I just don't know how, to what degree they do a fingerprint background, if they do FBI or if they only do it within their own state. So that would be my concern of not having it done here. This, this may be a perfect topic for the federal uh, state medical boards, uh, it's a shame to hear that Doctors Without Borders have borders in our own country. Um, <laughs> that's what it boils down to at the end of the day. So uh, it seems to me that uh, this may require a little bit more uh, uh, thoughtful analyses and maybe an entity like the federal uh, state medical boards could help because no one of course intends um, what uh, our president just said, uh, certainly uh, uh, never anybody on this board would, would even think uh, twice 
uh, than anything but to protect the public or to create a secondary tier of care or access to care because of demographics. That's never the intention of the port, certainly. Um, and that's not even crossing anybody's mind here. But at the same time, we need access to care and we need to provide for a lot of folks um, and, and that this is a, one good way to provide that access. It seems to me if there is any uniformity in anything that can be done uh, to take down the borders to help a lot of people, it should be done. I, I can't agree with you more, Mr. Zeroni, but I'd like you to remember that the requirements of, um, of being licensed as a medical professional in other states doesn't always um, reach the same bar as it does here in California, so I'd like to keep that in mind. Also, I'd like to um, offer that as part of this motion, uh, the wording should be approved or recognized schools. So I'm going to make clear on that, that it's approved or recognized. And I think that you've, um, we've had enough discussion and the understanding is the spirit of the, of the regulation, what it's supposed to be. And I'm, I, I, I think we all understand what the spirit is. And we'll just have to try and figure out if it can be part of the letter of the law or not. But on the motion as it is stated, if we don't have any additional comments, I'd like to move on the agenda and okay. have a vote. Oh, sorry, Ms. Chang. I just have a question. When you say from a medical board approved and recognized school, do you mean California? No, they would have had to have graduated from a medical, a, a, a California medical board approved right. or recognized so school. So can we add the California words in it? Or oh, you want the word California added to the California medical board? Sure. I thought it was understood, but that's absolutely fine. Okay. Thank you. So the maker of the motion and the second of the motion agrees that California should be in the motion. Is that okay? Yes? Yes. Uh, yes, Dr. Jusseau. <laughs> Whoever made the motion, I apologize, I don't remember. Fine. Okay, so a vote on the motion as it is written, corrected, additioned. Oh, any public comment on the motion? Seeing none, okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Mose, would you continue, please? Okay. The third bullet down, um, <clears throat> this is something that um, staff is proposing on adding to the regulations. Um, staff is proposing to require participating physicians to post or notify consumers receiving care that complaints should be made to the Medical Board of California. This is similar to the notice to consumers requirement requiring that these events, that this be posted. The Medical Board would have information on what state that these physicians are licensed on and could forward on the complaints to that state. So, so I need a motion. I'd move on that one. Excellent. Uh, second? Second. Okay, now discussion on the motion. Any public comment on the motion? All those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. Ms. Smith. And um, this, oh, staff is not proposing any other additional criteria unless the board has additional. Yeah. There's another little spot where someone needs to make a decision, uh, and it's on page four of the draft regulations, and that is whether you want to limit the applicant to participating in a number of uh, sp sponsored events during a 12-month period. And if you do, how many are appropriate? If you don't, then we would just take that part out. Yes, staff is not proposing to, uh, we are proposing, I guess, to take that part out. Okay. okay. That just, that, I didn't see that on here. Okay. So I just yeah. wanted to make sure we covered that. Okay. So. Staff was not proposing to limit the, um, limit the events in a 12-month period unless the board would like to limit those events. So what you're saying is if I'm an identity, I can come in here and apply every month for 10 days of a free clinic. No, give me this. I'm not getting it. So tell me, the maximum if an identity can do under this regulation. This regulation is not on the entity, it's on the doctor on the, performing the, the service. physician. Okay, now say the physician. Can he come in and do the free clinic how many times? 365 days a year. There's not, there's not a limit in existing law. If he's willing to do it free, we'll let him do it. Mm -hmm. Pay $100 pretty much. Okay. I'm trying to clarify that. So we need a motion to approve the... Um, Last bullet, the bullet point, please. No, no. Oh, sorry, just to remove the limitation number, sorry. Second? Second. Thank you. Um, any public comment? Any comment from the members? 
All those in favor of removing the number, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you. We need a motion to set it for hearing. Okay, now we're going to set this uh, regulation. Of the motion. We need a motion to set this for hearing at the next board meeting. Dr. Summonson, Dr. Uh, Mr. Zonian, thank you. Any public comment on that? Any uh, questions from the board members? Seeing none, it will be set for hearing at the next board meeting. Thank you. Okay, the next item is in your packets are 17B1. It's the legislative proposals that were approved at the last board meeting. The board approved two proposals at the November board meeting. The first proposal requires physicians to attend physician interviews with the board and would make non-compliance unprofessional conduct. Um, the next proposal would automatically temporarily suspend a phys physician's license if that physician is incarcerated for a misdemeanor only during the period of incarceration. Just wanted to provide an update that I met with Assemblymember Hill's office on both of these proposals. The language is sent unbacked to Legislative Council, which basically means we met our deadline. Legislative Council has to get it by a certain date for in order for it to go into law. Um, Assemblymember Hill's office has expressed um, interest in the, um, the, the proposal that would temporarily suspend a physician's license when they're incarcerated for a misdemeanor. Um, we, are, we will be meeting with him soon. He might have interest in another proposal or we'll be looking for another author. So I just wanted to provide an update. Are there any comments? So is it already covered for felonies and that's why we're adding misdemeanors? Yes, exactly. Okay. No? Okay. Um, let's move on to the next, the next agenda item, B2. Do we have to move on that or is this just, just for It's just an update on what I've been doing, yeah. So the next item is B2, and this is a new legislative proposal that staff is requesting to develop for um, 2011 legislation. Um, we're requesting that um, we be able to seek legislation to allow the medical board to continue to utilize expert reviewers as is currently being done. And some background on this issue is D the DCA issued a memo on November 10th which stated that all healing arts boards must enter into a formal consulting services contract with each consultant, which would be an expert reviewer in our case. Expert reviewers are used to provide opinions and enforcement matters from the initial review through testifying at a hearing. The memo stated that each board would need to go through the required contracting process for each reviewer utilized. At a meeting held on this matter, DCA stated that it would take a minimum of 60 days to get each contract processed. The board currently has the authority to hire consultants and contract with review reviewers, but the state has determined that the way it allowed DCA to contract individually with reviewers did not meet the letter of the contracting codes. And just some background on how many reviewers we use. Um, we utilize 280 expert reviewers in one quarter to review completed um, investigations. Under the new DCA policy, the board would be required to go through the contracting process for each of those reviewers, um, even if the reviewer only reviews one case. The contract would need to be approved before the board can utilize the reviewer services, and the board would have to encumber the funding for the reviewer once the contract is approved. Going through the formal contracting process in order to utilize the reviewer would create an enormous backlog for both DCA and the board, and would significantly impact the times required to complete the initial review and investigate complaints. Um, and also just an update too, um, there was a recent um, executive officers um, meeting and um, Senate BMP staff were there and all the boards and viewers um, executive officers were there. Senate BMP um, expressed interest in this proposal may be carrying something for all boards, but staff is requesting authorization to go forward with our own proposal in case that doesn't um, happen. So let me understand and clarify for at least myself as well as hopefully the members around the table is that what is going to be expected is there's going to have to be separate contracts for each and every one of the 280 some odd expert reviewers that we used this last quarter, this last year, this last quarter. Well from going on we would have to use it for every expert reviewer. So and every like. time that we're going to use an expert reviewer there will be up to a 60 day lag time to be able to employ that person in order to be an expert reviewer. And, and another important thing to point out is we use expert reviewers at the initial, the triage process, and the back end. So you're potentially talking about two expert reviewers for each enforcement case. So I, um, thank you. So what I'm trying to understand is that given the enormity of the expectation to impede the work of the medical board, I'm sure that was not the expectation that our outcome that would be expected. Is there a, versus this process? Is there the expectation of the ability of a waiver 
Is that what you're considering with your separate legislation request? We are, we are considering um, using the section in the, the in existing law that allows us to hire expert reviewers and exempting that section from the public contracting code. That's the only way that we can get exempted out of this process. And you're expecting to do that after you're denied or before you're denied on this motion, on this law? Well, we're expecting to do that after it's approved by the board. <laughs> no, the, the board, I understand, but yeah. after DCA has expected you to do this. Yes, DCA knows. That, I mean, DCA was present at the meeting where we have said we, we would like to go through, forward with legislation if approved by the board. You'll get there in a minute. Um, what I still want to understand is what was the pushback by any of the other uh, boards and bureaus? The boards and bureaus would like to, to have this legislation for themselves, too. All the boards and bureaus are wanting the medical board to take the lead for any legislation that goes through on this. Adam. Okay, so let's have a motion uh, now that I understand what we're going to be having a motion on. Thank you. Just before we do that, uh, what was the reaction from the DCA when this was brought up? Um, at the recent executive officers meeting, DCA was our, like I said, as well as Senate BMP staff who to ask questions. Um, at that meeting, DCA did, said they didn't have any issues with departments going forward that let, they agreed legislation would be needed, but department is not taking the lead on legislation. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we weren't in direct conflict with the department. No. I, I, that was my object, it was uh, just to garner the question. So now I would entertain a motion. But I have a question too. Well, I'm wait, so confused as why it takes 60 days. What was wrong with the existing contracting process? They're Basically. trying to, I think, put everything together in one bundle. They basically thought the, exist the process that we're using now, that it wasn't meeting existing law and that we should have been going through the current, well, that probably can't well, Let's have Ms. Kirchmeier from DCA speak to us, please. Thank you. Um, actually, I, I have to say, I, I spoke at a meeting yesterday, one of the board meetings, and the 60-day comment was not acceptable to us either, and we've gone back and discussed that with our contracts unit. These contracts are very simple. Basically, all you have to do is put a name and the amount for the contract into the contract. Your scope of practice, your scope of work, I should say, is the same for all of the entities within the, the boards that do the same type of work. So it wasn't going to need a review as normal. In addition, it doesn't have to go through the Department of General Services if it's under a certain amount. So we have um, talked to our contracts unit. Um, we do have four from another board that were brought in, and they actually were able to work on those, get those done within about a week. And then, um, of course, they have to be sent out to the individual to sign them and then bring them back to the department. Um, the, one of our main concerns is that if we're inundated with two, 3,000 contracts all at one time, um, that, that there is going to be a backlog. That's why we've tried to meet with the boards and bring them on kind of on a rotational basis to where there is a flow process of all of the experts coming in. This isn't just affecting your board, it's affecting all of the boards and it is a large workload um, for both the staff at the boards and the staff at the Department of Consumer Affairs. However, um, there's nothing that allows us to be exempt from that process. So um, again, as Ms. Mo said, um, it is something that we wouldn't, you know, we're not going to oppose the legislation request going through. I don't know if others will, but um, it's definitely something we had entertained at the beginning and then had um, got a little bit of um, feedback from the entities and we didn't go that route through the legislation. But we also are, um, have been told that the Senate Business and Professions Code is willing to take that on. I was actually hoping that maybe somebody would be here from that office. I didn't, don't see anybody here. Or is Ross here? Yeah, look behind Ross is right back there. Very um, quiet. But, but that's something so that Raj, if, they're, come if they're willing to take that on, I mean, that would be definitely a, an assistance to the boards and bureaus. Just for a little bit more information, if we were to, if we had to do this, uh, and you spoke about uh, increased workload, have we made the assessment as to what that would look like? No, that's what we're doing right now. We've been meeting with all of the boards and bureaus. Obviously, I think from just uh, knowledge amongst all of us at the Department of Consumer Affairs, this is going to be the largest board to bring on board um, because you have about 2,000 experts at any given time on your list. Um, and so you would be the largest board to bring on. The other thing that's a little bit different from your board than the other boards is that you actually don't use your um, experts over and over again like some of the boards actually do. You kind of have, I think, a limit 
into the use of your experts. So that's what makes your pool larger than the others. So what we've been doing, Dr. Drews, is we've been meeting with all of the boards to identify how many contracts it's ultimately going to be. We haven't stopped the process. I want you to know that. We haven't stopped the process with the way they're currently happening because this, if we did, it would grind a whole halt to the enforcement activities as well as examination development. So we're continuing down the process, but we're trying to phase in everybody. So that's what we're looking at right now is how many contracts we're going to need and what's the workload. Um, for both the department and at the board level. I would think that uh, we as a board would want to know that uh, workload uh, number uh, because this seems to me is going to act, exacerbate the already existing. We have a staffing issue already. I understand. So let's have a motion so we can have some further one discussion. Just question for Kim, if I may. So when you say phase in, what's the old process versus the new process? The old process was where we were, we were paying individuals on an invoice basis. And um, due to the contracting code, we actually need to have that in a, a formal contract with the individual. Um, and again, it's, it's not that the process is so difficult because again, it's a standard contract where you're just putting in the name of the individual and the amount of the contract. The scope of work is not under normal circumstances going to change um, unless you had an expert that was doing something beyond the normal enforcement processes. Um, so again, it's, it's that workload now to where you have to have a formal contract put together. So each time they review a case, they need a new contract? No, I'm sorry. And then that's the other thing that's a little bit different. We've asked them to um, go on a, we can either do a three-year contract with that individual um, or, and it's, it's for that individual for each time they review a case. Could you tell us the um, funding amount for each contract where we don't have to go to general services because yes, that does impact it's the It's 12500 Pardon me? 12500 If it's over 12500 on an individual contract, then you would need to go. And then just when we had looked at some of them, it didn't seem that a lot of them were over that amount. But I don't know if you've done your own investigation and for individuals. I, I would think a few of them would be the larger amounts for your board, but for the most part, some of your other ones that you don't use quite as frequently wouldn't fall into that category. You, Mr. Cerrone, you, you, you want a motion? I would like to have a motion, please. I, I'll make the motion to that for the purpose of discussion. discussion. Right. Thank you. Okay, do I have a second to the motion? Thank you. So now let's go back to discussing um, this. Um, Mr. Cerrone, please. Uh, thank you. Um, Kim, how, how long have we had the existing process in place? Forever? <laughs> as long as I know. <laughs> um, it's been at I, least I've been with the department years. for 34 years, and as far as I know, and I worked in personnel and in the contract area, we've never done it any differently. Okay, so that being said, has the contracting law in the state of California changed? Not to my, I don't know. It may have, Kurt is probably. So Mr. What's, the, what's the change? The lawyers change? All of a sudden they think it's. No, no. the it's actual, if you, if you look at the contracting code and if you look at the way it's currently being performed, it is not acceptable the way it is being done. So for 20 <laughs> years we did it wrong, for now all of a sudden we're doing it right. Right. I would hope that as any, any state entity, if you find out that you're not performing a process according to statute that you would change the process that's well, being standard. Apparently that's a matter of interpretation, but that's that being said, yeah, it seems to me, uh, I don't want to engage in a legal dialogue here because I looked at the contracting law and uh, it seems to me if you removed one word potentially from the exemptions, you may be able to satisfy the requirement. That being said, I'll leave it to the lawyers to do that. but. Uh, it, aren't these people already in a pool? They're in a pool, but the only thing, you, they don't formally sign a contract, Frank. They, we send them out, and if I may, Ms. Whitney, I think that what you do is you send them out a letter asking them, they fill out an application, they send it back. There's no formal contract that you've signed with that individual holding them to anything. If they were to release your information, you would have no formal contract to go back and use um, if they were to, you know, lose confidentiality, um, any of those matters, I don't think that there's anything, and, and I'm going to look to Mr. Hepler and Ms. Scurry, I don't think that there's anything binding them to a contract that they the way it's signed signed documents them. regarding confidentiality and uh, return of documents at a certain point in time, so yes, they do sign that. 
the um, actual two-page memo came, coming out from the department is pretty much what they already signed, so okay. it's a duplicate of what we already require. So they are required to sign that. I think what the issue is here is that there must have been boards and bureaus who were not doing the work as professionally as our board was doing, and the object is to standardize that expectation. What we are hearing, though, is that there is going to be a cost involved, yes. additional cost. There is going to be additional expense. There's going to be additional staffing. There's going to be additional wait, li wait time. So unless, uh, Roz, you have something to add to this from the, uh, Roz? No, thank you. Okay, so unless there's something to add to it, I would recommend that we take a vote on the motion to go forward with our own legislation in lieu of this hopefully not finding a home in statute. So uh, there's a motion on the table. There's a second. If there aren't any other questions about it, I would move um, on this and let's have a vote. All those in favor of the motion as stands? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any, wow, well, I forgot to do public, any abstentions? Mm -hmm. Did I do public comment? Kim, you are considered public comments. We did do public comment. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Let's move on the agenda. Right, continue, Ms. Smos, please, with your report. Thank you. I think you got the, the mood that we're not real happy with the idea of changing, right? Okay. The next item is um, other legislation. And we only have one bill this time. Um, we're kind of in that beginning phase where bills are being introduced, but there was one bill that was introduced by Senator Price, who's the new chair of Senate Business and Professions Committee. It's SB 100. It's basically a reintroduction of SB 674 from 2009. Um, it allows outpatient settings to be licensed by the Department of Public Health or accredited by an accreditation agency approved by the Medical Board. Um, it basically deems licensure for accredited facilities. It allows the Department of Public Health um, to license um, facilities that are owned by physicians, and kind of taking care of the CAPEN decision. Um, it also includes many other requirements for um, outpatient setting and accreditation, for imp information sharing between um, the board and Department of Public Health, and for public disclosure requirements. It includes requirements on the supervision of laser and intense pulse laser device procedures, mm. advertising, and is disclosing more outpatient setting information to the public. Um, so related to the licensing and accreditation, like I said, it clarifies the CAPEN decision and allows CDPH to license physician-owned surgical clinics. This is trying to take care of the situation now where um, physician-owned surgical clinics cannot be licensed by the Department of Public Health. This allows um, in our accredited facilities would also be deemed licensed by the Department of Public Health. So in essence, accredited facilities would have oversight by the accreditation agencies, the medical board, and because they're deemed licensed by the Department of Public Health, also the Department of Public Health. So take care of the issue for many physicians that want to be licensed that cannot be licensed because they're physician owned. Um, so I've kind of laid it out in the analysis and the analysis covers many issues, but I think the most um, important issues for the board is the re new requirements on the board. So um, I'm going to go over those quickly, but if you want to talk about other um, aspects of the bill, let me know. Um, it would require the medical board to disclose to the public if an outpatient setting has been suspended, placed on probation, or received a reprimand by the accreditation agency. And the board would also be required to notify the Department of Public Health within 10 days if an outpatient setting's accreditation has been revoked, suspended, or placed on probation. And there's basically information sharing between the board and Department of Public Health because the Department of Public Health must notify the board if they revoke a surgical clinic's license. Um, and by February 1, 2012, the board has to provide Department of Public Health with a listing of all outpatient settings that are accredited as of January 1, 2012. Also beginning April 1, 2010, the board must provide CDPH, Department of Public Health, a listing every three months that includes the name and address and telephone number of the owner of the accreditation agency or the facility, name and address of the facility, the name and telephone number of the accreditation agency, and the effective and expiration dates of the accreditation. Um, the board also must provide the accreditation standards approved by the board free of charge to Department of Public Health. And it also allows for public access to the status of all outpatient settings and will basically give this information to Department of Public Health. We do want to um, point out that in order for the board to um, provide the information that they're required to the Department of Public Health in the, in the set time frames, we need to make sure that the board actually requires the, those accreditation agencies to give that information to the board. So that's something that might need to be worked out. 
Um, the bill also requires the board to evaluate the accreditation agencies every three years, to evaluate responses to complaints against an agency, and to evaluate complaints against the accreditation of outpatient settings. This will be a no new workload requirement for the board, but the evaluations will help to ensure public protection. This bill will also add to the process for the board to terminate the approval of an accreditation agency. Um, it allows the board to issue a citation in addition to terminating approval. It would also allow the board to establish by regulation a system for issuing citations to accreditation agencies that don't meet the board criteria. And that, again, the board would have to notify Department of Public Health of any action taken against an accreditation agency. Um, the staff is suggesting a support if amended position. Um, like I said, in order for the board to comply with the bill, we want to make sure that the accreditation agencies are required to supply the required information to the board in the set time frames. There's a 10-day requirement. Right now, I, I believe that we get information um, every 30 days, so we just want to make sure that we can meet that requirement in the bill. Um, it's also um, not clear, and um, there's a section in the, the bill that requires um, the board to ensure that accreditation agencies are inspecting the facilities every three years. Doesn't specifically require the board to do inspections, but in order, it gives the board, allows the board to do those inspections and requires us to ensure that the inspections are being done every three years. So we want to, you know, make sure that that issue is taken for if, if, if it is, um, if it is thought that the board's going to do inspections if the accreditation agency is not, that would be an issue. Um, so, like I said, the staff is um, suggesting a supportive amended position. So we would like a motion to um, approve that, approve a position and authorize us to work with the author's office on this bill. We have a motion, please, to approve. If so, so moved. Second, please. A second. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask you um, just some clarifying questions on this. It sounds to me like we're the reporting agency of the Department of Public Health. Is that possibly what my, what I'm hearing? That we are the reporting agency? Yeah. Um, well, I think that there's, we report to the Department of Public Health. They also report the licensing information to us. So it's more of an information sharing. So any action we take against an accreditation agency or a, a facility, that information would be reported to the Department of Public Health. Um, in the same way, they would report back to us. So if anything happens to a facility that's licensed, that information would also be reporting back to us. I wasn't hearing that the timing for the Department of Public Health to report back to this board was the same as what our expectation is to report to them. And my question is coming from specifically the, with frequency that the Department of Public Health goes out to um, inspect these uh, surgery centers, which from my understanding is about once every 20 years. Actually, it may be incorrect, but that's Actually, my... that's incorrect because they can't walk into these surgery centers at all right now. They cannot? No, they're not licensed. Like they surgical just, clinics are, are completely unlicensed in the state of California right now. Right, we accredit so, them. We, we accredit four entities. So the Department of Public Health doesn't walk into a surgical So they do and, not do any inspections, is that what you're saying? No. no so they're just collection entity, Department of Public Health? No. So when the court decision happened, and the lawyers can back me up on this, there was a decision in which the judge said the Department of Public Health has absolutely no authority to license physician-owned surgical clinics. So they can't issue a license to these clinics. Therefore, they can't take any action. They can't step on the premises. And so, you know, I've actually worked with Roz on this issue for three plus years now. And um, from a consumer perspective and from a public policy perspective, it's absolutely abhorrent to think that you have one of the largest growing sectors of healthcare in which you have patients under sedation. Absolutely. And they are not licensed. What did they do before this hearing? Before the they were purpose? licensed. They did the licensing. Yes. And then they had a court. Some session. of them. Right. right. And so from a, from a policy perspective, and this is where I show my strong So what the court case did was it stopped the Department of Public Health from being able to inspect them? Right. Or, position or license them, sorry. Just license. Just right. they, they can't inspect position. and they can't license. Right. And, and so I would say this is a... Just a physician owned, right? Or Correct. Right. 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 Any, right. any degree of physician ownership. Right. So 5%, 10%. And so, I mean, I think that this is, you know, something that I feel really strongly and I would support obviously working with the author on. I have two main comments in that I don't necessarily think that the board should be in the business of accrediting facilities. It's not your scope, not our scope of expertise. We license and enforce physicians. We aren't really in the business of understanding and going into surgical clinics, which are far more complicated. 
and the Department of Public Health licenses over 35 different types of facilities. And no one would ever say that a hospital owned by a physician should be accredited by the medical board. And so I don't know why surgical clinics should be different in that respect. What I think we do is we accredit certain entities we, to do, the, we approve those accrediting correct. agencies. We don't physically. Right, but I don't think that you should be in the. We're not debating this. We're yeah. doing it. This is not part of that debate. But I'm just trying to get, we might get to where you're going, but we're, it's not there. But and then the only other thing I would say, if we're going to ask for amendments from this author to consider, is that right now physicians have an option to decide if they want to be accredited or not. And then if they choose not to be accredited at all, there is absolutely nothing in this state that oversees their practice as a surgical clinic. And I think that that's kind of offensive. It's more than kind of offensive, it's worse than that. Okay, Dr. Well, Salmonson guess, and Dr. Carrion, next. I guess I misunderstood it. I thought that this says that either they get a license through the Department of Public Health or they be a, choose to do one of the and I, I'm, I don't have, as they say, a dog in the fight. I use a licensed outpatient surgical facility. I don't want the hassle of owning one. So it's not, you know, it's not protective, all, full disclosure. But um, I do know colleagues who have gone through the process with quadruple A, and believe me, it's rigorous. So I don't think it's a less rigorous inspection. I have seen those facilities and their inspection process. So. I do think those accrediting agencies are, it's, to my understanding, very rigorous. So is that not the bill that it's one or the other? It's not they can just go without anything. That's correct. It's either, um, it's either licensed or accredited. Accredited would be deemed licensed, though. But they have the option now to choose whether they want to be accredited. Mm -hmm. Right. For, Dr. Karen? But the, but the bill would say they would have to no. either have the Department of Health or one of the designated accrediting groups. Is that no. my understanding of the bill as it stands? Yeah. Go ahead. No. They're not changing the law that allows for people to choose whether they want to be accredited or not. The problem I see is that the accreditation process is done by several agencies and some of them belong to the state and another are private. <clears throat> and I don't see a a uniform accreditation. That is why we run with, uh, with surgical centers. For example, yesterday we reviewed a case that this particular surgical center was not accredited. I think for the, for the protection of the patients should be uniform accreditation with certain standards. That is, I think, what the state should do. Otherwise, we're going to run in problems. Ross, please. Go ahead. Rosie Lynn, Pulmano with Senate Business and Professions Committee. Thank you for allowing me to speak today on behalf of um, SB 100, which is actually also similar to SB 1150, which um, contains provisions that are similar to 1150, which this board supported last year. However, as Ms. Um, Jennifer Simos had indicated, we are adding another layer of consumer protection in this bill. As um, the discussion had indicated, prior to 2007, when the CAPEN decision was handed out by the court, the Department of Public Health actually licensed physician-owned clinics. And at that time, I think there were 483 uh, purely licensed surgical clinics that were physician-owned in whole or in part. Prior, um, after 2007, um, the court removed DPH's authority over physician-owned clinics. And so the only existing oversight since 2007 really is this accreditation process, which is contained in Health and Safety Code 1248 at SEC. And what that does is it actually gives the board the authority to approve accrediting agencies to accredit these facilities. And so the board looks at the accreditation standards. There are standards that are in place right now, and one of the goals and the things that we're doing in our bill is to actually improve those standards, make sure that they're uniform throughout, prevent accreditation shopping with these clinics. And the big thing that this bill is doing is if you are an accredited outpatient setting, 
you will be automatically licensed by the Department of, Li um, Department of Public Health. It's that deemed licensure. It's automatic licensure. As you know, right now, the board cannot actually close a clinic. A clinic that's performing bad surgeries, a clinic that may have episodes of patient death, and we've had several of those the last few years and just recently. But the sole authority of the board is really with the physician. And in our opinion, it takes years to move forward and take uh, appropriate action, sometimes five years against a doctor because of due process. So this is the bill that we've crafted uh, with uh, Ms. Jennifer Kent uh, with the previous administration and we strongly believe that by allowing DPH, um, if there is patient harm, reason to believe that there is patient harm, to actually close these facilities, that that would improve um, consumer protection. And so we will work with Jennifer Samos, with the board, with the recommendations. We definitely want to make sure that you get all the information that you need from the DPH with you know, those clinics that will choose to be purely licensed. Okay, now, someone just, I just want to clarify Dr. something. Dr. Moran. To, just uh, to Jennifer Kent's point, the impression that there is a gap that physicians can either choose to be accredited or not. By law in the state of California, a procedure cannot be, be performed under any anesthesia that um, compromises life preserving reflexes without doing it in an accredited facility or licensed facility. So it's not like people are out there legally just doing whatever they want in their offices. That's just, that's not allowed in the state of California. So I just want to clarify that in order to... Right, but this is basically surgery centers. This isn't, we're not talking about doctor's offices, are we? Well, you can have a surgery center in your office. And it oh, can right, be but, it, but it's accredited if you're doing sedation. It must be accredited. Right, that's what, yes, gonna, that's a given. Yeah, yeah. well, it, it is, but it, but it made, gave the impression that there was some gap now, that oh, now sorry. they can do it without being accredited. And that's Thank the, you. So the law? Okay. I mean, I'll look to our attorneys, so 1248.2. It's an outpatient study may apply. It's actually in 2216, the, the uh, Business and Professions Code, the part that says that a physician and surgeon, sh no physician and surgeon shall perform procedures in an outpatient setting using anesthesia uh, in doses that, when administered, have the probability of placing a patient at risk for loss of the patient's life preserving protective reflexes unless the setting is specified in section 1248.1, and that's the health and safety code section that has the list so of then about it wouldn't be too eight different to settings. then amend 1248.1 and point two to make it outpatient shedding, setting shall instead of may. There are, in 1248.1, there are other sorts of approvals, um, if, if uh, let's see if I can find it, <coughs> that pertain to uh, the, the feds having looked at a Medicare clinic or an Indian, mm -hmm tribal land sort of, right. or veterans. Uh, there are a number of other ones that don't fit into the accreditation slash licensure profile that are permissible settings as well. So saying shall would still leave them the option of, if they're a different type of a setting, of not getting the accreditation or the licensure because someone else in theory is looking at them. I would just ask that we work on amendments to make sure that 1248.1 and point two is that there's no gap because it's our understanding, at least from where I used to sit, is that there is. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hepler, did you have a comment? Uh, no, I think the previous discussion took care of it. So. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So can I make a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, oh, are we there not, not on, uh, no, sorry. Not, not on this topic. topic. Still within the bill, but not on outpatient surgery settings and licensure or accreditation thereof. I have a separate issue that. So I, I will wait until the... Okay, so on the motion that's on the... Wouldn't that be part okay, of it? Let me jump in here then. I, Ms. Mose, I'm sorry, I just... Did you talk about the amendments to B&B Code Section 2023.5 20, about the uh, sort of the board shall develop regulations? Did you, or did it, I, quite possibly I could have been asleep and you glossed right over that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, adopt the regulations on the appropriate level of physician availability. This was in the last the last couple of bills um, needed within clinics for lasers or intense <coughs> pulse light devices. Um, yeah, I mean, that's basically the, one of the requirements in the bill. 
And our committee on physician responsibility was set up in response to that from the last legislation pursuant to a request by Senator Negretti McLeod. So hopefully we will be addressing that during the year and it will be done by the time this is chapter. Okay. Is there any more discussion or questions? So on the motion as it stands now to um, support with amendments, or if amended, all those in favor of the motion as it stated, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the, it carries. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, can I ask, ask a question? Um, if, in fact, you know, these responsibilities are eventually going to go to the board, because there's, there's, there's a number of responsibilities enumerated in this for the board. Um, again, I would hope that we would communicate them that there has to be commensurate revenue sources for the board to be able to carry out the functions that it's being mandated to do. So we might have to look at something in terms of uh, a fee structure. Um, for these clinics, if in fact the board has a role in um, enforcement on it. Okay, that will be taken up by Ms. Smith. Thank you. Yeah. So moving on. Um, okay, so the next item, 17D, is the status of regulatory action. Um, there's a matrix included in your board packets. And so um, instead of going through everyone, I will ask if the board has any questions on any of the items in the matrix. It's page 105 for board members. Five, sorry. Thank you. So I see none, uh, no questions. Thank you for the matrix, though. That's, that's it. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Mr. Hepler, would you please um, Come forward and address us on item number 18, the petition of the City of Hope's um, modified Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations, ex Section 1327, uh, A3. I'm going to ask Mr. Go ahead. I'm going to ask Mr. Warden to join me because we have to we can speak to the policy issues, all about the legal issues, about how this, why this petition got here. And we'll go from there. Could you use your microphone and also let me remind uh, the two gentlemen that look anxiously like they'd like to speak to, to please fill out some uh, public speaker slips and give them to uh, Ms. Thompson who's standing in the back and the, they're on the table in the back. Thank you. Good morning, Madam President and members, Kurt Epler, Staff Council. Uh, this, this petition comes to us or this regulatory proposal comes to us kind of in a different venue and a different procedure than we usually uh, the, the, the board usually uh, deliberates upon. This is a, what we call a direct access petition where uh, the entity, the City of Hope, has asked the board formally, has petitioned the board formally to change its regulations. Um, that is permitted under the government code and that is what they have done here. What they seek to do is amend the board's existing regulations to allow um, the City of Hope to enroll foreign medical students within their program. The City of Hope cannot do so now because the way the regulation is structured, the only limit, the only accrediting agency for CME that they can get is the, by the California Medical Association. And the regulation in question was drafted some years ago. What the City of Hope seeks to do is to amend that to allow them to hold, to allow them to be recognized by the <coughs> Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, the, which they belong to now, but the ACCME's bylaws prohibit the City of Hope from ha holding essentially approval from the CMA as a CME provider. I know that's a lot of acronyms and I, and I truly apologize. So the issue before us is if the, with the petition, if the board were to grant the petition and commence the rulemaking process, it would then become like any other uh, rulemaking process. The regulations by their action today would not be effective what we would do is sort of commence the rulemaking process, set the matter for public hearing, the board would prepare an initial statement of reasons and a notice much like we do now for any, any other regulation that sort of bubbles up from the board side. So uh, with that, if Mr. Warden has any policy. And, and once the regulation is passed, they, they, they still have to have to participate in 1327 
it still requires them to apply to the board and um, have most likely a site visit to verify that they have the adequate staffing and facilities to perform what they say they're doing. So um, it, it doesn't Im immediately allow anybody to participate in, th in 1327 without going through the already standard process for application. Thank you. So go ahead. All right, that's, that's it for your presentation? That's it for our presentation. I think uh, the City of Hope has a couple of advocates here that would like to, like to probably explain to the board uh, the reason for their petition and uh, their interest in having it granted. So before I call, I have public comment. Do I have members of this board that have questions specifically as to anything they've heard? Yes, Ms. Kent? Can, and maybe this is appropriate for the City of Hope representatives. So why aren't they just accredited through CNA? They, uh, they, they can't, can't be. They cannot get accredited through CMA. Well, and I just don't know why. Because the bylaws that the, their accreditation is is from, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, am I going the right uh, way? I can, I can. Okay. Well, could I just briefly, the, they are accredited by the larger body that also um, provides the accreditation for, C, for CMA. Mm -hmm. CMA is accredited by the same body that mm -hmm. City of Hope is accredited by, and that's the bigger body, and CMA is the actually smaller circle within that big circle. And the bylaws do not permit them to hold uh, accreditation by a medical society, which is what CMA is. City the of Hope AA, is whatever bylaws don't prohibit, they can't get the accreditation, and the master accreditation is actually held by the entity by which they're accredited. Thank you. I think it's also, it's, it's an old regulation and what we're going to try and do is make it in, bring it up to common, uh, the common era. So, um, I have speakers, um, Robert Morgan, Barbara Dr. Morgan. Question. She, question. You have questions of the staff, our staff. Okay, please. Uh, why is this ACCME and not ACGME? These are medical students. This isn't continuing medical education. This is AC, I assume you mean ACGM? No. 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 Because the regulation currently, 1327, speaks to continuing education, accredited to provide continuing education. That's what the regulation says in its current form. So you're, I, I'm actually confused now. So you're saying, see, I'm sorry, I missed it a little bit. So the CD code. City of Hope cannot enroll them for continuing medical education? Can I help? Yes. Yes, I'm Robert Morgan. I'm a medical oncologist and director of continuing medical education at City of Hope in Southern California. Thank you very much for letting me address you, uh, the board regarding this issue. Basically, this, the situation is, is that medical education is a continuum from medical school through residency programs through the rest of our lives where we have to continue and maintain certification. And there's various criteria that are required at each one of those steps. And before one obtains a medical degree, as, as everyone knows, I'm, I'm going to assume that some people may or may not be more familiar with educational processes in medicine, but basically when a, phys when a, a pre-physician, pre-MD student wishes to finish their medical education, and this is true in either Canada or the United States or in foreign medical schools, they can often obtain elective rotations, usually during their fourth year, to try to obtain particular interest or if they have particular interest in a particular field in an in institute of higher education, they can request to do a clinical rotation in that area. And if you're a medical school, one does in California, if you're a medical school or have a major affiliation defined as being listed in the ACGME or Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education website, then you're not even covered under 1327. So that's an exemption. However, 1327 is a California effort to regulate who can, as a foreign medical student, come and do rotations at a particular hospital that may not have or may not fulfill the definition of major criteria with a medical school. And we fall, we fall through the cracks of, the, of this institutional law. We're a comprehensive cancer center, and as such, we, comp we focus simply on cancer. And many of us have faculty appointments at major medical centers, but we don't meet the criteria of being listed on the ACGME website 
as a major, um, as having a major affiliation with a medical school. And consequently, we have to, in order to be allowed to have medical students from, foreign, from accredited, recognized foreign medical students come through our institution for training, for example, in bone marrow transplantation or surgical oncology, we have to apply to the state for permission to have these students come to be allowed to do the rotation. And we have to fulfill the 1327 criteria, and there's nine of them. And the only criteria that we don't fulfill is criteria three, which states that the health facility shall be accredited for continuing education programs by the California Medical Association. And this law was apparently passed, as I'm understanding it, about 1977. And that was before there was a national umbrella organization for continuing medical education. And that came about in the early 1980s. And in the mid-1980s, the national accreditation body called the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education assumed the national responsibility for accrediting for continuing education. And it also assumed the responsibility to, to accredit state medical societies to be the accreditor within their states. So essentially, the ACCME accredits the California Medical Association that is then allowed to accredit in-state institutions. Now, in-state institutions are defined as those whose authority and their, their areas of influence extend within our state or within the surrounding states. And institutions such as ours, which is an accredited national comprehensive cancer center, has a national focus for continuing education. We have websites, seminars, and international and national uh, standing within continuing medical education. And as such, we must be, by law or by the accreditation standards, accredited by the national accreditation body. In fact, we used to be accredited by the CMA, but in the 90s, when our CME focus expanded to a national focus, we had to apply for national accreditation standard in order to comply with those guidelines. And so since that time, we've been accredited with commendation. And, uh, and, so, and because this law was, was passed long before that the national accreditation body even existed, we fall through the cracks on 1327. So we're asking that you simply add, it's, I guess it's not so simple, I'm sorry. But we're asking that you <laughs> add an accreditation for CMA as well as ACCME, the national body, to number three. And after that, um, we, we would not be fine. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Yeah, thank you. Are there any questions directly of Dr. Morgan since he's sitting here? Okay, I'm going to entertain a, thank you very much. I'm going to entertain. I have a question. I have a uh, question. Pardon me? Um, I have a question. Oh, sure. Of Dr. Morgan. So some of the medical schools are not accepting foreign students because there's been some students that don't speak English and the thought is that the school feels that uh, uh, it's not good patient care. I mean, are there any uh, assurances that uh, these medical students can speak English so they communicate with our patients? Um, we, the answer to that is, is yes, because they have to apply to our program. Most of these students that come and request for rotations at City of Hope are doing it because of international research collaborations between our faculty and other international institutions. So most of them are coming from Germany or from Spain, for example. Um, we haven't really had that as a problem. Um, I'm not sure how one could, uh, could actually guarantee that. Um, ECFMG, I know, requires an English language proficiency test, but that seems like it would be Excuse me, I think, Dr. Morgan, if this is part of a second tier opportunity that when they apply for approval, that would be part of that discussion, I think. What we're doing is trying to just get this No, up. I think it's pretty relevant to the approval, what their plan is to deal with when, that. I think that's what, when you this, this, if you, uh, if you set this regulation for hearing, it does not oh, gotcha. guarantee Sorry. that should they apply, they will be accepted. It merely allows them the opportunity to apply for Section 1327. Right. And I, I think I'll make that the help motion. Doctor, wait one second. Dr. Lode, is that? Yeah, sure. Is that okay? I'll okay, so what, what I'm looking for is a proposal to set this for hearing as recommended by staff. That's the move and your second, Ms. Jane? Yeah. Well, 
Okay, thank you. So any uh, public comment on the proposed motion as it stands? Madam President, if I could, I just want to, there's actually two amendments. Number one is the City of Hope. This is on page 106, and there's a technical cleanup amendment on page 107. So the board would essentially accomplish, or if set for hearing, would try to do both. Right. Sure. Right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Is there any public comment on the motion as it stands? Any public comment? Any board comment? Okay. All those in favor of the motion as it stands, which is to have this proposal set for hearing as recommended by staff, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Morgan, for being present. Uh, we are not at the time frame that I need to, um, to, to move uh, on number 19, so we're going to move on to number, item number 20. And uh, Dr. Lowe, if you would uh, give us an update on uh, International Medical School's recognition, please. So attached uh, for, your, for your information is a list of the six international medical schools that have submitted applications for review and uh, two of the medical schools will be reviewed by the board today. And these are very comprehensive timeline details of, uh, of all their uh, submissions and our replies. Three of the current uh, medical consultants' temporary assignments have or are about to expire. Now, the examination for licensing medical consultants was released with a final filing date of uh, January 21st, 2011. However, there is a current uh, hiring freeze which prevents us from hiring new consultants or extending the current appointment terms at this time. <coughs> Nevertheless, we're proceeding with establishing a list to be used when we are able to hire those medical consultants. Okay, any questions uh, about this so far? Any public comment? Or? Okay, I'd like to call on um, Mr. Warden uh, to give us an update on the status of the medical schools that are being reviewed. Okay. Okay, um, please turn to page uh, one. I'm going to start on page 116 with the, uh, um, excuse me, yeah, uh, 117. And we'll start with, uh, uh, Unibe and Unibe is currently being uh, reviewed by one of our medical consultants and um, he has not finished his review at this time. We're wait waiting for the outcome of whether he needs additional information or uh, what his determination is on that. Uh, we have next would be the Medical University of Silesia and that will be one of the schools we are reviewing today at, for the board. Uh, the Medical University of Warsaw is, has submitted additional information that has been reviewed by the medical consultant and um, that review has not been totally completed at this time. The Technon, Institute of, Technon Israel Institute of Technology American Program is one of the schools that's um, scheduled to be reviewed today. And we have a new school that has requested approval, which is the, universe, the Queensland University of Australia, and they're doing a branch campus in um, Louisiana, I believe it is. And they have uh, requested on how to get approval for that branch campus. And I'll move on to um, number B, which is the American University of Antigua. And, um, University of Antigua, we had requested um, a site visit approval from the governor's office. We have received that approval. Um, we have been moving forward with that. Uh, the University of Antigua has submitted the funds for the site visit. We are working with them on the final details of where the actual hospitals will be in New York that we visit and also the uh, details from uh, the travel from New York to Antigua to review the school in Antigua. And this tight visit is tentatively scheduled for March, uh, mid-March. And uh, we're leaving, I think it's around, well, I'm not leaving, but the site visit team is leaving approximately, uh, I think it was March 6th, 13th, 14th. Okay, so 
And that's um, for A and B. We'll go on to review the um, uh, update for the international medical schools on uh, re-review for previously recognized medical schools. Um, we had a meeting with Dr. Loa Zarelian, myself, and Ms. Whitney, and to discuss the process for uh, how to what, go from here. We have 14 schools that have a, we previously approved, and the proposed um, uh, schedule for that, um, Ross University is up for the first rec re -rec approval for re-recognition. And we will be um, starting that process um, in the summer of 2001 uh, to get the required information. They have previously sent information, and we will be updating that information. The next school on the list is the American University of Caribbean. Um, we're going to try to schedule them for the fall of 2011. That school has also provided information previously, which will need to be uh, uh, updated a little also. The next school on that list would be the St. George University in Granada and that when we had scheduled, trying to schedule for fall of 2011 also. Um, these are the schools that have been the longest recognized by the board and uh, be the first time for them to be re-recognized since the, the uh, regulation went into effect requiring the re-recognition process. And the rest of the schools are um, just sort of identified by when they would fall within that seven-year review process. Um, one, one of the uh, problems we will face is uh, if we don't have staff to process the work and medical consultants to do the reviews. So um, this schedule was based on before we had the, those uh, issues of staffing and medical consultants not possibly being available. So that the, I'm recommending that the, um, the board sort of a, adopt this schedule with giving the special task force um, the option of adjusting the schedule as needed based on staff. So, so what we need is <coughs> we need a motion authorizing the special task force to revise the timeline should it be deemed uh, necessary at a later date. So do I have a motion? No move. Do I have a second to the motion? Second. Do I have any public comment on the motion? Do I have any questions from the board members on the motion as it's stated? But seeing none, I ask all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? So the motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. OK, that's it. That's the update. I do have a public speaker's comment on number 20. Uh, Leonard, if you could only spell your last name so I could uh, pronounce it. Scafani, I apologize. Would you please come forward? I can't, I can't read your writing, I'm sorry. I should know your name by now, but I don't. That might be good. Remember the three minute rule? You remember, you remember. I have no comments. Oh, thank you, sir. So moving on, uh, 21. Dr. Silva, if you would please come forward and join Mr. Warden, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, how much time do you want me to discuss these pages? They start on 124.3. Well, you, t uh, you, I'll cut you off. I need to. Let's, let's okay, hear a full let's, report. Okay. Let's spend around five minutes plus. Five minutes. Five. Uh, what you have in front of you are, are two reports, which I wrote with the great help of the staff, uh, and. Uh, one was our initial questions framed from the reapplication of the uh, medical school at Silesia. And uh, we framed some 24, 25 questions. Uh, material was there, but it wasn't organized well, and uh, in many ways didn't answer the question being proposed for uh, this accreditation process. We then received uh, a long response. Uh, and that one uh, had about eight, ten areas that we dug into, and they really pinned down a lot of uh, the answers indicated they weren't compliant. 
of California regulations for a uh, medical school education. Uh, the school itself is one of the older ones. Uh, there are about seven or eight that have formed right after World War II, and it's had a strong academic senate. Uh, they use more of a German model of education, and uh, they have a long track record of uh, training uh, effective physicians and researchers. Uh, the, uh, the English programs are really a, a one four-year program, and the other one is a six-year program. Uh, of course, the majority of the students come from America or hybrids that are uh, parents were from Poland and go back and, and some of them uh, uh, masquerade as, as a Polish citizen, which is okay, and uh, at Taiwan and a number of countries. The uh, university has a separate faculty. They have the appropriate administrative uh, support uh, in terms of running the English-based programs. Uh, there's good peer review by the faculty as to the professionalism uh, of their students. And uh, they do that both at the level of preclinical training and at the last two years of training. Uh, we asked for a tightening up of the list of their affiliations inside Poland because the number of the hospitals had shifted addresses or names and we have that all corrected now. Uh, the other area that we spent a fair amount of time interacting with them was their uh, international affiliations where students from the English program primarily go and are primarily in the United States and uh, one is in Canada. And they provided us forms and evidence that they do uh, uh, review the performance of their students. They have a faculty mentor who reviews these on a regular basis. The students are asked to keep meticulous uh, logbooks of the patients they're seeing, what the quality is, and that's reviewed back at the home site in Silesia. The budget is sufficient to train. Uh, they have uh, uh, a lot of web-based learning. Uh, their anatomy uh, facilities, a little bit on the short side, but I had the opportunity to visit there about 2001. And uh, it is an acceptable way to do anatomy, uh, that you uh, don't have four students per body, but you split them up, they have subsections to the table, and they use a lot of prosection. Uh, so overall, I think they're getting a good education. Uh, they comply with our regulations. And uh, by and large, the thing they lack are uh, feedback from the students. Once the English-based uh, students leave, they give very little feedback to this university, and we'll see that in other universities, including many in the United States. Uh, they also, um, I think, have done a pretty good job at uh, coordinating their students' activities. And uh, I had no other comments about the program. Uh, members, do we have any questions of Dr. Service? I think it's wonderful the way you're making the presentation, so it gives us all a, a broad understanding of what goes into one of these accreditation applications. So thank you. So would you like to uh, move, I, I would Kurt? And, uh, Kurt and Jordan, the question comes up, uh, should it be extended back two years before their application? Uh, well, the, the question is, should we give the approval for when the, the start of the English language program or or not so. How many students? And I, my you? recommendation is is that we um, provide recognition for the English language program from its inception. Right. So retroactive. 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 Thank you. So the date. And not do a site visit. Fine. Right. Okay. Everyone fine. Okay with this. So I need a motion to approve. So move. Thank you. A second. Thank you. Uh, any public comment on the motion? Any, public, uh, any comments additional from the board members? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No, thank you very much. D wait, don't go anywhere. You're... Oh, sorry, Dr. Silva, sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> you I apologize. Yes. You know, the names start with the same letter. I figure it's the same, same people are gonna present. I apologize, I definitely apologize. So we'll now move to item number uh, 22. I apologize, I called you Dr. Service before, it's Dr. Silva. I mean, if I'd only read what was in front of me, it would help. So now I'm going to ask Dr. Service to please join you. Kurt, up here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, okay, please. 
please, you want me to start? Please start. Yeah, start. Introdu you introduce yourself. Since, uh, I'm Mark Service. I'm uh, the curriculum dean at UC Davis School of Medicine. And uh, was asked to review uh, the Technion American Medical Students Program, uh, which is a, a medical school based in Haifa, Israel. Can you just, excuse me, you need to speak directly into the microphone because it's going in and out. Sorry. It's okay. Can everyone hear me? So I was asked to review Technion, um, the American Medical Students Program, which is a medical school based in Haifa, Israel. And Technion is a well-established uh, medical school in Israel, has been in existence for over 40 years, and has uh, graduated thousands of uh, physicians in Israel. They have a six-year um, medical school program there and uh, have affiliated uh, with a number of community hospitals in the Haifa area and have a principal teaching hospital in Haifa. And um, their six-year program is uh, based in the Hebrew language and it's a large medical school. And so this uh, American medical students program is essentially a school within the Haifa Medical School, the Technion University School. And it's a small school um, with 32 students maximal per year. And it's been uh, in existence since 2006. And it's a five-year program with the English language um, being utilized. But uh, not surprisingly, it, it essentially uh, shares or borrows from the Technion Medical School program which is, of course, a very robust, well-established program. It's a strong school um, with a national reputation. It's very strong faculty and a very excellent curriculum. It has Nobel Prize winners on its faculty, so um, it's well regarded. And this um, smaller English language-based school, um, from my inspection of the curriculum, essentially uh, utilizes a very parallel curriculum to the well-established 40-year-old uh, Hebrew-based uh, school using the same faculty, uh, the same inherent courses. It does use more small group and problem-based learning and it has a very strong emphasis, uh, not too surprisingly, on research training and research experience because um, that is a strength at Technion uh, within the, the home school. And they utilize clinical rotations principally in Israel, uh, the same clinical rotations and sites that the uh, larger medical school, the Hebrew-based school, uses. Uh, and they have established, interestingly enough, a couple of um, rotations here in California with our own medical schools, both at UC Irvine and at USC for students in their final year, clinical year of training. Because the purpose of the school is to train medical students who once uh, they graduate will pursue their residency training in the United States and Canada. And in fact, it does appear that California will be a favored uh, location for many of them. So uh, based on the strength of uh, this school historically, the larger medical school, uh, the apparent quality of the faculty and the curriculum, um, I uh, had no problem recommending that uh, we would approve them and they certainly meet our requirements, um, beginning with the class of uh, 2006. Thank you. Uh, do I have questions? I have a, I have a question. Please. So um, in your report, you had mentioned that they recently made the, the American Students Program, students pass the USMLE. That's a one, new two. requirement, yeah. And um, in terms of the, the program, at what point do they have to require the students to do it? Is it similar to other medical schools where step one will be taken after the second year? Yes, this is interesting. I think in the process of preparing uh, to meet our requirements, <clears throat> as well as I think their um, growing understanding of the requirements for entering U.S. residency programs, they quickly figured out that the U.S. MLE was a necessary step. And so they plan on implementing it in the same way that U.S. medical schools do. Um, and uh, they have had students take the USMLE um, 
They didn't have good statistics for us because they have not been faithfully tracking it up until now, but their anecdotal reports um, were that their students have done very well. Um, my uh, guess is that's probably accurate. Thank you, Dr. Zerlian. Any other questions? Any, uh, I need a motion to approve. Second. So this is a motion to retroactively approve, uh, recognize, excuse me, the school back to um, June, June of 2006. And no site visit. Yes. Can I, can I just ask a question? The, the, yes. the language of instruction is in English. That's correct. But clearly communicating with patients is a big part of uh, medical, ed uh, medical training and medical education. Yeah. Are they actually instructed in Hebrew language or Arabic and or Arabic while they're doing this? No, I, I think they're uh, instructed largely in Hebrew in the classroom. But Their uh, regular program that they have, in the, which is a Hebrew-speaking program, the doctors are trained in Arabic, uh, patient Arabic. Oh, in the Arabic language, yes. Okay, no, it's part of the requirement English, for graduation. For the English language program, in language of instruction is Hebrew? Is that what you said? I think that they're largely bilingual in this setting, and I think the faculty are as well. Um, and so I think there's no hard and fast rule about the uh, actual language that might be utilized. So when they pass a USMLE, is that in English? Oh, that's in English. There is no other <laughs> form of the USMLE. So they're obviously able to converse and function well in, in their use of the English language. And they take this, and the new requirement includes, of course, the CS, Step 2 CS exam, which requires communicating with patients in English. These are mostly American students, aren't they? They are. They're American students who are determined to train in residency training here in the U.S. That, that wasn't my, my question was the opposite. So as medical students in a four-year English language program in Israel, are they able to communicate with the people they're taking care of on clinical rotations there? Yeah, and their clinical rotations in Haifa and the surrounding community hospitals. That I can't speak to with any certainty. None of the materials really covered anything related to that. Okay, all those in favor of the motion as made, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Any abstentions? So thank you very much for your time and energies making this happen. You're welcome. We're going to um, move to item uh, 23. Mr. Ward Warden, please present this. Okay, on page 131 is the um, workload status report for the licensing program. And uh, basically all the statistics sort of speak for themselves, but I would like to go over the actual statistics for the initial review of the physician and surgeon applications, um, the initial reviews for the U.S. Canadian applications is 30 days for initial review. For international graduates, it's 37 days. We have um, pending mail at seven days for both. Um, the, the staff has done an excellent job of getting these numbers to this goal. We're coming up on the uh, heavy workload for the, for the residents who are in, uh, coming up on the end of their um, 2065 extension, which is for the U.S. grads who must be licensed by the second year of their training and for the 2066 exemption which requires international grads to be licensed by the end of their third year. Um, we do have some issues that could, that will affect these numbers and will cause them to rise. That is the expected increase in the applications that start coming in. Uh, even though with our outreach efforts we have received quite a few of these applications, we still are anticipating um, a, a large influx in the month of, towards the end of February and and the beginning of March. Um, we also have uh, several vacancies in the licensing program and we have that issue to deal with because we have a freeze. So um, that could also impact that. So far we've been able to manage this workload. Um, uh, 
with the assistance of all the managers and myself to make sure that we're trying to keep track on that. But it, the, the numbers will eventually go up, which is expected, but should still, I'm hoping to stay manageable. Um, so just, just for your information. Um, We have the on special faculty permit committee meeting and the next meeting is scheduled for March 24th. However, we do not currently have any applications for special <laughs> faculty permit and if we do not have a completed application um, by February 28th, we will be canceling that meeting. Um, I've provided you with an Information on international medical schools. Um, we do have the six that we talked about today, and the two that you reviewed. And we just been, just before this meeting, um, Duke University contacted the medical board uh, regarding their t program where they have opened a new medical school in Singapore with the uh, National University of Singapore. And they are inquiring on how to um, get our recognition for that school. Um, and as you heard today, the Medical University of Silesia was approved and the Technion was approved also. The, uh, the, um, we have one specialty board application in process, it has had its initial review completed and board staff has sent a letter to the specialty board requesting additional clarification and, and or information depending on uh, what they need decide to do. Um, I will now go to um, the update on AB 2386 implementation which is um, was sent separately and is the draft form of the registration form that the military will use to notify us of, um, and the hospitals will use to notify us of training in their hospital for currently licensed military physicians to prepare them for combat tra type training. Um, the, this form is um, in the draft stages. It's pretty much complete. It just needs the final review from legal to make sure we have everything covered. And it, once that is approved, we'll, we'll have that up on our website for them to use. Thank you. Is there, are there any questions or comments of any of the members of Mr. Warden and his report? I would yeah. just like to remind everyone sitting at this table that we're now going to be coming into the um, push for licensing and that the staff is understaffed. We are under a freeze. We have money in our budget, unfortunately, or fortunately, but it doesn't do us any good. Um, we need to recognize that uh, Mr. Warden's staff has been really, really um, engaged in the story, and that's from himself on down. It's not been just those that are in charge of the work, but his, his senior leaders in that department. I want to thank you personally, as well as on behalf of the board, for the work and effort, and hopefully um, there will be some relief to what is going to be coming, because we don't want to get to the point we were in last year. Uh, without question. So I hope you, uh, along with our executive director, will pay close attention to this and keep us informed as uh, not that we can do anything, but we can sure complain. Uh, I, we are working on that as we speak. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on to um, item number... We're going to move to item number 25. Exactly. Uh, Mr. Shanke. Would you please uh, come on up here and address us? I'm trying to, uh, I'm, I'm watching the clock and realizing when we have to take breaks, so I'm trying to manage the time. So I apologize for skipping around, but that's the way it is. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, okay. Or it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. It is what it is. I'm wearing it. Thank you. Mr. Chunky. Following the November meeting, as we uh, uh, advise you at that time, uh, Ms. Whitney, Mr. Warden, and several of the licensing managers attended uh, two GME meetings which we hosted here in California, one in Northern California, one in Southern California, and uh, Kaiser, of course, uh, very graciously stepped up to the plate and hosted uh, both of the meetings for us. Uh, the meetings were well attended. It was, we, we extended an invitation to the GME offices of all 175 teaching hospitals in California. 
Uh, it gave us an opportunity to hear their concerns, for us to share with them their expect our expectations of them, and I was pleased that we had uh, numerous uh, hospitals who participated in these meetings for the first time. So it was a very good opportunity for us to have face-to-face -face meetings and actually meet some of the people with whom we've communicated over the years. Uh, secondly, I would like to bring you up to date on what we have been calling our annual matrix, keeping in mind that uh, U.S. and Canadian medical school graduates must be licensed by the end of their 24th month of training in order to uh, begin uh, continue training here in California. International medical school graduates must be licensed by the end of their 36th month of training. And over the last couple of years, uh, the first time it came uh, from the suggestion of uh, your director, Ms. Whitney, that we actually outreach to the teaching hospitals, all the teaching hospitals around California, and extend to them an offer that they submit to us the names of all of the people who need licensure by the end of the training year so that we would have a better understanding of what the expectation was of our workload, yet at the same time we were able to return information to them and let them know when their residents and fellows actually applied, if they had applied or not, uh, and what the status of the application was. Uh, last year in 2010 we had 37 of the major teaching hospitals around California who participated in the matrix uh, this year so far, we have 36 hospitals which are participating in the matrix, of which eight of the hospitals are new to the process and had not participated in past years. I've contacted the other hospitals personally, directly with the director of GME, to, of the hospitals that have not sent us the list this year, even though they participated last year, and uh, two of them have replied uh, promptly to the reminder. So I'm still waiting to hear on six more. Uh, last year we had a total of about 1,800 names on the list of uh, people who needed to be licensed by the end of the training year. Right now we are just under 1,000 names, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think if anything it, it reflects the, the responsiveness of uh, Mr. Warden's licensing staff that we're actually much further along in the process this year and that there's not nearly the backlog which has been identified by the teaching hospitals. Uh, of the thousand names currently on the list, 800 have applied. So about 200 have not applied, even though about 50 of those have told their GME offices that they have applied. We don't have an application for them. So this is the very good feedback. We're, we're advising the GME offices that we do not have an application for these people even though they're telling their own program director and their own GME staff that they have. So it gives us the further leverage to encourage the GME directors and their program staff to, uh, and you're nodding your head yes, to uh, give them the, uh, the little boost that they need to encourage them to apply in a more timely manner. They check those applications, those are liars when they come in. <laughs> uh, of the 800 people who have applied, uh, and keep in mind the number of names is low because the hospitals already knew that, the, that many of their residents were licensed, uh, so therefore they didn't even turn in those names. But of the 800 names that were turned in to us at some point, 260 by now have already been licensed, and 50 of the 800 names, uh, their file is complete and they're only waiting for birth month licensure. So we are tremendously ahead, and I am receiving uh, weekly, if not multiple times each week, compliments for the licensing staff and Mr. Warden for the job that they're doing, that we're so much further ahead in the process. Uh, of the 200 who have not applied, at least 15 of them have paid their application fee online, but uh, some going back as far as September and October of last year, so they've, they've paid for the fee online, they just haven't sent so us the paperwork yet. <laughs> so, and there are two applicants so far uh, who we have identified as having uh, major or significant issues which could impact their ability to get licensed at all. 
And uh, simply the fact that we are so caught up on, on the problem applications is also a significant indication that things are working well in licensing. For my continued outreach this year, uh, I already have uh, numerous uh, uh, orientation, new resident orientation during June and July on my calendar and already have licensing outreach events scheduled through November of this year at teaching hospitals to start the process for 2012. Mr. Schumke, I want to um, take a moment just to thank you very much for your outreach opportunities that you have afforded all of these um, students in schools. What we are seeing, I think, by the work that you have been able to do is an increased efficiency and the ability to license doctors uh, to get ahead of the curve on the backlog, but more importantly to prove that government doesn't have to be a bureaucracy. The government employees uh, are there for the the good of the community and this community is the state of California and all of our students here as well as our medical schools and teaching hospitals so it's a collaborative effort that we're all participating in and I really know that you're on the road a lot more than anyone I know so um, you might enjoy it but I want you to know that we really enjoy the uh, attention to detail and the uh, engagement that you have been able to make happen and really on behalf of this board thank you very much uh, are there any comments or uh, questions of Mr. Shumke on his report? I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm freezing in this room. I, I guess we have no air conditioning energy problems in Northern California. Um, we're glad to have you here. You know, we're very pleased to be here. Thank you. Um, the number 26, you can move on the, uh, and you're... Briefly um, recognizing your, your goal of 1130. I'm here to briefly provide an update to you on the joint telemedicine diabetes education program, which has uh, been coordinated and uh, is uh, being implemented between the Medical Board of California and UC Davis. Uh, implementation of the pilot program, as was reported by Dr. Nuovo uh, to you at the July meeting this year, went relatively smoothly during the first year. But now the project is facing some growing pains. None of these are necessarily unexpected and probably are a good learning experience that allow the team, the medical board, and the legislature to consider the reality of rural health care, even when using uh, telemedicine. While the project is coming to a close at some of the clinics, other clinics have had to cancel some of the classes because patients dropped out of or during the holidays simply did not want to make the commitment to attend the diabetes telemedicine training programs. And I found out that uh, some of the patient volunteers in some of the rural settings are traveling over one hour from their home to get to the closest clinic to participate in the diabetes uh, education seminars. Uh, one of the clinics has uh, experienced connectivity issues, poor quality visual and auditory equipment, for their own standards, they were very pleased and very anxious to participate in the telemedicine program, but in reality, the uh, clinic was not using high-quality equipment. They had a computer with old software, an inferior webcam, and their bandwidth could not handle both at the same time. But since the clinic has a speakerphone, the UCD has come up with an alternative by thinking outside the box, using the speakerphone and landline to communicate uh, verbally with the practice site while using the, the webcam to uh, provide the visual connections. Uh, one of the clinics reported that uh, for nine months now they've been anxious to join the program and they recently sent an email that said we finally have fiber optic cable in the medical building. They, meaning Verizon, started pulling the source from two miles away. We expect them to finish within the next few weeks. They need to go over several creeks, under an annual rock slide, and over a freeway to get uh, the connection completed between the clinic and the Verizon office. And uh, as I said, this clinic has been working on this for nine months. Uh, the team is uh, gradually focusing on the end of this three-year pilot program. They have about three months left to re recruit clinics to participate so that their patients can still get the full benefit of the program. Uh, they're fully engaged. They have health co coaching and CME events which are fully operational. And we have already put them on notice and invited them to a, a, again attend the July meeting so that they can bring to you the information that uh, encapsulates the, the second year of the program 
and what still needs to be done during the third year of the program before the pilot comes to an end. Thank you very much. Any questions on this report? Mr. Shunk, again, thank you very much. Uh, it's now, as we can see, 11.33, and we're going to break for half an hour for lunch and be back for our 12 o'clock uh, presentation. Promptly at 12 o'clock, we are starting. Thank you. Okay, if, <laughs> if everyone could please take their seats, I'd like to get this meeting underway. Ms. Chang, if you could please come sit down. Where's Dr. Lowe? What happened to Dr. Lowe? Okay, so we're going to um, go back to agenda item 19. And I'm going to call on uh, Dr. Dussault and Dr. Leon. Would you like to start this yes, part uh, of the uh, program, please? Yeah. Yes, make, make the phone call and... Uh, also, can I ask, are the lights dimmed because they've been dimmed or it's my eyes or my brain? I want to make sure I wasn't having any mental issues. Dr. Drew, so you would like to wait for him to be on the call? Yes, we can. So we're going to just wait a moment silently. <laughs> <clears throat> but no praying. It's a state meeting. So has anyone had an update on the news in the last two hours or hour about what's going on in Egypt at all? No? Oh, sorry. Forget that idea. Can anybody hear him? No. Not really. Well, he, he's not saying much, so we don't have to. <laughs> but but, but can, can, you hear help? can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Can, can you hear us, uh, Dr. Delapena? Fine, thank you so much. All right. Uh, well, let's, let's begin and let me, um, let me thank uh, Madam Chair, uh, Linda and your staff for being so gracious uh, to accommodate this uh, presentation as well as the board members. Uh, I, I want to say from the outset that this is not a presentation uh, for consideration, for recognition. This university is already recognized by this medical board. This is a goodwill presentation of uh, a university <clears throat> that I visited and uh, one that uh, I thought uh, was, was significant enough to come and share with this board the kind of uh, university uh, this is and so that we can see firsthand uh, the, the kind of uh, school that we're talking about, in my view, is equivalent to uh, the schools here in the, in the U.S. And I've been associated with UC Davis for 30 years, so I have some sense of uh, the standards of these schools. Uh, and <clears throat> Dr. Della Pena, 
uh, will be joining us um, for full disclosure and uh, he may have a comment also uh, during this presentation. And I also uh, invited uh, Dr. Sergio Gaziola, uh, who will also have a few words uh, with whom I work at the University of Davis Health System. And you will see the relevance uh, in a minute. <clears throat> but what we are attempting to do at UC Davis Health System is to explore a uh, collaborative relationship with the University of uh, Autonoma at Guadalajara Medical School is referred to as uh, UAG and a uh, pre-internship program. <clears throat> but before I uh, introduce uh, the speakers, let me just say that uh, it is, the literature uh, is well documented that uh, here in California, we will face about a 17,000 physician shortage by 2015. And it's also predicted that the United States will face a shortage of up to 150,000 physicians by 2020, including some 40,000 primary care physician, you see the relevance in a minute. And currently the California population is roughly 38 million people, of which 4.5 million represent Hispanics, which is a 37% of the population of California. And when we look at physicians that are licensed by this board, only 5% of the practicing physicians in California are Hispanics. So you can begin to see the wide disparities uh, in providers for the population of California. And given this situation, UC Davis Health System is exploring a collaborative partnership with UAG that allows their graduates to participate in a pre-internship program through a memorandum of understanding that is yet to be negotiated. The purpose of this pre-internship program that we seek is driven by the health care reform legislation passed by Congress and our desire to make sure that our institution uh, is accessible for the population that we serve. And when this legislation is fully implemented in 2014, 32 more million un uninsured people are anticipated to have insurance, and they will be seeking access to the healthcare systems across the nation. And at UC Davis Health System, we want to be prepared to respond to this population and have good patient outcome. And we're, at, and we're attempting to be proactive in making our institution accessible to this population. And <clears throat> I would, before I, in a minute, recognize Dr. Ricardo Leon, I want to uh, recognize uh, Dr. Uh, Sergio Gaziola, who, uh, who is a graduate of uh, the University of uh, Autonoma at Guadalajara. Uh, he is the director of uh, UC Davis Health System Center for Reducing Health Disparities. He's a professor of internal medicine and he is an international renowned expert on mental health in ethnic populations. And Dr. Gaziola introduced us to Dr. Richard Leon, and I was so happy he did because it's opened up uh, a global international window for us. And I have had the good fortune of uh, visiting the university, and I was so impressed with the university, and uh, I, I got excited and said, why don't we, uh, you know, bring this university to the, to, the, to, the, to the Medical Board of California and to the State of California. 
and you all will see why. Uh, so without further ado, let me <coughs> introduce our main speaker. He is Dr. Richard Ricardo Leon. He's currently the Vice President of Health Sciences of UAG. Prior to this position, he was Dean of the School of Medicine and of the International Program of the School of Medicine at UAG. He received his MD from the university. He received his master's degree in science administration at Central Michigan uh, University in 1993. In, in 2000, he was selected as a scholar at the Harvard Macy Institute program for leaders in medical education. He is a board member of the International Association of Medical Science Educators. He has been an active participant in the Association of American Medical Colleges since 1990. Dr. Leon belongs to organizations such as the American Association of Psychology, the Association of Medical Education of Europe, and Mexico Association of Mex Mexican Colleges. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Leon, who will make a presentation on UAG Medical School. Well, thank you for this warm uh, welcome. And uh, it's uh, very interesting for me to be here, not only because uh, this area used to be part of my background. When I was a little kid, around seven years old, my father came down to, uh, to Berkeley and to uh, Davis to make a master's program in agriculture. And as a kid, these were my surroundings. So last time that I had an opportunity to be at UC Davis, I was able to go and see the house I used to live and good memories came out of all this. But that's a different issue. Um, so, so we're going to, uh, to, uh, to tell you a little bit about this internship program that we're trying to establish in collaboration with uh, UC Davis. Uh, that's a picture that uh, Dr. Shelton took when he was at Guadalajara in his visit. I'm going to give you, uh, to start out uh, with the background information of our university. Uh, we have been uh, in place for almost uh, 76 years now in Mexico. And the way the university was born, it, it was because in Mexico and during the 30s, the uh, president of the country decided that all universities were going to be uh, institutes of higher uh, socialist education. So uh, as a response of the, uh, of the audience of the people who were in Mexico, they say, we don't want that. Okay? We want to continue being autonomous. So because of the fights and everything that started with Mexico, as an example, the National University of Mexico became autonomous. And that's where the National Autonomous University of Mexico came out. Uh, the the uh, you know, second largest city in Mexico was Guadalajara. And the students of that time wanted to have the same opportunity as Mexico City. So they continued to fight, but the Mexican government said, no way. If we do that, what is going to happen, all universities in the country are going to want to be autonomous. So in 1933, 1935, there was a, a manifestation of the people of the city of Guadalajara, students, parents, citizens, workers, everyone against the government trying to uh, give this autonomy to the university, and there were three people killed. At that time, the governor called the Federation of Students and asked them, what do you want? We want to be autonomous. You want to be autonomous, you're autonomous. <clears throat> give us the buildings, no buildings. Budget, no budget. What are you giving me? The autonomy that you want? Go ahead and make this the university. So the students, ranging from 18 to 22 years old, were the ones that in combination with the citizens of Guadalajara and the, uh, and the people in general were able to build the first private university in the country. The, 
Obviously, when we started, it started very poor. Faculty gave their time free, secretaries gave their time free. The people in Guadalajara got involved in this process and gave their homes to be used as uh, classrooms and hospitals and everything free of charge. The things continued little by little, but it wasn't until the 60s when the President Kennedy made the invasion of uh, Bahia de Cochinos uh, in Cuba. And uh, the old university reopened its doors two years after we were autonomous. And they were going on a manifestation against the, the American consulate in Guadalajara. So this manifestation against them because of the acts of President Kennedy happened when they were passing in front of our university. And as a result of that, the two universities start fighting, like in the old times with sticks and feasts and things like that, no machine guns anymore. So after that happened, the following day, the Consul of the United States in Guadalajara went to the President to thank him for avoiding the conflict with the State University. Our President said, we, don't, we didn't have nothing to do with it. It was just a reaction of the students. No, but I know who you are now. The following week, faculty from University of Texas in San Antonio went down to Guadalajara to see how they could help us. That's the way that we started the relationship with the United States. From there, the, uh, the department, the, the, the uh, U.S. Department of uh, the AIDS, USAID Department, uh, made up a program for one university of each country south of the border of the United States in order to make an education uh, consultation and, and practice to all of us. And since we were the good, the new kids in this process, they invited UAG. So they were in meetings for almost seven months, that's what I was told. And at the end, everyone had an opportunity to request something to the United States government. And what our former president said, we want time. Six months later, they returned to the United States with the master plan of development of the university. And then is when the university starts growing. So they get a loan, the main campus was constructed, and everything continued to grow. During those days, the needs of physicians in the United States was very large, and to create a spot in the United States was very difficult. So the government asked our university if we were able to train physicians in Guadalajara. So we said, why not? Start sending. And then is when we started to receive American students in Guadalajara for the first time. That's in the early 60s. Since those days, we have graduated more than 14,000 graduates. Okay, they're practicing all over the United States. I may say that around 1% of the physicians of your country are graduates of Guadalajara. And they're supporting the needs of not only the underserved, but also from Hispanic communities. Because at the end of our process, most of our graduates, or I may say all our graduates, are bilingual and bicultural. During many years, there was a program established and that was established by our students by the North American Students Association. This association uh, created a program in order to avoid the year of social service because the Mexican system, as we'll talk a little bit later, is a six-year program. So uh, the, uh, the North Americans decided that it were, this was a little difficult to be so many years in Mexico. So a, pro a program st uh, sponsored by the American Medical Association called Fifth Pathway Program allowed them to return to the United States in an early form. And this worked out very well until a couple of years ago. When the uh, Fifth Pathway uh, ended, we requested the support of the Mexican Ministry of Education in order to be able to give the North American students that we had in place in Guadalajara an opportunity to get the, me the medical degree from Mexico without having to make this year of social service situation that was granted. And this information was supported by many documents that actually I have with me to the ACFMG. The ACFMG accepted the proposal that we made in support, with the support of the Ministry of Education of our country, and we were able to establish the pre-internship program that is actually working right now in your medical college. 
The Nidinger Medical College was one of the last uh, uh, medical schools in the country that supported the fifth pathway program. So for them it was very easy to shift from the fifth pathway program to the pre-internship program that we have now uh, currently going on. We have had the support, the full support of the Medical Board of New York and uh, actually the Medical Board of New York has uh, requested my presence in several times in order to help them to support the way to improve the quality of the uh, foreign medical schools that are uh, practicing, their students are practicing in, in New York. And so uh, we are, they're, they're trying to uh, increase the standards at least to the ones that we have as an international school uh, out, out of your country. So here you can see the route of license for a U.S. citizen that uh, studies with us. This, the system is very similar, or actually almost the same as it happens here in the United States, in which we have two years of basic sciences. At the end of basic sciences, they have to pass the United States Medical Licensing Examination, step one. After that, they go into the uh, clinical years, in which the third year is a core clerkship process, and after that, they go into electives that can be taking place in Mexico or it can be taking place in U.S. medical schools or U.S. hospitals. At the end of that program, all students have to go to the internship year. We call it in Mexico internship, okay? In order to make it more clear for U.S., we have to put the name of pre-internship, okay? Because the internship usually happens during the residency year in the United States. So our internship in Mexico uh, uh, consists of going into all the rotations that are usually made, happens in a year of, of an intern, in the first year of residency in any uh, teaching hospital. And at the end of that process, they have to pass this, the USMLE Step 2 with the two components. And after that, they are able to receive the degree from Mexico. And with that degree of Mexico, they receive the uh, ECFMG certificate. With that, they enter the match and they continue uh, integrated into the, uh, in, into the education of, of your country. So, as highlights, the pre-internship program is one year of supervised clinical training. This is a program made only for UAU uh, School of Medical students that completed uh, college or pre-med studies in the US or Canada. This has to be done in a university hospital or affiliated institution approved by us, and that can happen in Mexico, that can happen in the United States. Next, please. After the successful completion of the internado, pre-internship as we spoke, and passing USMLE step one and two, they get the degree of physician, medico cirujano. With that, they get the certification of ECFMG, and with the ECFMG certification, they go into grad education and obtain the licensure later on. Now, there is uh, three factors that contribute to the development of this pre-internship. First, the recognition of special needs of U.S. citizens for clinical experience in an environment similar to that in which they would be practicing. The desire for a program that would offer qualified students U.S. clinical ex exposure and the need for direct working relationships between hospitals, schools, and UAG to assure adequate controls for monitoring the quality of education received by students in the pre-internship. The fifth year students who train at UAG School of Medicine who were fully immersed in the Hispanic environment in Mexico who also became bicultural and bilingual and who can provide care to the Hispanic and other underserved populations at U.S. health system. And I think this is important to understand. When our graduates finish, they understand the culture and they're bilingual. So for them it's very much easier just to go into the Hispanic community and if someone goes and says, I had, I had some pozole, tengo retortijones, and he, me duele mucho la panza, <laughs> so most of the people say, wait, well, what is this guy saying? <laughs> but if you live in that environment, you certainly understand what's going on with your patients. Yeah, I'm providing guidelines 
okay, for the implementation of this, pro of this uh, program. I have them with me and I'll turn them in to uh, whoever needs them. And we also have the syllabus of the following rotations that we consider the ones more important for the purposes of our, of our uh, presentation. The, uh, the objectives is to provide printers great exposure to as direct bedside teaching in selective facilities, offer printers an opportunity to begin integration into medicine in a U.S. during undergraduate training, allow medical students an opportunity to enter graduate education with greater U.S. clinical experience, promote the exchange of ideas between U.S. and Mexican academicians, resulting in greater understanding and in the implement and the implement of a quality of medical education facilities and training programs in both countries. Within the, uh, the, the papers that I have, I have the responsibilities of, in the administration process of the director of the off-campus programs of Guadalajara and the consultants. Obviously, that's, that's a lot of information not necessary at this point. And the responsibilities that the university has, the teaching hospital has, the pre-interns and the clinical coordinators. So I was thinking of presenting the whole thing, but I think it's, it's, it's too much information at this moment. So I just uh, leave a few seconds or a few uh, minutes so you can see the responsibilities the university will have. If you put the next one, the responsibilities that the, the teaching hospital will have. Okay, obviously it's uh, in a process of supervision similar to a first year resident in general terms. As here, this one is the director of medical education responsible for providing com competent supervision of the printer in their clinical duties equivalent to the supervision given to a first year resident intern, as I was mentioning. The printers have a lot of responsibilities, obviously, working with ethics and everything that has been given to him during their formation at Guadalajara. But what is very important is to find out that the primary emphasis of the School of Medicine is on primary care. Okay, so we're working on that and that's one of our most important issues within this presentation. And we will see all the different uh, things that a, a printer has to learn and make during his pres presence in teaching hospitals here in the United States, in specific in the area of California. Continue. Something that we are very much concerned from the beginning of the uh, training of our uh, physicians is uh, demonstrate respect, compassion, and integrity. And uh, we uh, emphasize very much to our students to have the, uh, the approach that Hispanics like. People in Mexico, most Hispanics, like to be treated in a warm way. They like to be patted in their shoulder and be held and and, and, and taking care as a person, not unfortunately as happened in many places here in your country as a number. So that's something extra that our graduates will bring into the state of California. Our academic guidelines for the uh, fifth year pre-internship are uh, under this uh, number of weeks. Internal medicine will take eight weeks, pediatrics eight weeks, surgery eight weeks, obstetric and gynecology another eight weeks, psychiatric four, family medicine four, emergency medicine four, and elective four. Within our academic program, we have uh, integrated most of the requirements that uh, the state of California has implemented for uh, the schools of medicine in, in, in the state. That's uh, as an example, uh, the uh, care of pain, or management of pain, or uh, palliative medicine, all of those concepts that are required by the state to the medical schools in California is already embedded in, the, uh, in our curriculum. So this is for the internship program. We have a final evaluation, and that's uh, very important for us to go into the clinical knowledge and skills of, of our uh, uh, pre-interns within the system. 
with the uh, clinical knowledge and skills. We continue with that. Learning skills, you have to self-direct the learning, personal growth, practice-based practice, practice -based learning. And uh, standards for professional conduct and responsibility, okay? Going in from patient care, reliability, honesty, integrity, and, and all of those important issues that has to be evaluated within the process. We, of course, have all these forms in order to, uh, to have the, uh, the responsible of evaluating our students. They have to fill up the forms. They have to be signed by not only the, uh, the responsible of that student, but also by the department head and obviously from the director of medical education in order to grant the grade that will make them be uh, finishing and we will grant by passing the two exams the degree of medical doctor in Mexico. All this process has been presented to ECFMG, and in 2009, May 29, 2009, uh, James Hallock uh, sent a letter to all the boards mentioning that this program was accepted in the way that we presented for, to them. The outcomes, I can tell you from uh, the last year, the residency match in 2010, these are the places where our, our students are located at this time, from uh, Louisiana, uh, New York, Puerto Rico, some California, Texas. So just continue, that's, that's on pediatrics. Next, that's in family practice. So, so you can have an idea where, where they are. As you can see, most of them go into primary care. The next, next, journal medicine. You can see the different states where they are located. And that's uh, when, when Shelton went to Guadalajara, we took a picture of good memories. <laughs> so I don't know if you have any questions. I will be more than happy to try to answer. There, let me uh, uh, ask that uh, Dr. Gaziola join us. But just a second. Oh, just a second. And, and Dr. Della Pena, because I want to show a relationship. Uh, Dr. Gassioli, as I mentioned earlier, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is an individual with whom I have high regards and with whom I work at the UC Davis Health System, and he's also a graduate of this university. So I just wanted to invite him to say a few words anyway. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the kind invitation and for the opportunity to uh, uh, present to you what we're hoping will become this uh, agreement as Dr. DeRusso mentioned and uh, I'm going to be very brief uh, just to let you know that uh, 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 there are uh, some very prominent uh, members of our community uh, medical community here in California uh, who are graduates uh, of uh, the Autonoma uh, University, University Autónoma de Guadalajara, and uh, one of them, you, you will hear uh, some comments, uh, is Dr. William de la Peña, uh, which is one of our board regents, uh, but also, you know, some uh, uh, important members uh, close, closer to you is uh, Dr. del Junco, for example, who was the board president. And uh, I was uh, reminded by Dr. Leon that also his father, you know, years prior, was also a graduate from Autonoma uh, uh, de Guadalajara, and, and also he was, uh, you understand, uh, board president. So there are some, uh, you know, notable uh, uh, individuals who are actively uh, participating in, 
in uh, uh, the life, you know, of providing medical services, safe and accessible service to the population of California. Let, the last comment that I want to make is uh, that there is an impression that uh, the medical students or, or the, the, the U.S. Uh, students who go and, and uh, train abroad, uh, like in La Autonoma de Guadalajara, that these are students who didn't make it here at uh, uh, U.S. universities. And uh, I would like to share my own perspective about that, uh, because now that I'm a, a faculty member at uh, UC Davis, and in some ways I have been related to the uh, uh, academic admissions, uh, doing, uh, you know, from uh, being chair of uh, some of the groups that uh, end up uh, accepting the students. Just uh, to put things in perspective, we have about uh, 108 uh, uh, year uh, annual positions for medical students. And at UC Davis this past year, there were uh, 5,700 uh, applications. And there could have been accepted, you know, I don't know, uh, 1,000, 800. These are top students. And when you uh, put that in perspective, that the, there are only a little over 100, there are many who are highly, highly qualified that uh, are looking for places to, uh, to, 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 to really uh, follow their dreams and uh, who end up very, uh, being very, very highly qualified. I just wanted to make those comments and, and I do thank you again for your kind uh, attention and for uh, this kind invitation to Dr. Leon. And we uh, did a little research in terms of uh, the graduates, uh, the physicians that are graduates of this university that are practicing medicine in California, and it equals to about uh, nearly a thousand uh, currently that are practicing medicine throughout the state of California. And I would like to give uh, Dr. Della Pena uh, at least an opportunity to comment, if he would. And he's on uh, uh, the speakerphone.
Uh, thank you uh, very much for joining our conversation. Uh, Dr. Dusso, do you have any final comments? The, I'd just like to say I, um, it was just a tremendous uh, presentation. And for one, and I think my board, the board members will reflect it, it's, uh, it's very useful information and, um, and it was well done. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. Right. If I may, um, there isn't any required action of the board. Individuals who come into this program in the collaborative effort between the two medical schools will still be considered international graduates. They'll get their degree from uh, the medical school in Guadalajara, but they will then apply for PTALs here. We just have some individuals who will have done a year of training in the Sacramento area and hopefully will then proceed to get their postgraduate training in that area if the University at Davis does receive additional slots for that training and then hopefully they will stay in California to continue their uh, practice in the underserved areas in again the family practice area. So I want to thank our guests very much for coming. Um, what I'm hoping that the board is uh, cognizant of is that we went from the understanding of what was the process to become uh, recognized to the process of what we see with a, not only parity, but what I'm understanding is over and above what the requirements are for our California students. I want to thank you very much on behalf of the board for coming to California thank and making this presentation to us so that we realize the uh, level of expectation as well as the level of um, academic achievement at the Autonomous University of Guadalajara is. And I want to thank Dr. Giselle for bringing us forward and would look forward to um, updates as yes. this goes forward. Now, if anyone has any questions of the uh, presenters? Bye -bye. Yes, Dr. Carrion. Uh, let me share my, my personal experience working with Dr. from, from the Autonoma. For the last 30 years that I work in, in Los Angeles, in a Latino population, the, the help of these doctors has been tremendous and the quality has been very good. I support this program very highly. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kent, you had a question, uh, comment? No, just I really wanted to uh, say that I appreciate the presentation and when you talked about health reform, um, you know, in California we have uh, millions of people that are uninsured, a lot of whom are undocumented, and health reform isn't necessarily going to address those needs, but I think in general as someone who spends a lot of her time thinking about larger delivery issues, mm -hmm. um, physicians are the, the building blocks for all the yeah. other health systems, and so if you don't have enough quality physicians, you can't have hospitals, you can't have mm -hmm. managed care, you can't have clinics, you can't have any of these things. And therefore so, you can't have access. Exactly. So I just want to say that I think it's good that you put a lot of time into working with collaborative um, agreements across both within the state and the outside because it's going to be a problem that's going to be very evident soon. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Any other comments or questions? Oh, Thank I, you. Oh, sorry, Dr. Diego. I just wanted to ask, um, it sounds like there would be this pre-internship program would uh, afford students uh, at UC Davis. Is it going to create, do you have an idea of how many seats you're looking at? Is it six students, eight students? We're, we have been talking so far around eight students. Any other questions? Thank you again very much for your presentation. We look thank forward you. to uh, constant updates, Doctor. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, move to agenda item number 24, uh, which is. Oh, I apologize. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You can stay. You you can I'll welcome sign to stay up. And, uh, <laughs> and listen to our meeting. I'm sure it uh, will be less contentious than your meetings that you uh, are involved in. <laughs> <laughs> you remember where he's from, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're still moving on number 24. Um, Mr. Wharton and Mr. Hepler, on the consideration of the proposed changes to Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations, Section 1378.1, the polysomnographic program. Thank you, Madam President, members. <coughs> members, this is sort of uh, an issue that you have seen, seen before a couple different times. These are the regulations that seek to implement the recently enacted legislation requiring licensure or actually registration of polys polysomnographic technicians, trainees, and technologists. As you recall, um, the board had considered an initial set of regulations um, and those regulations went out for a 15-day notice to take care of, of a few um, technically, technical oversights. We then, subsequent to, we received some comments during that 15-day period that were quite broad in scope. As you can see on pages 150 and following, those comments came to the board after Mr. Warren and myself, Ms. Curry, met with proponents of the regulations. And one of the issues that had come forth was there's basically, as I mentioned, three levels of registration, one being the technologist, the top level, the middle being the technician, the bottom level being the trainee. There was, the legislation calls for essentially one of the ways that you can become a technologist is to either take the national certification exam or in fact demonstrate to the board that you've been practicing in the poly in the you've been practicing polysomnography safely for at least five years that was that was the the grandfather clause to get out of the examination requirement upon meeting with the interested parties it came very palpably evident that they didn't view the grandfather clause is in exactly the same way we did. They seem to think, suggest that the grandfather clause would enable a, a person practicing some non, polysomnography safely could get a registration with essentially on that basis. They have practiced polysomnography safely for five years. They had asked um, Mr. Warden, Ms. Curry, and myself you know, to comment on that, and quite kindly, we said, we really can't embrace putting that type of regulatory language uh, in place because, or even recommending it to this board. Number one, there's obviously, as Mr. Warren will talk about, perhaps a policy consideration there, but from a legal perspective, not to bore everybody to death, but the purpose of a regulation is to implement, make specific, or interpret statute. And a, stat and a regulation that purports to expand or impair the scope of a statute is void. There's really no statutory underpinnings to do uh, what they seek. That is to create a whole new class of grandfather clause. When we brought that to their attention, they then suggested, as you'll see again on page 115 and following, as I spoke of three essential core licensing categories, technologists, technicians, and trainees, they responded that a way around this legal interpretation statutory constriction problem was to create essentially five classes of five classes of, of technicians or five I'm sorry five classes of registration 
technology tech trainees and technologists of the, either end of the scale and five and I'm sorry three levels of technicians each being a little bit able to do a little bit more a little bit less and quite candidly sort of blurring the gaps or just or the classifications between um, the three levels sort of prescribed in the bill so for that reason um, we are suggesting that essentially we consider kind of a half a loaf approach. Interested parties did come to us with a very valid and correct suggestion that we amend our regulations to recognize that uh, an educational program designated by the Board of Registered Polysomnographic Graphic Technicians, easy for me not to say, or BRPT, would in fact meet the minimum requirements to be credentialed uh, to become registered as a technologist and also to address if you look on page 138 subdivision 4 uh, an errant oversight a technical amendment correcting error Mr. Warden can talk about the policy implications of essentially going forward with what interested parties propose but on a legal basis as far as expanding the grandfather clause it would be re my recommendation to this board that such uh, an attempt to incorporate that by regulations is not well grounded in case law or in statute. So uh, with that, I would recommend that um, the board move ahead with a 15-day I'm, I'm just legal counsel. It seems logical to move ahead with a, with a new 15-day order incorporating the change in the accredited program and also the um, errant reference in subdivision 4. But Mr. Warden, perhaps you want to talk about the policy concept? Um, to, to expand the technician level to three levels causes um, several uh, problems that I can see for consumers in that they will not know what level technician is capable of practicing and it will be very hard for them to know um, what the levels are. It also is uh, um, when you start having five licenses and three of them are almost identical and at the top level of the one technician, you're starting to have supervised, which is actually the technologist's position. I, I think that's also a concern. Um, so that for, I think that the original three classifications is better for public protection and for us as for licensing and for um, being able to, to uh, enforce the requirements of those laws. So uh, that's my personal um, e evaluation of of this program is when you start mixing the one classification into little bits and pieces it really makes it difficult. So um, I would um, assume that we need to have a motion, correct? Correct. So I the motion would, would be in the, I'm sorry. Oh, no. please, are you going to uh, The motion would be in the form of we would essentially we we would go out for another 15 days with this amended language. Uh, circulate that for 15 days in the absence of any adverse public comment and then direct staff to prepare the rulemaking file and transmit it to OAL. And if there are authorize the executive officer to adopt the regulations at the expiration of that comment period if there are right. no adverse comments. I'm, thank you, Mr. Chair. I forgot about this. this is, okay, so we yeah. have a motion on the floor. We don't have a motion on the floor. I, I move. I'm second. confused. I've got wait, 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 Dr. Summonson. Dr. Summonson, one second. I need a second in order to have discussion on the motion. I'll please. second it for Thank discussion. You. Now, Dr. Summonson, you're on. Well, I guess I just want a clarification of what the recommendation is. I got a different impression from Mr. Hepler and Mr. Warden. We want the five categories or we want the three? No, I'm, I'm, Dr. Solomon, probably my confusion. We would essentially, we are, our motion would tell the board not to consider the proposed change that would embrace the five levels and leave us with essentially the three core levels. Okay, if that's verified on page 139, the first um, paragraph is letting you know that. So we have a motion on the table. It's been made and seconded. Do I have any public comment on the motion? Do I have any questions, other additional questions from the board? So all those in favor of the motion that's on the table to approve language and then move on. Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so done. Okay, so we're, thank you very much. Well, that was awkward. Okay. 
So we're now going to move on to uh, Ms. Ehrlich's report. Would you come forward, please, make your midwifery uh, advisory council update? Good afternoon. Um, the most recent meeting of the Midwifery Advisory Council took place on December 9th in Sacramento, and the next one will be on April 7th. We continue to work on the licensed, licensed midwife annual report on the form and on the whole process. Um, I would like to express to the board, it is certainly my personal belief, this is not something that we have decided on the council, although we have talked about it. It is my personal belief that the form that we are using and the whole process that we are using has many flaws. Uh, I do not think that we are going to get high quality information from this report ever. I believe that in order to get the kind of high quality information that we need, we have to move to some kind of a system that incorporates prospective reporting that is validated. It also, Dr. Haskins, who is on the council with us, has said that she would like to see that the report that we can present can then be compared to other states to see how the licensed midwives here are doing in comparison to others throughout the US. I think all of that can be had if we sign on to the Midwives Alliance of North America Statistics Project as um, a way in to get all of those factors met. This is a program that has been in place for quite some years. They already have something like 24,000 courses of care in their database. So a comparison is absolutely going to be available to us if we use this. It is a prospective reporting. All clients, all patients are registered when they first enter into care with the midwife. And they all must be followed up. If any thing is strange, if anything seems unusual, the midwife is contacted by the staff of the Manistats so that everything is validated and everything is cleared. And these are issues that we have had with the reporting that we have here in California now. Um, we are moving into the fourth year of reporting. Midwives will be required to um, report by March 30th, 30th, I believe it is. And as far as I know, the um, report form, the questionnaire is going up on the website any day if it is not there yet. Um, so we are looking at yet another year where we are having a retrospective rep reporting um, on a questionnaire that quite honestly, we, I do not think that we can fix it. I don't think that it is fixable in the form that we have it now. Um, it, the whole process of developing this was done with great intention and incredibly hard work. And I honor the work of all of us on the, board, on the Midwifery Council, of OSHPED, everybody who has put into this. We've really tried hard. I just don't think we can pull it off. I don't think we have the expertise and I don't think we have the format. So I would like the board to recognize that and um, perhaps work with us to move forward if indeed it seems on the council that we should go ahead with trying to sign up with MANA stats. Another of the issues that we are looking at a lot is the barriers to care that licensed midwives have in the state of California. Um, we have talked about that with you folks before and I'm sure we'll be talking about it, you with it as we go along. There have been a couple of positive developments in that that I want to let you know about. Jennifer Simoes is working with us on trying to identify those, uh, how to work through these barriers. She has been in touch with uh, the Department of Public Health, and it seems that all licensed healthcare providers in the state of California may have lab accounts on their own authority. So that the labs have been denying licensed midwives the ability to have their own lab accounts is not within the terms of the law. So we are hoping that that is going to be fixed really soon. I would like um, the authority of the medical board, perhaps through the legal department of the medical board and of the Department of Public Health, to work together to get a letter out to the laboratories in the state who received a letter from Department of Public Health some years ago saying that midwives may not have these accounts to refute that and to change it so that we can move forward and get one of these barriers to care fixed. Um, it also seems that the issue of Comprehensive Perinatal Services Program, CPSP, uh, which is a, an enri enrichment program for obstetrical patients in the state of California who are low income so that they can have not just 
obstetrical care, but they can also have nutrition, social services, and perinatal education services, in, um, which is all based, all of these are based in the midwifery model of care, um, that there might be recourse to be able to get midwives authorized as providers of care under CPSB. I would like the medical board to work with us to perhaps peti petition for a change in regulations so that we can be authorized as providers of CPSB services. However, the barriers to care in general, I think, are getting worse in the state. There seems to be an enormous amount of hostility toward the licensed midwives in California. Um, I want you to recognize that this is penalizing the pregnant women and their families way more than it is penalizing the midwives. There are some midwives who are even afraid to sign birth certificates in the state. I have just found that out in the last couple of weeks because they're afraid that if they sign the birth certificates that the medical board is going to come after them for their licenses because they don't have physician supervision, which everybody knows is simply not available. But we also cannot access a lot of the tools of the trade that we need in order to make us safer. It is adding artificial and unnecessary risk to the practice of midwifery in the state of California that we cannot get these tools of the trade. I just heard a story last week from a midwife in Southern California who went with her own personal oxygen tank to get it refilled at an oxygen supply house. The person who met her at the desk there was really angry with her for owning her own personal oxygen tank. She said it was illegal for her to, uh, to have one. It was illegal for them to fill it because she did not have a physician's signature on, uh, on report. And the person at this oxygen supply house confiscated her oxygen tank. This is the kind of stuff that we have coming up all the time in the state of California. There is tremendous hostility. I know that the mission of the California Medical Board is to protect the public. With all the licensed midwives in California and throughout the U.S. have some very strong differences of philosophy and of the reading of science that differ from the obstetrical model. It is also the mission of the midwives in the state of California to protect the public. We are certainly, we can share that mission and I hope that we can work more and more together as the Midwifery Advisory Council continues to grow so that we can be on the same side. It does not work for the families in the state of California for us to be at odds with each other and for the midwives to feel that they have enemies in their supervising agency. And that is how the midwives are feeling. These barriers to care prevent us from taking the best possible care of the women in our care. Licensed midwifery was entrusted in 1993 by the legislature to the medical board to supervise. It was certainly the intent and the will of the legislature that California families who desire out-of-hospital births have access to competent licensed midwives to safeguard them. I urge the medical board to work with licensed midwives to remove the barriers to care that stand in the way of the needs of families the intent of the legislature and public safety. Please help us carry out our shared mission, protecting the well-being of the child-bearing population of California. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for your report. Um, and you are currently working with Ms. Samos to deal with the barriers to care. Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. Is there anything else that you need from us now? Um, I would perhaps the intent of the medical board for a letter such as I suggested from the legal department to the laboratories in the state and perhaps some movement from the medical board that we ask for a change in regulations so that the comprehensive perinatal services program will add licensed midwives to the list of providers. So that would have to be on the next board meeting's agenda and in uh, absence of that you're more than welcome to speak with legal counsel about the Department of Public Health. All right. It'll be there at the April meeting. Very good. Right. Okay. Madam Chair, you, any questions? Yes, I, yes? I was going to request if we could, um, on our own board uh, agenda next time, have these issues. I've been on this board since 2007, and they have come before us every single meeting, particularly about the data collection. And I think that that's probably, right now, besides the lab and, and, and access, um, it's probably the most serious situation because, unfortunately, that data is going to be used um, 
to indicate a variety of things that perhaps the way it's being collected now is going to have kind of an adverse reaction. So you should it, know that this is go goes on in every one of the midwifery every advisory one. council <laughs> meetings as well. Absolutely. So, so we can get it on the board, but since since the legislature has asked this board to. Um, I don't want to say oversee, but obviously put, they put license midwifery under the medical board. If we could get that on our agenda, so because uh, I'd like to see the data and also the alliance data that she's talking about, the collection form, to see you know what needs to be done so that we don't penalize licensed midwives in California because of the data. And part collection. of that is prescribed in law, so Correct. we need yeah. to make those determinations through the midwifery council right. on what they need changed in law that will get us to where the appropriate information will be collected. And part of that is there, there is some disagreement, plus we've been evolving in the form, so we're not quite there yet, but it has been over time a problem because again the evolution and we're now at a point I think with the evolution that we can analyze what is being collected, what is needed, what needs to be revised that may come about with legislation for next year. No, and recognizing with your that, recommendation. My, yeah, yeah. my concern is that we hear this report repeatedly and we kind of go, uh-huh. And so it would be helpful if, if we had it as an agendized item. Yes. So what you're looking for is a report from uh, for the agenda, is what you're looking for is a report on the documentation that's been necessary and what and the, the request for the, the request for the letter to the laboratories and also the um, provision that they could the participate change as well. in the comprehensive right. perinatal okay, services program. Right. We will do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Earl. Yes. Oh, did you want to speak, Mr. Cuny? You need to fill out a form. You know that, but we'll get you one. My name is Frank Cooney, and I'm the Executive Director of California Citizens for Health Freedom, and I've followed this issue for many years. And the formation of the Midwife Council was by the action of your board, actually in introducing the legislature to have it formed. And the big thing that needs at some point in the future to be done is the sponsorship of a bill that will resolve the physician supervision issue no physician in California will, can agree under the insurance agreements and others that they can supervise. Uh, they lose their hospital privileges and they lose their insurance policies if they agree to supervise. And the midwives are required by law to have physician supervision and that's the thing that's going to have to be changed at some point in the future and I think the only body that can do that is sponsorship of a bill by the medical board itself to resolve that problem. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move on the agenda to uh, number 28. The proposed changes to Title 16 of the California Code of the Regulation Section 1361 and the Manual of Disciplinary Guidelines and Model Disciplinary Orders. Ms. Katie, and, uh, are you going to present on this? And Ms. Curry? Thank you. Uh, at the November board meeting, a hearing was held to discuss the proposed amendments to the board's model disciplinary guidelines. At the end of the hearing, it was suggested that any action on the rulemaking should be tabled until the January meeting so that staff could, could review the comments that were provided. On January 6th, no, wrong one. On January 6th, an interested parties meeting was held in Sacramento. Prior to the meeting, public comments were received and are included in your package under item 28, beginning with page 166. After receiving testimony and public comment, modifications were made to the text were made and the period for public comment um, on the modifications uh, was held and closed on January 25th. We did receive a comment from the California Medical Association, which has been provided in your package. Mm. Um, we ask that the board consider the proposed revisions to the model disciplinary guidelines. Yes. So we need a motion to accept the... Um, adopt the so we're going to adopt the regulations as modified. Do I have a maker of the motion? So moved. 
Second? Second. Okay, everyone's had a chance to review this. Is there, is there any public comment on this? <clears throat> is there any comment or questions from the board? Oh, sorry, we have public comment. It's Kimberly Kirchmeyer, Department of Consumer Affairs. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Microphone, please. Good afternoon. Oh, hopefully it's there. Okay. I'm Kimberly Kirkmeyer with the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, I just wanted to thank the board, first of all, for making the changes that they made to make the um, immediate cease practice on the items that were pointed out, I believe, at the last meeting. Um, again, there was a statement in here about the um, uniform standards not being finalized. I did just want to let you know that those um, were voted at a meeting, and that deals with the 104, um, that those were voted at a meeting, and those have been approved in that. Um, I know that there's a statement in there that there was a subcommittee that is being discussed, and that is true. There was a subcommittee meeting that was set up. Um, it has been, um, it was canceled at that time due to a notification issue. Um, but again, those standards are, as they have been implemented right now, those standards do stand as being the final standards for the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, and one thing I just wanted to bring to your attention, and it, it's a little bit, uh, I, was, I was speaking with uh, legal counsel, it's a little bit beyond this 15-day notice, but again, we would just request that there are other issues in the SB 1441 uniform standards that do need to be implemented by regulation, so we would just again ask that the board move forward with the other items that aren't in this um, language that you have before you, that, but that are in the uniform standards, such as the major, major and minor violations things like that. So again, we would just request that you do move those forward um, in the future as soon as possible. Thank you. I have remarks from uh, Julie D'Angelo of Health as well. Good afternoon. I'm Julie D'Angelo Felmuth from the Center for Public Interest Law, and I'm the former Medical Board Enforcement Monitor. I just wanted to very quickly express my appreciation for the fact that two of the three suggestions that CPIL made have been amended into these um, uh, disciplinary guidelines, including modifications to conditions of probation 9, 10, and 11 to require an immediate cease practice upon notice of a confirmed positive test. Just as a reminder, you're dealing with a physician here who has been put on probation. This is a person who um, has received full procedural due process, and you have been sufficiently concerned about a substance abuse problem to put this person on probation on, with terms of abstinence and testing. And when a confirmed positive drug test occurs, this person should be immediately removed from practice to protect patients. So I appreciate the fact that um, that change has been made. Thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you. Do you have any comments or questions from the um, board members? Uh, Ms. Whitney, do you want to? Um, I'd like to respond to the um, comments made by the Department of Consumer Affairs. As a member of the committee, I did sit in the um, voting when that took place regarding the 104 tests. And although a number of the board representatives did vote for that, I did not in terms of knowing that there was not evidence-based uh, information related to that many tests being needed for anyone uh, in uh, the getting biological testing. In addition, at that same meeting, a number of the board executive officers did raise some concerns about that number, thus uh, as part of that decision making said that they would uh, re-meet, revisit that and looked at the ev evidence based information related to how many tests were really needed uh, that would be really a random testing. Was it four per month or was it eight per month? And that then committee never did meet even though they were scheduled to meet that was canceled and it's been over a year. So there are many of us executive officers who have discussed this issue and uh, have not moved forward to our boards with the 104 tests because there is no subsequent meeting to have that discussion with evidence-based information presented by the healthcare community. And so that's why it's not forward in your packet today. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a motion to adopt the regulations as modified. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. So I'd, I'd like to ask Ms. Threadgill to come forward, please. Make a report. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Regarding agenda item 29A, may I have a motion to approve 10 orders to restore licenses following completion of probation? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, oh, discussion on it? You want to? Oh, no, sorry. I'm just saying. Discussion on the motion to approve? <clears throat> Public comment on the approval? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Agenda item 29B on page 180 reflects the use of 556 experts to review. 732 cases by specialty during the past calendar year. Please note that the number of experts in our database has also increased from 1,207 to 1,289 since last quarter. Um, that is more than 80 um, new applicants to the reviewer program. Uh, during the, uh, an update regarding it are the expert reviewer training program that we're working on in the enforcement committee was provided during the enforcement committee meeting yesterday by Deputy Chief Laura Sweet. And we anticipate that the first presentation to be held at UCB sometime this fall. Oh, initially, we hope to have this training offered in the spring. However, the inability to replace staff has required remaining staff to take on duties of those vacant positions, which has caused a shift in uh, uh, priorities. Slight shift. Um, the enforcement program currently has a vacancy rate of approximately 19% for supervisors, managers, and 5% for investigator positions, and overall that would be an 8%. Is that going to become a public safety issue soon? I would like to think you're going to have some kind What was that percentage again? I wasn't quite sure. 19% vacancy rate, I heard? 19% uh, for the supervision. Uh -huh. Just make sure everyone heard that. Well, that goes in the letter that we're asking you to yeah, write. She's very soft-spoken, so sometimes that's I have to uh, push oh. her. Well, I'm, I'm not always soft-spoken, but... <laughs> I have never seen you raise your voice, ever. Okay, and I, I hope you'll never see it. Um, normally, we recruit and hire from an open list to fill the investigator positions and a promotional list to fill the supervisory positions. Currently, as a result of the hiring freeze, we are only permitted to hire via transfers from within the department, and we, are, we have not been allowed to promote. Despite this, we have advertised the vacancies, conducted interviews, identified candidates for, for promotion. Should there be a miracle and the freeze uh, be lifted? This is January. You've got to wait a while. It's when the Cubbies win the World Series. Please see, you're killing me. <laughs> um, uh, as to our age case council, we continue to utilize the age case council to move cases that appear to be stuck. Our case age average continues to decrease since we started this program, and we are currently averaging around 312 days. This is quite impressive considering the investigators are still furloughed. Um, oops, I didn't, I, they're still taking days off, three, three days a month and um, are unable to, and we're unable to fill existing vacancies. Um, I witnessed um, bribery during the last se session at the Age Case Council 
when the deputy chief, at her wit's end, started um, offering uh, investigators gift cards, Starbucks, Jamba Juice, uh, just to meet targets, um, and it was working. <laughs> um, statewide investigator yeah. training will work for juice. <laughs> we work. Coffee in some cases. Statewide investigator training cough conference has been rescheduled to uh, April 12th through 15th. Um, I will reconfirm with board members who, were previ who previously indicated that they would uh, be available to participate. However, you are all welcome to attend and I will provide you with a copy of the uh, schedule as soon as it's finalized. Um, the enforcement supervisors and managers attended training and statewide meeting uh, January 19th and 20th. We were briefed on the status and um, distinction of the various bargaining unit contracts and I would like to thank the labor relations experts from DCA for accommodating our schedule. Thanks Mark and Saeed. Oh, I would like to comment on our OSM program and give you an update. I think it's important that I give a little bit more detail about what's been happening with this program now um, given that we're getting close to July, we're moving along. Since the re-inception of Operation uh, Safe Medicine, our licensed practice unit, 34 cases have been submitted to the district attorney or city attorney for criminal prosecution. 21 of those cases have been filed and eight thus far have resulted in convictions. Ten, um, Ten cases are pending and only two have been rejected. Of those 34 cases that have been referred since July 1, 2010, uh, OSM um, has um, the highest percentage I've seen uh, coming out of there for criminal referral, referrals in that amount of time. Um, the volume and seriousness of the cases thus far investigated and submitted for prosecution underscore the importance of a unit dedicated solely to the issue of unlicensed practice. Um, I would like to um, share three examples of the kinds of cases that they have put through. Um, one was a um, unlicensed um, practitioner posing as a midwife who was delivering babies with serious um, harm being incurred by the mother and there are felony charges pending against um, that individual now. Uh, another case, the subject is alleged to have forged documents and stole the identity of a physician assistant and practiced medicine and endangered the patients uh, he treated and their felonies pending. Um, in, in another two cases, we had unlicensed uh, practice of medicine resulting in burns to the patient from a cosmetic procedure and there are felonies pending on that. I could go on, I have a list, but I won't um, take up much more time on that. Um, as the work, um, several, um, as the work already completed uh, demonstrates the existence of this unit is imperative in order to protect the public from actions of unlicensed um, practitioners. Um, moving on to the next agenda item, I would like to give you an update on Senate Bill 700, Negretti McLeod. Um, this uh, Senate bill required the Medical Board to create a new reporting form pursuant to 805.01 of the California Business and Professional Code and to post an 805 fact sheet on our website. Uh, if you'll look at page 186 in your packet, um, you'll see a copy of the form that was created. 
and uh, the fact sheet that was developed and posted is shown on page 187. This new law requires hospitals to inform the medical board of a formal investigation within 15 days. And that's important because it, that is of the, it, when they begin the formal investigation 15 days after, now they have to notify us. And it allows the medical board to access um, relevant um, documents upon the notification versus having to wait until the disciplinary hearing has been held, which is a big, uh, um, a, going to be a great tool for us in those cases. Um, that completes my um, report, enforcement report. Do we have any questions on this report so far? Ms. Redgill, let me ask you a question, please. On this new reporting uh, form, is, this, is your office notifying hospitals that this is, how do they know that this has to be done? This, um, this has just been developed. Um, part of the implementation plan will include um, an article in our newsletter to Okay, my concern is, is that entities, um, public or private entities, should be informed of it directly, and I just want to make sure that somehow they will be. So that if the requirement is to report, that we need to make sure that those that are going to be possibly reporting know that in fact they should be reporting. I will say that I've been contacted by entities already in advance of the law even taking effect asking whether or not there would be a new form coming out and where they could find it. So you might want to consider working with the Department of Public Health, the Hospital Council of Southern Northern and Southern California, the counties, Association of Counties and uh, County Governments. I just want to make sure that everyone is at the table and knows about this, that's all. And Madam Chair, I was going to say you could have Department of Public Health do an all facility letter because it's not just hospitals. Right. <laughs> that would be great, thank you. So thank you for your report. Thank you. So moving on, if there's no other questions, let's move on and have uh, Mr. Ramirez please come forward and join Ms. Threadgill, please, and we'll go on to agenda item number 30, Brooklyn Enforcement Report. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Chairman Carlos Ramirez, Office of the Attorney General. Um, I'm here to report that um, we have uh, hired two additional supervising deputy attorney generals in the Los Angeles office, bringing a total number of supervisors to three, uh, which is hired the, the last one recently. Um, he uh, actually took the position effective um, January 21st. Um, we, as a result of the uh, two people that were promoted, two deputies that were promoted to the position of uh, supervisors. We have two vacancies that we have been per given permission to advertise. So we'll be advertising for two vacancies in the Los Angeles office. Um, as I indicated at the last board meeting, we have revised a section of the uh, vertical prosecution manual that redefines the role of the lead prosecutor in the program and this was particularly done to uh, eliminate as much as possible the need for deputies in the, in the Los Angeles area to travel back and forth to the uh, district offices and thereby eliminating time that they spend on the road, reducing the cost of the program. Yeah. And that, those changes will be implemented effective uh, February 1st uh, of uh, this year, of course. Uh, we have also completed work on the protocols for processing default decisions for medical board cases. We have sent them to uh, DCA Council. They provided some input. We will incorporate that input if appropriate. Um, we're in the process of also compiling statistics for calendar year 2000, not 2010, and those statistics will be provided to you at the next board meeting. If there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. Do we, uh, Mr. Zerani, don't you have a question? Uh, I, well, I have a couple of comments. Uh, I'm going to Sorry. refrain from mm -hmm. asking questions because I want to give 
uh, Carlos and Renee, the, the opportunity to uh, meet with, uh, I think we I made the point. You. Oops, sorry. Um, my apologies. Uh, I, I'm going to refrain asking from questions until next time because there are a few things that I think Renee, Carlos, are working on and, and we have collectively with the executive director as well as um, um, Janet Thompson, I think, uh, was involved at one point as well in looking at some of the frank recommendations and attempting uh, with, Madam President, I think your uh, um, uh, permission as well, uh, to look at some of those and, and to uh, make sure that we talk both to the AG's office and our own house uh, to see how we can make a difference in the vertical prosecution process. Uh, therefore, um, uh, other than saying I thank Carlos uh, and Rene uh, for um, uh, talking with us and continue to make uh, their offices available to progress and uh, to uh, uh, some of the things that we need to accomplish. And I think I made uh, the comment during one of our uh, subcommittee meetings to Renee, and I just wanted to make it abundantly clear that what I meant is um, that uh, we need a detailed, if you will, timeline of our A to Z operations. And I had this discussion with our executive director, and I will discuss this with you as well offline, to see to it that we bring back to the board next time um, how that operates, where the potential roadblocks, if any, or potential time losses are so that we can make this process more efficient because as I'm looking at the time frames, uh, they are not improving as they should be improving. Uh, and hopefully with some of the changes, uh, with a new administration coming into the Attorney General's office, with a newer type of service perhaps that can be fashioned in the representation of the medical board for the Attorney General's office and we will be able to achieve some changes here. So I'm looking forward to continuing the dialogue and bringing all this back to the board next time. Thank you. Dr. Salmonson? Well, this, so we're comparing apples to apples. If we have that added 60 days to get the medical expert, somehow those cases need to be tagged so that neither department gets ding for the 60 days to get the medical expert contract. Because I just can see that as an added variable. Well, what I didn't say earlier is that uh, Renee and I both have an appointment to discuss this with DCA staff in April. We asked to be at the tail end so we could actually work on some other efforts that we have going on right now and also to see if there might be legislation moving through that might enable us to be kind of exempted from this at the end of the uh, fiscal year or something like that. But uh, we've, we've stretched it out so we could um, keep our work going and hopefully fill positions so we'd have some more time to address it personally. I would, I would just like to clarify uh, something uh, that I didn't mention. Um, we are currently working on the VE manual. It has not been revised. Um, the, we have a team assembled. They've met um, and they've begun work on it. And they are scheduled to meet again next month and to continue um, streamlining that manual. The functions of the deputies with regards to the program have been revised. And that's what we have we, we obviously, we have the, uh, we revise our own functions. And we, if we have, we will implement them February 1st. But you've revised but, them in your office or you've revised, the, revised them together? No, we, we revise the functions of our own deputies. Okay, but not on how they work with the process, right? The answer is no. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Shipsky. Uh -huh. yeah, Madam Chair, I'm wondering why, you know, we aren't running this through the Enforcement Committee um, instead of it being done by individual board members. That's a good question. Well, we had actually set up a subcommittee to work on the Ben, ben Frank evaluation report, and because his report focused mostly on enforcement instead of the entire board evaluation, 
I think uh, Dr. Solomonson and Mr. Zeranian just moved it from there. Um, but certainly... Could we bring it through enforcement committee so that yes. there's, there's some vetting about what's going on? Yes. And that, yeah, that's we can, certainly fine. Happy to report to enforcement committee. Yeah. Dr. Levine? <laughs> yeah, just, a, just a question on, the, on page 188 on the calendar day age from request to receipt of medical... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, calendar day age from request to suspension order granted. The median for 27 records is one day. That means they were all granted on the day they were requested. Yeah, that we, this we would have obtained the Impressive change. Right. Any other questions of the, either Ms. Tuckill or Mr. Ramirez? Okay, thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Call up, um, Jill uh, Mioni, and I'm going to pronounce it incorrectly, and I, I'm not requesting that person to come. <laughs> but it says request to them. <laughs> okay, then I apologize. I'm just not reading my script appropriately. I'm going to call up uh, Ms. Thank you. Ms. Scurry, would you present on this? She's Sorry. I didn't, I wasn't reading well, I apologize, but you're re presenting on this. Excuse me, you are, someone is, would, the person that is reporting on this, please report. <laughs> <laughs> is the person to whom I'm speaking listening? <laughs> okay, so she's going to move over there, just a minute. Scurry, would you please present on item would number be more 31. Than happy to. Thank you. Back in 2000, the board adopted a regulation that allowed it to designate as precedent any decision or part of a decision that contains a significant legal or policy determination of general application that's likely to recur. Um, the board has done that twice in 10 years, and there's a proposal here that you have a third one. To implement this regulation, the board created policies back in 2004 specifying the path this would take to get to the board. And that path is that someone makes a request, it comes to legal counsel, um, and then that matter goes to the executive director. And if the executive director, after consultation with the chief of enforcement and board counsel, um, concludes that the board should consider the decision as precedent, then it would be placed on your agenda. The agenda serves as public notice that the uh, board will consider the decision as a precedent decision. You have in your packet my memo, which explains the background for this decision and the facts and findings of the case. Um, the purpose of this proposed precedent decision is to provide guidance to all the parties involved in the disciplinary proceeding re with respect to what is expected of an exchange of of testimony, or exchange of, wit of, excuse me, information regarding expert witnesses and the time frames within which that exchange must occur. Um, it comes out of a decision where that issue was explored in great detail, and uh, the panel that had this particular case made certain findings and provided certain guidance in that decision, and the Attorney General's office has made a request that this be designated as precedent, and we would concur in that request. Um, you have the option, according to your regulation, to decide the issue at this meeting or to put the matter over to a subsequent meeting. Um, I would defer to Mr. Lazar from the AG's office if he wishes to explain further about why this is, uh, should be designated as precedent decision. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Lazar. I'm a supervising deputy attorney general from the San Diego office. It's a pleasure to be before you today. The road to this request has been a very long one. For decades, in your cases, you have required by board policy that your experts prepare expert reports in detail explaining what their opinion is and what it's based on. 
When we get a case and we file an accusation, those reports are then turned over to the defense and they have all the information they need as to what the charges are based on, what's the expert going to say. For decades, however, the reverse was not true. Defense counsel would routinely instruct their experts not to prepare a report, don't put anything in writing. It was a defense tactic and unfortunately it had the very predictable result of stifling pre-trial settlements. And deputies who were prosecuting medical board cases would not know what the defense expert was going to say until that expert took the stand to testify. And it was a complete surprise. Now your enforcement monitor back in 2004 described this problem as follows. She said, the medical board requires its experts to reduce their expert reports to writing and those expert reports are immediately discoverable to the defense. However, defense counsel frequently instruct their experts not to reduce their opinions to writing so the HQE DAG has no idea of the substance of the defense counsel's expert opinion until the expert takes the stand at the evidentiary hearing. This practice results in unfair sandbagging of the DAG at the hearing and stifles the possibility of pre-hearing settlement. The expert medical opinions in these NBC administrative hearings go to the heart of the board's case and are entirely, partly or entirely dispositive of the result. Litigation surprise regarding this central element of the administrative action deserves all parties to the process and pub the public interest as a whole. Now in order to remedy this problem, the medical board supported, the legislature passed, and the governor signed into law Senate Bill 231, which was part of a comprehensive reform package of the medical board's enforcement program. And that part of that Senate bill was Business and Professions Code Section 2334, in effect of January 1st, 2006, it required both parties, the complainant and the respondent, to provide the following four things <coughs> to each other. One is a curriculum vitae for each expert. Second, a brief narrative statement setting forth the general substance of the testimony the expert is expected to give, including any expert testimony and its basis. Third, a representation that the expert had agreed to testify at the hearing. And that's so you don't get a list of 18 experts, none of whom have agreed to testify, and you have to wonder if you're the prosecution, who's going to show up on the day of hearing. And lastly, a statement of the expert's hourly and daily fee for providing testimony and consulting with the party who had retained his or her services. Now, in order to in ensure that the expert witness information is timely, the legislature required it be exchanged at least 30 days prior to the commencement of the hearing. And in order to ensure that it was actually done, the legislature put right in the statute that any party failing to do so simply may not present that expert testimony. It goes both ways. It goes for complainant and it goes for respondent. It's a, like many uh, rules of procedure in federal and state proceedings, there are consequences if you fail to follow, follow them. Now that should have been the end of the story. So on January 1, 2006, this problem should have been solved. Unfortunately, it wasn't. The Office of Administrative Hearings took a different position. It concluded that it had discretion to impose the legislatively fixed penalty or not, depending on the totality of the circumstances. And the Mione case was a perfect example of how multiple experts were designated, no adequate dis uh, disclosure was done, and in the end, the penalty was not imposed. Now this board took the Mione decision as an opportunity to give instruction, to give guidance to the Office of Administrative Hearings, to administrative law judges, to prosecutors, to doctors, on what, how Section 2334 is to be applied in your cases, how you want it applied. And it's basically 
how the legislature wrote it, how they intended it to be applied, and it, it requires the disclosure. And if there's no disclosure, that expert's not going to be able to take the stand. Um, if you adopt this as a precedent decision, and I believe this is the most important step in this whole process. We've litigated this and we've got it to this point. But your designation is the most important because we're continuing to litigate these issues. And it would be so great to attach to any motion in limine to exclude an expert a copy of the precedent decision which tells an administrative law judge this is how the board wants this code section applied in their cases. And there it is. And if we go up from there to the Superior Court or the Court of Appeal, we will be able to rely and we will on a precedent decision from you. So on behalf of that, unless you have any questions, um, the Office of the Attorney General would request that you designate this a precedent decision. And before I close, I also want to say to your Executive Director, thank you very much for your support in this matter. I, it's greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, have two speaker slips. But before I take the speaker slips, I just want to ask while you're sitting there, does anyone have any questions of either Mr. Lazar or Ms. Scurry on this issue? Yes? And I'm, I'm not an attorney, so I'll disclose that. How did the Office of Administrative Hearing, because the statute was clear, how did they otherwise determine that they had discretion to reinterpret that? There were several bases upon which uh, the administrative law judge reached that conclusion. Uh, they're contained and described in detail in the proposed decision that the judge submitted to the board, which was not adopted. Um, one of the things that the judge relied on was the provision in the code that permits the Office of Administrative Hearings to promulgate regulations on this subject. To date, they haven't promulgated regulations. That doesn't really provide a basis for ignoring what the legislature has put in the statute. Um, with all due respect to the legal analysis in that proposed decision, it was fundamentally flawed. And we pointed it out in exhausting briefing before the board on the issue, uh, and the board agreed. Let me ask uh, Ms. Scurry, um, as a matter of reference, given that we do so few of these, to maybe take a look at the other two that have come forward. And given that, how does this fit into the bigger picture of, of what we're doing? The other two, one dealt with the standard of care to be utilized in uh, making a medical marijuana recommendation. And the second one involved aiding and abetting in the, sit in the setting of a unlicensed practice where a physician had allowed his wife to uh, administer laser types of treatment, I believe, or intense pulse light treatments, and she owned the practice, and he did not, or the clinic at which these were being performed. So those were the two. What, so the one was intended to help provide guidance in the area of uh, the cosmetic procedures and unlicensed practice. The first was to set out, and it did so in great detail, the standard of care when making uh, medical marijuana recommendations. Uh, this one would have a uh, designation of that portion that's designated would have significant uh, effects because it would um, apply to all the cases in which you have every quality of care case. Uh, the, the law says in 2234, uh, to continue on with what Mr. Lazar had, had provided an answer to you, Ms. Kent, that notwithstanding any other provision of law, this prevails and the administrative law judge rather disregarded that little phrase in the law, which is an important phrase in the law, um, and, and found, used it by analogy to civil proceedings, and that really they're not analogous. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Okay, I have public comment on this. Um, Mr. Sheik, Raham Sheik, want to come forward? Remember my three-minute admonition, please. Yes, Madam President, uh, I rise here to oppose this request. Uh, I understand the issue is uh, 
is about legal procedures uh, that are appropriate for a hearing with the court of law and office of administrative hearing kind of ALJ is like kind of a judge. Uh, so my primary concern is uh, the same uh, what we discussed today about adding um, another procedure for contract of expert reviewers and there was a good question is there any change of law I mean this is the same thing that has been happening for decades why not uh, and that goes to the second question uh, is it applicable to all parties I mean I have seen evidence that you know parties bring um, surprise evidence and the evidentiary case go to the court and court decides what is a good evidence, what is a wrong evidence. Uh, there is an advocate remedy at law. If ALJ found something at his or her discretion, it can go to the appropriate court and then court can decide whether this evidence should be held in the record or not. But lastly, two more points. Uh, let's say there is a surprise and a physician brings a testimony which I suppose is a physician or an attorney in case of some ethical issues. What would that do? It would only bring, bring clarity to the issue and it will give board more discretion to review what is the actual issue, what are the facts. There is this issue is not relevant to health care. This issue is not relevant to protection of public. It doesn't improve patient care at all. Rather, the issue is of legal nature. If the opponent party, doctor, brings, a, brings this surprise evidence, and if this doesn't conform with the court procedures, court can take an action. If this doesn't, if this does not conform with the rules of the state bar, then state bar can take an action against an attorney who is bringing this surprise evidence. There is nothing relevant to health care. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Julie D'Angelo Feldman, please. Good afternoon. Julie D'Angelo Feldman from the Center for Public Interest Law, and I'm the former Medical Board Enforcement Monitor, and I participated in drafting Business and Professions Code, Section 2234, which was a direct outcome of the Enforcement Monitor reports. Uh, the Center for Public Interest Law strongly supports the request of the Attorney General that you exercise your discretion to designate a portion of the Mione decision as a precedential decision. As you've heard, you don't often do this, but it is particularly appropriate in this case because the abuse that is occurring here will recur. It is already recurring. Uh, and the statute that was passed by the legislature in 2005 is very clear. It's very fair. It's not burdensome. It promotes settlements. And it eliminates the unfairness that Mr. Lazar described uh, that results when a deputy attorney general has no idea of the substance or the basis for a defense expert's uh, opinion until that person takes the stand at a hearing. That completely stifles any possibility of settlement. Um, and the statute is quite clear. It simply requires all experts, yours and defense, to reduce their opinion to writing and to exchange it with each other within 30 days of the hearing. It's quite clear, uh, and I urge you to adopt this as a precedential decision. I also want to thank Mr. Lazar for doing the heavy lifting here on the briefing and the argument in this case. You have some really terrific attorneys working for you in the Health Quality Enforcement Section of the Attorney General's Office, and Mr. Lazar is one of them, and I think you ought to thank him for his work on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman? I, 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 the motion? I'll move, uh, certainly, uh, for the purpose of uh, making a comment, but I'll move it. And do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Um, I, will too, wanted to thank Mr. Lazar. Even I understood uh, everything you said, but uh, Tom, you, you, 
But Tom, uh, you certainly make our profession proud. You are very eloquent in your explanation mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what is important here also to realize is that, yes, we do this very seldomly, but this one will affect the majority, if not almost all of the cases, with respect to quality of care um, versus the other two that we've adopted. This case, this presidential decision will touch the lives of many, many more people than the other two combined. So it is so important to have uh, for public protection as well as efficiency. <clears throat> this will settle cases. This will force people to settle cases. It's no longer a crapshoot or a surprise. Um, I, no offense to our own profession, but we are, we are very creative in the way we do things at times. And we're trained to push the envelope. Um, and, but this is one inappropriate way of pushing the envelope, especially when people's lives are at stake. So from that perspective, I think it's a welcome opportunity. I, I thank you for bringing it forth. Thank, thank you. you. Dr. Lowe? <laughs> yes, Mr. Lalor, um, could you just clarify a point for me, and that is that uh, the difference between um, our proceedings, which go through the uh, Office of Administrative Law and civil things, is that in civil cases they are actually allowed to take depositions of their experts, whereas we don't. Is that, is that the difference? That's absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. Do you have any other comments or questions? Any other public comment or any members' comments? Okay. All those in favor of the motion as it stands? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It's so done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Lazar, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. The rest of the process. Wait, sorry. The of the, that's okay. There is the rest of the process, and that involves indexing and placing it on your website. So it will be um, the staff will finish that part of the process now that you've designated this as a pressing decision. And thank you, Anita. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So we're going to um, ask Ms. Whitney to present on the um, an update on the board's mechanism for impaired physicians. So that you could be ready. This item, thank you. This item is respo in response to Dr. Moran's request to have staff address what is being done since the sunset of diversion. Um, we have set this up in a three-part segment. Mr. Hepler has prepared uh, the, the law, and he will address those issues. And then Ms. Katie will present information on the terms and conditions. And then I will follow up with our efforts in wellness and some other information that I found out that is going on in the, the outside world, not in the bureaucracy. Mr. Hepler. Thank you, Ms. Whitney. Um, just sort of the basis, as everybody who's attended a medical board meeting or one of my panels, has heard me say innumerable times, the purpose of an administrative disciplinary proceeding is never to punish the licensee, but always to protect the public. That's actually black letter case law, which I've cited here. The second number, bullet number, or point number two is essentially two things. Number one, it, ex it expresses the legislature's, the, the premier policy making organ of the state of California of what the medical board's mission is when it exercises its licensing, disciplinary, or regulatory function, and that is, the paramount issue is the protection of the public. We see that common theme yet again in section 2229 of the Business and Professions Code, where as you see in subdivision B, there is in fact an understanding that the board's gonna take that action to rehabilitate the licensee. However, if you look at subdivision, the bottom of subdivision C, it says where rehabilitation and protection are inconsistent, protection shall be paramount or the converse, rehabilitation shall yield. So I just want to kind of give everybody a basis of what the purpose of administrative discipline is 
and sort of the obligations of the medical board when instituting that discipline. Thank you. Ms. Katie? Thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, in July 2008, the medical board's diversion program was dissolved. Those physicians that had at least three years of sobriety were considered to have successfully completed the program, and those that required continued testing and monitoring were transitioned to the probation unit for the biological fluid testing. The board's current disciplinary guidelines recommend at least 10 different terms and conditions that can be included in an administrative decision ordering probation. Next slide. Six of these conditions focus specifically on the treatment and monitoring for substance abuse issues. The order will typically contain an abstain from use requirement that can be modified depending on the individual's circumstance. Some orders require that the physician abstain from controlled substances and alcohol. Some require only alcohol. But biological fluid testing is always included when there's an abstain from use requirement. The decisions can also require a psychiatric and medical evaluation with the requirement that the physician comply with any treatment recommended by the evaluating physician. Next slide. The current monitoring process is similar to what was provided by the diversion program, with the exception that the testing and monitoring is required as a condition of probation, and the failure to comply is considered a violation of probation and can be cause for further discipline. Um, in addition to what we currently have, uh, the proposed amendments that are being made to our disciplinary guidelines will allow the board to issue a cease practice order should the physician have a biological fluid test or fail to cooperate with their testing. Another key difference in our current monitoring is that the action taken by the board and the requirements for monitoring are considered public. Under the diversion program, if the physician's participation was voluntary, uh, or if they had voluntarily enrolled in the program, um, their, their participation was confidential and no referrals were made to the enforcement program unless the physician was deemed not safe to practice. Next slide. Um, I I've included in your material some statistics on how many physicians we currently have on probation that have the biological fluid testing requirement and what some of those, those um, findings have been. Any questions? Thank you, Susan, or Ms. Case. When the diversion program came up as um, an issue to this board in terms of were we going to extend its sunset date or not, there was considerable discussion and actually controversy related to the extension of the diversion program. And this board voted not to pursue legislation that would continue the diversion program for the Medical Board of California. The legislature, in fact, chose not to introduce any legislation or amend any existing legislation to carry on the diversion program. There are many, many problems with the diversion program. One being that the funding and staffing for it were very difficult to obtain when you're in the bureaucracy because of all of the mechanisms you have to go through in order to get authority to add new positions and add the, the type of uh, workers and um, support that one would need in order to ensure that a program such as what we had could be monitored in an effective way where an auditor coming in would find that there were no issues with it. So part of our problems were the staffing in terms of the number of staff that we could actually have and the amount of workload that each staff member had. So the audit that was done on the diversion program showed a, a failing in the part of the medical board and thus the board decided not to pursue the uh, continuation of the diversion program. What the board did, in fact, was look at what can we do to help our physicians from the very beginning when they start 
in a medical school all the way until they end their career? What is it that the board can step into and assist with? And then turn to the private sector, the hospitals, the um, psychologists, psychiatrists, the uh, addiction medicine specialists, and have them work on something while we worked on something that we could manage within the bureaucracy. So this board set up a wellness committee. This committee's mission was to examine how we could get the word out to physicians and those in medical school that the well-being of the physician, the health of the physician, was what was going to translate into quality medical care to the consumers. In essence, we're looking at consumer protection. And allow then the private sector to deal with uh, some of the addiction issues. In terms of the wellness committee, um, starting at the front end, we have uh, tried to work with some of the medical schools. We have spoken with some of the deans about what they can integrate into their programs, into the medical school curriculum that will help their students. And it's not just drugs and alcohol. We're talking about all of the aspects of wellness, from stress reduction, from uh, physical health, uh, so a little exercise, and mental health. So we're looking at all the aspects. And then um, we wanted to look at postgraduate training. We understand that those folks who are in postgraduate training tend to work 24-7 and that's not healthy. Um, I know that um, we've seen that um, many restrictions have been placed on the hours that postgraduate students are allowed to work at any point in time. And that time has been reduced over many years. So there is a, a set standard now. We have in the Wellness Committee, led by Dr. DeRusso, looked at best practices. And that work group that was set up that met at our last board meeting has been meeting and they haven't had an opportunity between November and now to meet, but they are looking at best practices and models that can be set up to provide information to physicians, again, at all levels of the career that would help um, them in what they do, but would also help hospitals who did not have wellness committees or well-being committees or uh, wellness efforts to help them set up some wellness efforts. We had a, a presenter who actually spoke about programs that were instituted at Kaiser and their exercise programs, their mental health programs, they're, they're programs to ensure that the physicians and all the healthcare providers are healthy because, again, they're recognizing that a healthy healthcare provider translates to better care of their patients. And that's what we were looking at. So we have um, backed off of, in terms of anything that is a um, diversion type model. But what I've found out since uh, we've been meeting is that there are many institutions that are out there working. Uh, CSAM, the um, Society for Addiction Medicine, the California Medical Association, and a number of other groups are working towards efforts to ensure that there is something available. And we support the efforts of hospitals and medical schools to uh, institute uh, different efforts to help those individuals on an upfront basis before we have to hear about them. We have been invited, I believe, um, three or four times Susan has gone out making presentations. Uh, Renee and I, Ms. Threadgill and I will be out uh, next week making a presentation to Kaiser in Los Angeles. Um, there will be a presentation in Tahoe. Talk about who we are and what we're trying to promote in terms of wellness, 
but we are not stepping into the, the area of uh, a diversion program. It's still very controversial. I know the department has uh, tried to take on that issue, and many of the other boards are having um, different issues with it. Some are very supportive of diversion programs, but part of the diversion program is ensuring that the monitoring and the fluid testing is being done appropriately and you're reacting quickly enough to those uh, results to ensure that there's public safety. We have ensured in our disciplinary guidelines that there will be the, the public safety element when we do hear about a physician who is in trouble and by passing those disciplinary guidelines that you did today, we can move forward with the cease practice of physicians who do test positive as soon as those are adopted and filed with the Secretary of State. And that's a major step that we have not had the ability to do. Okay. Questions? Dr. Uh, Moran? I'm just curious as to what constitutes appropriate and acceptable forms of treatment. Are there uh, certain treatment programs that are approved? I know that we were going to go down that route at one point, but I think we shied away from um, it. We're not approving uh, programs, per se. We're, we're allowing individuals to go and seek their own programs. There are various programs out there by a number of treatment groups that um, are available to physicians. We don't really recommend something. I know that uh, CMA has associations, CSAM has associations, and that um, I know of a, a couple groups, uh, Pacific Assistance and uh, another group from Arizona that have been very active in California offering their services to hospitals and um, clinics to help promote the, the well-being or to help provide that assurance to physicians. And so does the board then uh, just accept uh, the treating physician's approval of probation? Um, it, no. If, if it's probation, then there's a whole process that we would go through to approve what the physician is doing but we don't approve the actual group that they're in. We ensure that they're getting the testing and that they're getting the monitoring that they need or possibly that uh, they're attending group sessions that may be prescribed in the terms and conditions that Susan presented. But we don't go out and um, audit the, the group that may be doing the, the monitoring itself we leave that to the private sector. So if somebody was going to do some sort of alternative treatment or chelation therapy or something, is that, uh, does that matter to the board as far as, you know, what form of treatment they choose? I'm not sure I understand. Okay. okay. Right. Just curious. Dr. Levine? Yeah, I, I, I had a question. Um, I'm somewhat startled by the high percentage, almost 90% of the positive tests were excluded because of a prescription, a valid prescription medication in the, in the data that Susan showed. And I'm wondering how the process, how that, the, the cease practice, um, if the positive test triggers a cease practice and 90% of the time... Um, what you passed was a confirmed positive. Okay. So a confirmed positive would have to be examined to what they're allowed to have. So that's why the word confirmed was added. So there isn't a false negative, but we would also uh, be looking at what they're allowed to Great. Uh, so it would be the action. But they also the have to notice. I believe there's a notice yes. to tell us what yeah. they're on. The reason it's yeah. the 90% is it's probably uh, the testing is maybe one or two licensees who have an ongoing valid prescription and 
it keeps throwing that off. I see. So you have multiple tests in there. I see. And, and, so, the, and so it's the, the actionable positives where the cease practice would... Mm -hmm. Would be in the future the cease practice, correct. <coughs> if, if the licensee had not reported the use of the medication or the prescription for the medication before they were tested, then the cease practice would apply. That, that would be a confirmed test and then maybe <coughs> After there was information, there, there might be, uh, depending upon how it turns out, allowing them to practice again. So, was, but anyone on probation would understand they needed to report. Right, but if they're requested, you're, they're to, required to notice. Required right. to notice us uh, if they're on mes medication and they're asked that before testing each time. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. Kent. Question? I was just going to follow up on Dr. Moran's comments in that, um, that. The treatment of addiction for physicians in some ways is a lot different than, I mean, treatment of addiction and alcohol dependency are difficult in and of themselves, but I think especially when it comes to physicians, um, just because of the nature of the practice and the, um, there's a higher stakes game, I think, for physicians when they admit oh. that there's an addiction issue. And so when you ask, are there treatment facilities or programs that, you know, are recognized, I think that um, there's a lot of different programs out there and whether they specialize in helping professionals um, address addiction issues and the quality is not there because they, they have wildly different standards and so I just think it's something that the board could consider in future discussions in terms of what would you recommend to physicians if they're seeking advice on coming to grips with an addiction issue, something that has been statistically shown to actually help physicians back into the path of recovery. I'm sure Dr. Dussault is listening to that. Um, I am. And uh, we'll uh, take it under advisement. We'll take it under advisement and uh, okay. thank you. it's an excellent um, Idea. observation. Is there any other uh, questions or comments about the report? Okay, then thank you. I'd like to ask Ms. Kirchmeyer to come up, please, make a presentation uh, for the Department of Consumer Affairs. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Kimberly Kirkmeyer with the Department of Consumer Affairs. And I'm just here today on behalf of Director Steger to give you an update on projects and matters of interest to the department. And I know Ms. Whitney has asked me to um, talk about a couple items as well. Um, so I will be bringing all those forward and hopefully able to answer any questions that you may have. Um, the first thing I just wanted to do is thank you actually for going green. Um, that's a, something that we're trying to get a lot of the boards to do, and I think that's just wonderful. Um, even for us, when we go out and go to the meetings, we're trying to bring um, our laptops and put items on there because it's just so much more. It's so much helpful, more helpful than uh, having your tons of documents and paper. Um, I did just want to offer one item up. You were talking about your strategic plan. Again, I just want to offer up the department's solid unit. I think that's the wrong name for what they are now, but um, their unit to assist in any matter, even if it's just gathering documentation and putting some things together for you, just so um, you'll have that additional staff to assist you with that, and they, it's part of their plan. So definitely offer that up to the, the task force on that. Okay. Starting through the items at the department, in regards to the transition, um, there haven't been a lot of appointments, as most of you probably know. Um, there currently is no agency secretary or undersecretary at the State and Consumer Services Agency, um, which is the entity that provides oversight to the department, um, which means that some of our regulation packages are still pending um, uh, their review over there. Um, again, we're hoping they have actually sent some of them out, but we're hoping that we do get an agency secretary in so they can review those packages and send them on down and over to um, Office of Administrative Law. Um, at this time, the Director Steger has been asked to continue at the department, and he continues to move forward items including Consumer Protection Enforcement Initiative and, of course, implementing any executive order that we may receive. In regards to the hiring freeze, the department did seek clarification from this new administration, and it was determined that the department needs to continue with the hiring freeze as it was originally established. Um, therefore, we have, or are continuing, and we are only allowing interdepartmental transfers, as Ms. Whitney and I believe Ms. Threadgill both st stated earlier today. 
Um, at this time, the exemption process hasn't been clearly identified. However, the department will continue to pursue freeze exemptions for critical positions. And as Ms. Whitney said, we are in the process. We've actually put forward one for licensing job creation, and that's in addition to the ones that we currently already have pending over there for like consumer protection enforcement initiative positions or any other positions that we have sought re um, an exemption process on. So all of those are still over there and, and the licensing one was the most recent one we submitted. Um, in regards to the cell phones, there was an executive order that was issued January 11th requiring a decrease in the cell phones and smartphones by 50%. So let me interrupt you. Okay. Here's two more. Oh, no, good. Don't <laughs> Linda's not going to let you give those to me. <laughs> um, but we, we are working to implement the executive order as quickly as possible. Um, we want to let you know the boards and, and committees, they had to submit a plan um, by February or January 18th, actually, as to how they were going to decrease their amount of cell phones. And we actually want the, to the phones to be turned in by February 1st. And the governor did state in the executive order that because of contract obligations, it is possible that we may not be able to eliminate the cell, all the 48,000 cell phones by June 1st, but it is also conceivable that we can do it earlier, and that is my hope. So therefore, Director Steger actually is trying to implement this um, in order to begin savings and meet the goal of this order. Um, we've looked at the contracts, which was one thing we were concerned about, and we have found that um, we can do this earlier without any penalties for earlier termination because of the amount of phones that we have. So we are implementing that, and I just want to thank the board for um, being a part of that and getting their um, their plan, their number into the Department of Consumer Affairs. On to the budget. Um, in regards to the budget, the department was notified last week that the Senate and Assembly hearings are taking place earlier than usual. As most of you know, it's really early for us to be going forward for budget hearings. We actually, as Ms. Whitney said, we actually have an Assembly Budget Subcommittee meeting um, hearing this Monday, and we have one for the Senate the following Monday. So it's, it's been expedited a lot. Um, this board doesn't have any BCPs going forward. However, there was an opportunity to also submit spring finance letters, um, if you so chose. Um, the deadline for submitting it was last Monday, and those were submitted to agency, and they're going um, forward then to the Department of Finance. I do just want to point out, though, that the letter that came out from the Department of Finance did state that regardless of funding source, only the most critical enrollment, caseload, and population requests will be considered, as well as spring finance letters that address court mandates or condition where any delay in funding would result in imminent, irreparable, and significant damage to the health and safety of persons or property in the state. So therefore, you can see that the review will be very stringent, but as most of the individuals who have submitted spring finance letters hope that those will be going forward. In regards to, oh, yes, sorry, what's a BCP? I'm sorry, a budget change proposal. That's basically what starts the process for you to um, get some type of uh, change in your budget. It's basically how you get positions, how you would keep positions. As Ms. Whitney said, all of the ones that were disapproved, those were all through the budget change proposal. In, in my world, it's birth control pills. But. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will remember that forever now. <laughs> Maybe they should keep the, they should have a transfer of your world into their world. It's working out the same. Be because that's a confidential uh, uh, type of category. We call it an augmentation here at the board. Okay. So you may that refer to it an augmentation request so we don't have uh, somebody thinking that we're letting out confidential um, in regards to loans, this was something that Ms. Whitney had also requested, any information on a loan from this particular board to the general fund, um, and the budget did not contain any language for such a loan, and the department has not had any un other information, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put a caveat in there, as of today, um, pertaining to a loan from this board. So as of this time, there hasn't been anything that we, we know of yet for the medical board. The other thing that the, um, Ms. Whitney also wanted me to discuss was IT contracts. Um, we know that the board has had some contracts that have taken longer and we wanted to let, let you know
investigators go out, they actually have a group that comes in and will go into the medical office and scan those records and then you know, put them on a disk and give them to your investigator. So that was considered to have an IT component. Um, and I know what they're, the overall plan is to review anything to see if you could consolidate items, if you can get, you know, lower prices on contracts, if you could even have a state entity do it. I know this may be something that Sean's talking about when, when we were going through the Breeze project, this was something that came up because we wanted to add into our um, Breeze project a, a scanning system. What's it called? Missing. Okay, so, okay, so scanners, and so what we actually ended up having to do was ask like Franchise Tax Board, EDD, if they could do it. Unfortunately, for the most part, they couldn't do it, because, so then we could add it into our Breeze project. But that was something I know they're trying to look at those other avenues. So let me ask you the question of, about this specifically. Uh, I understand where you're trying to consolidate, you're trying to get the best price, you're trying to make sure that what's needed is needed. But when it comes to a certain dollar amount, would it not be helpful if your department would be able to suggest that up to a certain dollar amount, maybe it could be expended by the executive director with approval? For example, our flash drives have to go to a state contract situation. Right, those are all through that, that IT procurement process. It's IT, but... I know. And, and there was actually a bill that passed, I think, it was effective, Kurt probably knows better, um, January of this year, and it was SB 856 which really transferred a lot of the duties regarding the state's procurement of IT from Department of Finance, DGS, and the old do it to state CIO. So that is something I know that it's part of the process. It's nothing that we can avoid at this time. But as you, as you go forward with the process of trying to consolidate under the Department of Consumer Affairs, if there was some kind of attention to the detail that if it's up to a certain dollar amount for expenditure, that maybe we should leave some kind of expectation that our executive directors are in a position to know what they're doing? And, and I couldn't disagree with that. However, I do know that for the IT procurement plans, those actually aren't even under the department. That's what I'm saying. The department even doesn't even do it anymore. It's going up through agency and over to the OCIO. Okay. okay. Um, and then I think I just have uh, one more item before I just want to introduce Sean here. Um, the Consumer Protection Enforcement Initiative, we are moving forward with the items that we can. The one that we're moving forward with right now is we just are in the process of gathering our second set of performance measurements and we'll be posting them on our website the first week of February. These performance measurements provide for transparency to the public and the department encourages all the members to go to the website to look at those time frames. Again, that is something that the public, your consumers, your licensees are going to be able to see. There is a tab and I forwarded it out to the board president. I, if you could forward that on to the members, I can forward it on to them as well. Um, that's something that's out there on the DCA website to where you can see how long it's taking from the time a complaint's received until disciplinary action is taken against the board as well as several other um, measurements for the enforcement process that are out there. Okay, and unless there are any questions, we're going to move right into the Breeze update. Yes. Just a, just a quick one. I know uh, they're putting some uh, re uh, request for out-of-state travel. How does that work, and would they get approved to go to the uh, FSMB meetings? Now, I, I heard that earlier. I don't know if you're trying to do an individual trip or whether you're going forward for um, fiscal year 11-12. Uh, the individual trip was submitted. Okay, it has been submitted for, for this in this fiscal year. Correct. Okay, I haven't seen that request yet. Um, if you remember back to last year when all of the trips were approved for this year, all five of them that we received, um, it was something they were looking very critical at all the out-of-state trips. They weren't looking at whether there was a dollar amount attached to it. The department submitted I would say probably about 100 out-of-state trips and we received five. And they were to the very critical mandated functions. For example, we received three for like our arbitration and certification program because they actually travel out-of-state to do a mandated inspection of a facility. Um, there was also, I believe, medical board one received for enforcement um, because they may need to have individuals go into another state to gather um, information. I think that's what the out-of-state trip is for. And then there's also one for contractors, similarly, for out-of-state investigator functions. So Those were the only that were approved. And so you can see that the bar was set very high 
Um, and again, we don't know this new administration, how they're looking at out-of-state trips, um, but that was the prior administration. Those were the only wor that were approved at that time. Even if it's a zero expense? Even the if they were zero expense trips, yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, and I just want to apologize. I know on your agenda today, um, Brandon Rutschman was supposed to be here to provide the Breeze project overview. Unfortunately, Brandon um, had a family emergency where um, he's not available today. Um, but Sean O'Connor is here with me. And Sean is our business program manager for the Breeze project. Um, and just to give you a little background on Sean, Sean actually comes from the board side as well. He worked for the Board of Behavioral Sciences for how many years? Was one of you did. 10 years um, before he came over and joined the Breeze Project. Been somewhere for 10 years? I thought it was her son that just with a tie on. You know? <laughs> um, and he, he's one of those individuals when we needed statistics, um, even prior I had heard of Sean even when I worked for the medical board and his ability to get data out of our antiquated systems. So he knows what he had to deal with and what he would like to deal with in the future. So he is a wonderful person. Um, again, as we have said, we do not want this to be an IT-driven project. It's not going to give us what we want, what we need to function um, as the boards and bureaus. So Sean's going to bring that business knowledge in, and he's already done a really good job of working with the subject matter experts um, to move this project forward. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to him. Thank you for that gracious introduction, Kim. Um, in addition to working for a, a licensing board for 10 years prior to accepting this position, I also have a master's degree in public policy and administration, so I see a lot of potential for a licensing database to inform effective policy decisions down the road, and I know that's something that your board is interested in. So, um, Before we get started, I just want to give you a quick overview, if we could go to the next slide, mm -hmm. of my presentation. We're going to go over a brief project summary, mm -hmm. project concepts and benefits, the transaction fee, which is the method through which we are going to pay for this new licensing and enforcement <laughs> database. Key success factors, our project leadership, recent activities and next steps, and our tentative implementation schedule. <clears throat> and if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to ask. You don't have to hold them off till the end. Um, next slide, please. Okay, project summary. What is Breeze? It is an integrated licensing and enforcement solution. It will completely replace our existing legacy systems. This includes CAS, ATS, and our other various workaround database systems that are in the department. Um, this also replaces the previous projects, the iLicensing and CRIMS projects, and it incorporates document image storage. Um, that was mentioned briefly before, so I wanted to touch on that a little bit. The vision of the Breeze system would be for staff on the medical board side to be able to pull up an enforcement record, for example, and be able to access electronically the documentation that they would need rather than pull up a hard copy file. Um, this, is a, uh, this, is a <laughs> this is something that was uh, discussed uh, with several of the, the medical board subject matter experts, so I wanted to mention that. Um, also wanted, since I mentioned medical board subject matter experts, I wanted to thank um, uh, Director Whitney for graciously um, providing so much support to the Breeze Project. We have a ton of medical board subject matter experts on our various work groups. Um, they participated throughout the working sessions, both the IT and the business side, and they added tremendous value to the project, so thank you. May, may I, since you've asked for interruptions, uh, may I interrupt you for a second? Of course. Um, the, you said uh, some of these things would be available to the enforcement side. Which enforcement side are you talking about? Unfortunately, there may be a division of enforcement side when it comes to, to us. I mean, are you talking about enforcement altogether, which includes the Attorney General's office, or are you talking about just our enforcement side of the world? This would be your enforcement side. Um, the authorized users to use this system would be within the sphere of the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Medical Board. So this would be um, uh, individuals on your enforcement side, your enforcement side. So the bottom line is, you know, yeah, we're, we're changing this and putting a little makeup on it, but at the same time, from an efficiency standpoint, we still don't have the efficiency of having our lawyers seeing these documents. I, I'm going to interject here because um, Sean actually is not familiar with the vertical pro um, prosecution process or vertical enforcement process. Um, even though that he's talking about it from the medical board side, if we were to give the Attorney General's office access into your database, that's something we'll have to discuss, um, then they would be able to look at those documents. It, you would have to identify them as a user. 
Um, he's going to get to it in a minute, but we're also talking about DOJ is one of the interfaces with this system. So that is there as well. Okay. okay. Well, I'll wait for that. Thank you. I see. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a brief uh, graphical depiction of the project concept. Um, just to show you some of the different component parts of this enterprise-wide licensing and enforcement database system. Uh, as was just mentioned, um, you'll notice down in the bottom right of the slide, the external interfaces and DOJ is listed prominently on this slide as one. Um, Boards and Bureau's interface, as you probably know, with DOJ to receive uh, criminal background information checks on um, licensees. Uh, and uh, so we have several interfaces with DOJ that facilitates that sort of information to come over into our licensing databases. So that, Question. On that issue, so are you saying that it's only limited information or in other words they'll have access to a limited part of the program or are they going to have access to all of it? Could you, <clears throat> could you speak to that? I definitely. So there's two things. First of all, I think that I was just thinking with um, them being able to access yours with this new system, you know, in the past we haven't been able to say, oh, you can get in here, but you can only look at X, Y, and Z. First of all, we don't have paper documents in there to look at anyway. Um, but what you would be able to do under this system is I could identify Mr. Zerunian, you can go in and you can look at the documents that are attached to case number 123 and you have access to look at that, you have access to look at um, the attachments to the investigation report, etc. So we could actually have the DOJ being able to have access into those, correct? Is it, yes. So you would identify what based upon the board's need, what they would have access to. The other thing is we are going to be talking to DOJ to see if there's information that can then um, be put from ProLaw into this system as well. That's why we want to build DOJ as one of the individuals we partner with to interface between the two systems. Well, that would be helpful because based on what you're describing, it sounds like if we were to apply it to our vertical enforcement, uh, if a DAG is assigned to a particular case or a case, um, a bunch of cases, then you can authorize that DAG to look at case number one, two, three, four, five that he or she has been assigned to under the ver vertical enforcement process, right? Correct. And then that DAG would have access to every single thing that our investigators would have <coughs> access to, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and what you're saying is if by talking to, she's got a lot of power apparently, um, but, uh, but what you're saying also with respect to pro-law is that if the Department of Justice, and I don't know where Carlos is, but uh, to the extent that the Department of Justice permits their information to come through, um, then our investigators will be able to see what they make available or that DAG makes available um, on cases one, two, three, four, five, right? Okay. I preface that with, with DOJ's approval and authority, of course. Well, I understand that part, right? That's something that obviously we would need to talk to them and, and figure it out. Uh, the attorney-client privilege issue, etc. We'll deal with those, but I just want to understand how you're building this concept and Okay. Okay. Ask questions. Yes. Does it does this uh, have the capacity to um, cross talk to other agencies that do licensing of personnel? Yes, this would be an enterprise wide uh, system for the whole department. So, if there were certain, uh, is, is it? Could you give a particular? Beyond. Example? So, there's other departments that license health professionals besides the DCA. Right. So, uh, MSA. And DPH are the two that I'm thinking off the top of my head. If there were, if there was a desire from the board to interface with other agencies that contain data that potentially could affect an investigation and individuals' qualifications for licensure, that you wanted to get data from that, that it's more that if you're if you're refused if you're refused licensure in one place because of a criminal history, you pop to the other place, and if it's not linked, yeah. that's kind of what. 
Just so you know, Ms. Kent, when we started this, um, it was one of those things because we did work with the Office of um, Chief Information Officer on this and they're completely in support of this because what they would like this to actually be is the program that is used possibly in the future for all in entities that actually license individuals. So that isn't the goal on our project, but I know that's where the OCIO wants to go with it. Okay. So we can actually talk to each other and actually even the legislative analyst office, that was something they um, had asked about as well because I think at the time that we were going for the sub hearing um, last year, it was when the whole issue blew up about the certified nurse assistants. Um, and so that was one thing where the, the entities weren't communicating and they want to use this as something that could communicate. But one thing we are doing, just so you know, is when you go in, if you were to look up Jane Doe, we want it to be able to cross across all of DCA at least to show here's all the licenses they hold, here's any actions that they have, hold, et cetera. So we don't, so a person can do one stop shop, but so can the boards back and forth to each other. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to the next slide then. <clears throat> so one system, many boards. How will one system work for 40 plus unique <clears throat> entities? Um, that answer to that is individual board controlled configuration, which is more uh, thoroughly explained on the next slide. So when we go, could we go to the next one? Thank you. So um, the, uh, the root layer of the configuration of these COTS products, which COTS stands for commercial off the shelf products which is um, the licensing and enforcement databases that we are looking to procure our COTS products. Um, this, the system sort of resembles an onion uh, with many layers of control to maximize supportability, configuration. Um, the first root layer is the vendor's black box. Um, that would include in, um, the routing engine, user interfaces, and their data architecture. Um, the vendor designs and owns the data architecture model, how the data is arranged and how it's stored. Um, the vendor designs the user interfaces or user experience, what the, um, you know, how the, the user would flow through the process. Um, uh, the next layer, if you could hit the cue on it, thank you, would be the DCA IT, including the board IT, as I understand, as um, the medical board has a, uh, a robust IT staff. Um, uh, the next layer would be to maintain system interfaces and develop new ones as needed. So um, if there needs to be additional interfaces that were not identified on the original RFP, moving forward through the configurability of this project, we could potentially interface with other agencies, create inbound and outbound interfa interfaces. Um, manage system user profiles and clients access um, would be a, within the sphere of the board. Um, to identify if they so desired for DAGs to look at specific information. Your um, system admins on the IT side would be able to create user profiles for them with security um, authorizations that are appropriate for whatever um, you would like them to see. Um, also, uh, the final uh, administrative layer, if we could go to that, one more cue, would be um, board and bureau staff. So this would be um, outside of the IT, but um, if you were to, uh, to provide board and bureau staff with um, certain levels of, um, of uh, access to be able to configure and add application requirements as needed if there were new application requirements for an um, application, for example, you can add that to the system. It's not like they have to go in and hard code and know uh, uh, any sort of programming to add that sort of component to it. You can even, uh, to give an example, during the uh, demonstrations that were provided to um, that were provided to the evaluation team, uh, the board what was demonstrated to us was both systems um, sh creating a new fee and setting the implementation date for that far in advance of what um, uh, you know going in and coding that far in advance so that it will automatically take place once that date date arrives. Um, it was rather impressive that it was so easy to do because it's something that is takes a considerable effort um, when you have a custom design program where you have to have programmers go in and change it. So. Um. I just have to tell you, I kept, when we went through the evaluation, I would lean over to Debbie um, Balaam, who is our, uh, the DCA Chief Information Officer, and be like, they did it in like 10 minutes. How come we have like 100 hours on our plan when it takes, just because of our <laughs> archaic systems? Thanks. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, what's in it for us? Uh, for, for the customers, which would be the um, licensees or consumers, um, the self-service in a single point of entry. So this includes not only the back-end <coughs> office experience for your staff, but also the front-end online ability to create a user profile to file a consumer complaint. If they so chose to do that, they can also file one anonymously 
or look up a licensee um, without, without doing that. But by creating a user profile, there will be enhanced functionality. Um, they can check the status of a complaint. A licensee could check the status of their application, even to the level of detail of seeing which particular requirements are pending review at the board, have not been fulfilled yet. If you were to desire to um, add that functionality in for your board, that opportunity would be there. Um, also, the, uh, the staff, um, there will be automated workflow routing, which I think is one, personally, coming from the business side, one of the most exciting things about this system would be the um, potential for automated workflow routing, where if you have a segmented sort of division of labor, uh, one section of your office does cashiering, the other section does review of the licensing applications, the system would automatically route things based on the business rules that your IT or um, staff put in the system, automatically route those to the appropriate people, take them off of a routing queue if they're out for vacation for a determined amount of time, um, and also reroute applications to different, pro to different areas um, if, if they so desire. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. <laughs> so, incidentally, we, have a, we don't have, at least I don't have, the, the last slide and this slide. Oh, okay. I don't. That's okay. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I actually have extra copies if you desire to get one of these after the meeting. I can provide that to you. But um, the transaction fee is the payment model that we are going with to uh, procure this licensing solution. There is an initial vendor payment for software and detail design only. After that, they do not get their money until the boards and bureaus have accepted, nor do you start paying for it until you've accepted the product meets your office's needs and um, it is implemented. So uh, the, there is initial vendor payment for software and detail design. My CIO likes me to point out that this is actually um, a good thing, that there is a small initial payment, because what it insulates us from is from having a situation where a, we contract with a vendor who comes in and um, goes bankrupt halfway through our contract process. We don't have access to the software. This initial payment actually buys the software license for us. So in the event that that were to happen, we could hire another vendor to come in and configure the software. We would actually own it at that point. Um, after deployment, it, the uh, payment model is that a transaction fee will be assessed um, to the board for new initial applications and renewals. The, uh, based on the proposed, or the the target cost kind of of this project, that is anticipated to be $3 for the first five years, and then between 30 and 50 cents for the next 10 optional years. Let me also just stress that this is not a $3 fee that the licensee would pay. This would just be a portion of your existing licensing fees that would go towards the payment for this uh, product. Also, you would no longer be paying for the cost of the current legacy system software, so some of the cost of this would be offset by the fact that, the fact that you're not paying two bills at once. Um, we'll, let's see, any questions on the payment model? So the, the three dollars uh, you're talking about, I guess the few million dollars that we pay to, to up is not enough to cover all this, but that's okay. So th th how, would, would, how would this work? Um, per licensee, right off the bat, there'll be a three dollar charge? Per transaction, it would be for transactions of initial applications and renewals. So um, the whole lump sum payment will be staggered over years because um, not every license, well, I don't, I'm not familiar with, with the details of your licensing requirements, but typically boards or bureaus have licensees renew um, every other year. So it will be paid back over the first five years by those types of transactions for both initial applications and renewals. Okay. Um, go ahead and go on to the next slide. Um, Wanted to discuss quickly um, some of our keys to success. We have uh, tremendous support in the executive branch and legislator, legislature, in addition to the State and Consumer Services Agency and DCA. Um, we have multiple stakeholders watching for Project Danger Signs. We have a Breeze Executive Steering Committee um, that our project sponsor, Kimberly Kirchmeyer. Um, we have a regular, regular monthly meeting on that where we give updates. Um, I know that the Medical Board has a staff that is represented on that. Um, on that executive steering committee, um, as well as we recently, on the topic of um, stakeholders and watching for danger signs, um, we uh, through through CATA we have procured two independent consultants. That uh, their role is to be the independent oversight of the project. So they're not on the project team, they're not on the vendor team. They are the independent project consultants that watch these types of IT projects for danger signs and report on those to uh, what was formerly called the OCIO, but is now called CATA, California Technology Agency. Um, 
what if the contractor fails? I kind of already mentioned this, but um, there are no payments prior to delivery of the software with a complete system design. Aside from that initial payment to buy the software, there's going to be no payments until you've accepted that this is a system that works for you and works for your staff. Um, DCA would own the software and able to, I've already discussed that, so we'll, we'll skip that note. So how um, much have you spent up till now to get this far? Um, I do not know the additional dollar. We have not, uh, we have not actually gone to final contract award, so the, um, the, the payments now are just before the project team staff, um, as well as any sort of overhead that we would have. <coughs> One thing I can tell you, I don't know what the amount is so far for the last two items. A lot of it was, yeah, we're way under budget right now. A lot of that had to do with the lack of ability to hire, um, you know, staff for this as well. Um, as well as when we first started this, the individuals that were coming in for the pre-qualified bidders on this, so they came in and sat with staff from the boards as well as DCA staff to go through the requirements, um, we were going to pay them each of them about $250,000 because they were going to be spending, what, seven to ten weeks here at the time. We thought that's how long I'll it spend was. seven to ten weeks for a lot. <laughs> and so we were going to have them do that. We actually changed our minds and said that we weren't going to pay them for coming in when they first came in and went through those requirements. So between the past, what we saved in fiscal year 8-9, which was $450,000, and what we saved in fiscal year 9-10, which was uh, $750,000, we're able to put that together and that's what we're buying the new software now that we've made that decision. Um, so, so the approximate million dollars that I just heard, uh -huh. number-wise, would be shared expenses by the departments? It, it's by all the boards, boards and, and bureaus. bureaus. Yeah. So you're talking about 18 to 23 boards and bureaus? There's 38. Oh, 38, so, sorry. Yeah, so everybody, and, and again, it's based it's not on... Not based on how much use did you have and the size of your constituents? It is. It is. It is, it is okay. definitely built on that, and that's why for the transaction fee going forward, it's built on how many applicants you have for your first-time applicants, as well as how many licensees you have that are renewing. So for this board, you'll be, a, you'll be one of the larger contributors because of your licensee base. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, this is just a brief graphical depiction of our project leadership. Um, with the executive sponsor uh, and the board and bureau sponsor uh, seated, to, seated to my immediate left, Kimberly Kirchmeyer, um, our project director, Debbie Balaam, uh, uh, the executive steering committee, which I alluded to earlier, is represented on this. Our project manager, Brandon Rutschman, um, business project manager, solution vendor, and technical project manager. I can say that um, this uh, graphical depiction is not up to date because we recently um, did, uh, were able to bring over and hire a technical project manager from existing resources in OIS. Um, it was more of a reallocation of an existing employee to the role of technical project manager. Um, and that would be Connie Kono, who uh, previously oversaw um, the programmers of our CAS, of our consumer affairs system, which is one of our legacy systems. So she brings a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge of our legacy systems that I feel is going to be immensely valuable to the project team going forward. Okay, next slide. Business activities to date. Um, we have legislative budget committee approval. Um, the business project manager and technical project manager have been selected. We have the data conversion, forms consolidation, and reports work groups initiated. These are all work groups that are, are separate from the project team, but they support the functions of Breeze. For example, the data conversion work group um, is working on making sure that the data from our legacy systems is in a place that it can be logically and without too much headache converted into the new system. So we're looking for things like consistency. Um, we're also looking at the various workaround database systems in the department. Um, because of the limitations of our existing legacy systems, many boards and bureaus created tons of access databases, tons of spreadsheets. Um, so we are analyzing all of those to determine which ones need to be converted into the new system and which ones are just summary statistical reports that, that don't need to be converted. And I'm happy to report that we have uh, two of your staff that actually serve on the data conversion work group, which I'm the project manager of. And uh, they, are, they are great resources on that. Um, and we also have our ongoing outreach and communication, which is what I'm doing right now. So um, we have that going on. We, have, we typically average about one or two board meetings a month that we present at. Um, on to the next slide, please. Procurement activities to date. So how far along are we in our procurement? Um, the initial request for a proposal was released. 
Um, we have uh, also released uh, some addendums after that. Uh, our final addendum was released, um, I believe, a week and a half ago. Um, so the full product uh, is out there for the pre-qualified vendors to respond to. And the responses are due on February 16th. Um, so that's right around the corner. And um, also we had our pre-qualified bidders selected, which were Accenture and Verizon. So in order to submit a final uh, proposal, they had to first pass a pre-qualification process um, and then participate in the working sessions that Kim alluded to earlier, the big thing that they didn't get paid for that happened over four weeks. Um, working sessions have also been completed. Final system requirements acceptance is in process. And I actually want to thank uh, Director Whitney again, who submitted her, her uh, final systems acceptance document to us. And um, the final RFP, as I mentioned, has been released. Any questions? Any questions? No questions? Um, OK, can we go on uh, just, just a couple more slides and then? Sure. All right. Um, <laughs> Let's count towards your outreach. Reduction <laughs> of costs. Sure. All right. On to the next slide, please. Um, continue business. Uh, the next steps are to continue business preparation activities. Uh, respond to any final bidder questions on our final RFP addendum. Receive and evaluate final proposals. Um, submit a special project report. And, uh, and just obtain approval for the project to move forward. Um, so the next, the next few months will be critical for the project as we will have final proposals coming in. We'll be opening up costs. There's a lot of really key milestones that will be happening over the next four months or so. Um, on to the very last slide. Um, this is uh, our tentative phased implementation schedule. The, um, the bidder has um, some negotiation as to uh, where certain boards or bureaus will be placed in the phasing. Um, I believe that medical board is, is definitely in the first phase. Um, so we have just wanted to, to mention that here. And you can see that the first phase for implementation um, is currently, we're on schedule to meet it for December 2012. Um, that was the final slide. December of 2012. Correct. That's two years away. It's really fast. Correct. I just wanted to suggest that it's two years away. Okay. Correct? You're right. Yeah. I should make sure. Well, you saved the best for last. I know, huh? One thing that we're really hoping is because these individuals aren't going to get paid until they have rolled it out to the boards, that that is going to actually push them to put this in a little bit quicker. We have no guarantee of that, but that is um, the, the hope is that because they're not getting any money during the time that they're implementing. It's called a hook. I don't know about hope. Hook. Okay. The hook, that's what our hook is. Um, and again, because we are bringing the medical board on into the, in the first phase, it also will mean that all of the boards that they do activities for also have to come in on the first phase because we don't want your investigators having to deal with both the old system and the new system. So we put everybody into the phase with medical board. I, I almost said from your mouth to God's ears or, or to... But, but I, I mean, two years, mm. and I was ready to talk to Carlos, I was so thrilled, here I am, two years? Mm. Oh. It's called the Government IT Project. Jeez. <laughs> it's actually fairly fast. Yeah. yeah, but we've been working on this for a long time, don't, don't, don't forget that, Jen. She has to come with as a survivor of a private sector, large IT implementation, this is like lightning. Lightning. It's not good enough for lightning. <laughs> not good enough. <laughs> Really. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions specifically for the for the newer members on the board? We you need to understand this has been an ongoing process for several years. There's been constant uh, configuring, reconfiguring, uh, discussion, arguments, uh, stumbling blocks, walls, you name it, and it's been a problem. So it's that we were expecting to have it already sooner. So don't, I mean, I don't, I, it may be very good in the scheme of things. It's not good enough. Time passes. And but she's happy, I guess. Yeah, if I may, we have a couple people here who are serving on your various teams. Mm -hmm. uh, Letitia <coughs> Robinson, Brian Humphreys, Natalie Lowe, aren't you on one of the teams? Um, anyone else I'm missing? Susan, are you on one? Or you managed to pass? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're very fortunate to have a combination of managers and staff working on that to ensure that the medical board system does come up well and that um, with their broad experience, they're helping a lot of the other smaller boards that would not have 
the staff available to provide that expertise. We definitely thank you for their assistance because we couldn't do it without them. Can we reduce the cost to the medical board by virtue of the fact of the number of people that participated? We'll bargain we'll into some. that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your report. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so moving uh, on to item number 34, the agenda for the May 5-6 meeting in Los Angeles. Uh, do members have any requests of items to be placed on the agenda? Dr. Uh, Drusso? Madam Chair, uh, I don't know if it uh, will be for that agenda, but um, I would like for us to uh, consider a discussion on access to care. Uh, I continue to have a growing concern about uh, how we uh, in California are going to respond to the most vulnerable populations given I, th I think what the governor has proposed is to reduce uh, dollars in the Medi-Cal program uh, and we, on top of that we have uh, this, uh, California have signed the 1115 waiver with the federal CMS agency to speed up covering the uninsured and also I would uh, would like to hear what the CMS views and discussions might have been in this regard. Uh, uh, I just think that uh, this is going headed towards some sort of train wreck. Yes. Uh, we, 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 uh, we will not have the providers to take care of these patients. I understand. Uh, um, we have an access to care committee, so let's have them convene. That is good. Good. Jerry, yeah. did yeah. you want to say anything? Uh, any other items for the agenda? Well, we'll work on a robust and full agenda, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes? Um, the next meeting is in Los Angeles at the Sheraton Gateway, and then in July we will be holding our meeting hosted by UC Davis Medical School at the campus of UC Davis Medical School. There is a hotel on campus, so it's walkable to the uh, medical school, so that will be uh, quite convenient. So we'll go to hotel next time and then a little bit uh, different in terms of uh, hospital again and medical school and hopefully the medical students will be able to attend our meeting just as Dr. Lowe reported that the PAs he's hopeful will attend the PA meeting that they're hosting there. Okay, thank you everyone. I would uh, move for a motion to adjourn. Everyone should realize it's about 3.20, a little bit before. So move, thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. No discussion. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Point said match. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, and I will retrieve the flash drive.